forward. It was voted tree of the year, but that did not stop it from getting the ax. The 150-year-old tree taken down in the UK to make way for a housing development that apparently did not include the tree in its plan. A strangely symbolic moment for a country that's been knocked down and now locked down again. Showdown in Georgia, voters taking to the polls today, waiting on some long lines to decide the balance of power in all of Washington, D.C. The high-stakes battle between Senate candidates who've accused each other with some low blows. President Trump attacking fellow Republicans in the state, how his high-pressure campaign is playing out. Meanwhile, President Trump issuing a veiled threat to Vice President Pence, calling on Pence to step in on that brewing electoral college fight. The nation's capital on high alert with thousands of Trump supporters expected to protest there tomorrow. The COVID crisis not slowing down. Hospitalizations nationwide hit a new record high. Los Angeles County ICUs at three-fold capacity. Ambulances told to not transport any patients who have little chance of surviving. As more people sleep in their cars overnight for a chance to get vaccinated, only to be turned away. And the emotional plea from a hospital bed from someone who once regularly went maskless. Just wear a mask. Do it for your children, for your loved ones. Do it for yourself. No charges to be filed against the officer who shot Jacob Blake in the back multiple times. A state of emergency now in place as the city of Kenosha, Wisconsin, braces for possible unrest. What Blake's family is saying tonight. With all the excitement that the new year will move us past the pandemic, the original epicenter already has. A look at how Wuhan is thriving while so many Americans are dying. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Well, I can't sing it like James Brown or belt it out like Ray Charles, but many of us have Georgia on our minds tonight. It is now past 7 o'clock on the East Coast, and the polls have closed in the runoff that will decide the balance of power in Washington. Democrats need to win both runoff elections to get 50 seats in the Senate, and with Vice President Kamala Harris breaking the tie, they would have control of the chamber. So let's show you the two races that we will be tracking for you all all night long. Republican Senator David Perdue is taking on Democratic challenger John Ossoff and Republican Senator Kelly Loeffler, appointed one year ago by Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, is trying to win election for the first time over Pastor Raphael Warnock. Votes are expected to come in any moment now in both races. Voters lined up before sunrise this morning in Atlanta after a record early vote of more than three million in a runoff. Tonight, Democrats hope their strong early turnout will prove decisive, while Republicans are banking that a big turnout today will give them the victory. Our Steve Osinsami leads us off tonight in Atlanta. In Georgia tonight, they are starting to count the votes and ending the national focus all over this one runoff election. The future of the country is on the ballot here in Georgia today. Y'all sound like you're ready to win an election. It is super clear to voters here who were lined up before the polls even open that their decision is bigger than Georgia, that the results will decide if Republicans keep control of the U.S. Senate, allowing them to put a thorn in the president-elect's agenda. At the 11th hour, Joe Biden and the Democrats are saying that what happens here today could determine if Americans get those $2,000 stimulus checks. What do you think about this election? It's a lot. My phone has been vibrating. <laughs> Have you voted? Do you have a voting plan? Have you told top three friends to vote? It's insane. Do you think that the two Republicans can win? I hope so. We'll see. You know, I hope democracy does, uh, does what it does and the people of Georgia get to decide who's best. Democrat John Ossoff, who's hoping to take the seat of Republican David Perdue, was out late trying to get more of his supporters to the polls. Georgia voters have never had more power than you have today. That's the reason the whole world is watching us in Georgia. A constant noisemaker in this election is the president of the United States, who held a rally for the two Republicans Monday night. After weeks of saying that the November election in Georgia was rigged, he was here telling supporters to go out and vote anyway. 
Senator Kelly Loeffler, who's hoping to defeat Democrat Raphael Warnock and is trying to please the president and his supporters, announced that she'll join the group of senators trying to fight the election results. I will object to the electoral college vote. That's right. That's right. All of this has put election officials here, who are all Republicans, in a tough spot as they try to convince their voters that this election was safe and secure. The secretary wants me to make clear that everybody's vote is going to count. Steve Osinsami joins us now from Atlanta. And Steve, you've been talking to election officials all day. Have there been any significant issues at all? Nothing significant. And in fact, they're telling us that, you know, in most of these polls, they're seeing people getting through the polls within minutes. However, we are learning tonight of a few counties, counties that are actually friendly to the Republicans, where there are people who are waiting in long lines trying to get through the polls. Lindsay? Lots of excitement and anticipation on both sides. And, and Steve, you've been covering Georgia politics for quite some time now. Is there anything that you're particularly paying attention to tonight to get an early interview? indication of how these races might go. So I'm, a pay, I'm paying attention to a couple things. One is the total turnout, because this is about who can get their people to turn out and vote. In the general election, by this point, election day, before the, before the actual the number of early votes that were counted, it was about 3.9 million. Tonight, it's about 3 million early votes. So that's, that's one indicator. It's, it's, it's fewer people voting in this particular election. But what's important to note in that is that most of that early vote in this instant is coming from the blue counties. The turnout in the early vote from the blue counties was higher this go round than it was in November, lower in the red counties. So that's something to watch. But again, you, you, you never know what is going to happen with this election. Um, because it's, it's really hard to tell who got their people out to vote. Both sides were trying hard uh, late in the day. Uh, they were encouraging Republicans who were uh, questioning whether it, it made sense to vote. They were hearing from Republican surrogates to come out and vote. Um, it's really, really hard to tell. The polls are showing that both races are close, the edge to the Democrats by a point or two, but well within the margin of error. So we don't really know. One thing we can say, Lindsay, is that this time we expect to get the results a lot sooner than we did in November, which wasn't until Friday or Saturday before we had a good sense of who was winning Georgia. All right, that's good news. Steve Osen saw me in Atlanta for us. Thanks so much, Steve. And now Rachel Scott joins us from a GOP watch party in Atlanta. Rachel, what's the move there as the polls close tonight? Well, listen, this has been a race, Lindsay, that has been overshadowed by the president's false claims that this election was rigged. So you heard Steve talk about the president being here in Georgia yesterday trying to rally his base. Republicans need his base to turn out. Republicans that I've talked to today say they are absolutely banking on voter turnout today in person. But I talked to so many of the president's supporters yesterday who told me they were on the fence about getting out to vote. I don't have a lot of faith in it. It's frustrating. It's just very frustrating. But I still believe in the democratic process, that we have a right to vote. Just kind of like after the election for the president, it was just kind of like, wow, did our vote count? You think the mixed messaging could potentially cost your party the Senate? It could. I don't know. I, I have friends that have been even, and these are people that were door knockers, like they were on the ground, boots on the ground, people all in for the GOP that actually have felt conflicted wow. because our Secretary of State has lost our trust and we have not understood why our governor didn't call a special session like we asked. We called our state legislators. We sent them emails and phone calls. We did and we feel ignored and we don't understand what's going on. And that woman, Shauna, told me that she had been personally convincing her family, her friends, to turn out and cast their ballot. You heard her say so many people that were actually door knocking for the president during the general election this time around just didn't know whether or not they wanted to sit this one out. We have to say this, that the votes here in Georgia have been counted three times. The president and his allies have lost more than 50 cases in court, state courts, federal courts, even the Supreme Court rejecting the president's claims. Still, he is insisting that he won this election 
election. It is just simply not true, Lindsay. And Rachel, at a rally last night in Georgia, the president repeatedly pushed Mike Pence to come through tomorrow during the Electoral College certification. Were voters more fixated on the November election or the runoff? They were uh, highly focused on overturning the results of this past election, the election that has already been certified by the Electoral College, an election that the president has been challenging now for weeks. And election officials here in Georgia have said today that everything has been running smoothly. The biggest thing that they are concerned about are the rumors, Lindsay. And lastly, Rachel, Senator Perdue has been off the trail the past few days after COVID exposure. Is there a concern that might influence the outcome? Yeah, I mean, it really could not have come at a worse time for Senator Perdue. Obviously, something that his own campaign was concerned about. He had to be in self-quarantine after coming into close contact with a campaign staffer who tested positive for COVID-19. And Republicans are particularly concerned about the northwest part of the state. That's why you saw the president there in the 14th Congressional District here in Georgia yesterday. That's an area that has seen some of the worst voter turnout when you compare it to the general election for the early voter turnout. Republicans there are hoping that those conservative towns turn turnout and we will just have to wait and see whether or not the president had any effect on voters last night Lindsay we will be waiting and watching Rachel Scott our thanks to you after today's high stakes runoffs we'll take a preview at tomorrow big day on Capitol Hill with Congress set to certify the presidential election results as Vice President Mike Pence presides but President Trump is pressuring the vice president to overturn the electoral count something that Pence has no constitutional power to do meanwhile Republican senators remain divided on whether to certify Biden's win or to object here's ABC's chief White House correspondent Jonathan Carl he lost at the polls, he lost in the courts. Now Donald Trump is demanding that his own vice president act to overturn the results of the presidential election. I hope that our great vice president, our great vice president comes through for us. He's a great guy. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much. Tomorrow, like vice presidents in the past, Mike Pence will preside over a joint session of Congress as the electoral votes are formally counted. Though it's a purely ceremonial role, today Trump tweeted, quote, the vice president has the power to reject fraudulently chosen electors. That's just not true. Pence has no actual power to change or reject any electoral vote. And one of Trump's longtime lawyers is saying as much, directly contradicting the president. I actually don't think that's what the Constitution has in mind. If that were the case, any vice president could refuse Andy any election. Pence has been trying to walk a fine line, not repeating the president's conspiracy theories while remaining ever loyal. I'm here because I stand with President Donald Trump. Trump's effort to pressure his own vice president come after he tried to turn the screws on local officials in Georgia, demanding the secretary of state find enough votes to change the election result. So what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes, fellas. I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. Now Trump sees tomorrow's joint session of Congress as his big last chance. He has summoned his supporters to Washington. So far, several hundred have arrived. 13 Republican senators say they'll join the more than 100 House Republicans expected to vote to reject Biden electors. But more and more Republicans are coming out to say the effort to overturn the election is unconstitutional. There is no role for the Congress to object to, to the electors. Senator Tim Scott, a top ally of the president's, released a statement saying, quote, there is no constitutionally viable path. As for President-elect Biden, he said he is encouraged to see Republicans standing up to Trump. There are enough really decent Republicans, you're seeing them step up now in, in the United States Senate, who don't want to be part of this Trump Republican Party. Biden making a distinction between the Trump supporters and Republicans. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, we know the President Trump and Vice President Pence met today. What are you hearing from his camp on how the vice president will handle tomorrow and how do they think that President Trump will react if he ultimately certifies Biden's victory? 
Well, the bottom line, Lindsay, is that the president believes that v the vice president has a power that he just doesn't have. And the vice president himself is fully aware that he doesn't have this power. So Pence has said nothing publicly. We've asked uh, his spokesperson nothing uh, in response to what the president has said here. Uh, but I am told uh, by people close to the vice president that he intends to defy the president on this, that he intends to follow the rules, which means that at the end of the process, tomorrow, it will be Vice President Pence who is the one announcing that Joe Biden officially, formally, and finally has won the Electoral uh, College and has won the presidency. And, and that is something that, by the way, they, uh, the, these allies of the Vice President fully expect will incur the wrath of a very angry Donald Trump. All right, we heard him say at that rally last night that he'll like Pence a little bit less if yeah. that is to be the outcome. Now, Republicans in the House and Senators divided on how they'll vote tomorrow. So just explain to us the process for tomorrow's joint session and how these objections will be raised. Uh, Republicans are deeply divided on this. I mean, it's interesting, although you're going to see a large number of Republicans uh, object to this, that some of the most prominent Republican voices uh, in Congress are on the other side, saying that this is wrong, this is dangerous, it's unconstitutional. That's what Mitch McConnell has said. That's what Liz Cheney has said. They have said that to a degree publicly, but even more strongly in their private conversations with fellow Republicans. But what's going to happen is uh, it's, it's a, usually a formal process that you know is kind of an afterthought. Uh, each state uh, 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 ballot is presented, uh, e each state's electors, and counted, starting with Alabama and going through alphabetically. And uh, there are at least six states that Republicans uh, intend to uh, challenge, at least House Republicans intend to challenge. And on several of those states, uh, they will be joined by Republicans. If a Republican and a, a Republican from the Senate and from the House both both step forward to challenge a state's electors, then there are two hours of debate and, and a vote about whether or not to accept those electoral votes. So I expect to see on several of those states, at least three, maybe more, uh, there will be senators and House members objecting and two hours of, of debate and a long voting process. Because keep in mind, this is happening in the midst of the pandemic and only 70 or so members at a time are allowed on the House floor where this will all be uh, taking place. So the voting takes place in waves. It's going to take a very long time. Each vote uh, will take uh, at least an hour, perhaps quite a bit longer. Uh, so this could go on into the night. Sounds like a long night ahead. Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. Thank you, Lindsay. We're joined now by Delaware Senator Chris Coons, a close ally of President-elect Biden. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Senator. Now, as of now, 13, Thank you, 13 Republican senators plan to object to the final certification of the Electoral College vote tomorrow, instead calling for a commission to conduct an immediate audit in certain states where there have been allegations of voter fraud, which we note there's been zero evidence to support. So what's the Democratic strategy to respond to this at this point? How do you anticipate that this law play out tomorrow? Well, Lindsay, I expect senators, both Democrats and Republicans, in the Senate tomorrow to emphasize what we know is the truth, that on November 3rd, the American people elected Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to be the next president and vice president of the United States, that in more than 60 court cases, state and federal court cases, um, they've either been thrown out for lack of evidence or withdrawn, and that state after state, with both Republican and Democratic governors and secretaries of state, have certified their results in some cases like Georgia after several recounts. There is no compelling evidence for the efforts being made by a small band of Republicans to challenge this important part of our democratic institutions, and I'm confident it will have no impact on the fact that two weeks from tomorrow, excuse me, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris will be sworn in. So let me ask you this. If the fraud allegations are completely baseless, would it be in Democrats' interest to agree to some kind of bipartisan commission in the new Congress to look at any and all fraud allegations and fully debunk them so that these claims don't stay alive? 
Lindsay, that is something we might consider, um, looking at ways in which voter suppression has been a real challenge in recent elections and to consider allegations. Uh, but let's be clear, we should not be considering that in any way that would slow down the swearing in of the next president. We have a raging pandemic. We have economic recovery to get to. We have bringing our country together, um, that our commitments that Joe Biden made as candidate and that our important efforts he's going to begin as president, we should not be delaying that valuable work one more day. Would you say that there's any chance that President-elect Biden has been too passive in letting this drag out as President Trump and now multiple uh, Republicans question the legitimacy of his election? It, it seems like he's waiting for this to maybe all just blow over, but does it hurt his ability to be an effective president from day one if large portions of Americans potentially believe that his election wasn't legitimate? Lindsay, it does harm the prospects of a successful Biden presidency that President Trump, rather than focusing on responding to this pandemic, which is surging out of control, has spent the last two months golfing and tweeting and indulging himself in conspiracy theories and in whipping up opposition um, to Republican acceptance of the outcome of the election. That is a real challenge. But I don't think uh, President-elect Biden has in any way been passive. He's instead been doing the hard work of assembling a talented and capable cabinet, of putting together detailed plans for how to take over and to lead the fight against this pandemic, and how to begin the hard work of bringing our people together after the divisive Trump presidency. Now, I know you've been an optimist on the idea of bipartisan cooperation in the new Congress, but how can a President Biden and Democrats work with these senators who are questioning the results of this election? Are Biden's unity efforts going to be harder to achieve after January 20th than he expected? Lindsay, I'm heartsick at the colleagues who've chosen uh, to throw themselves in the way of what is an important next step in our democratic process tomorrow. Uh, I'm surprised at some of my colleagues who are uh, lashing themselves to the mast of Trumpism and refusing to recognize the legitimate outcome of the election. Uh, but frankly, we don't have any choice going forward but to try to heal the wounds of this election, to bring our country together, and to find ways to legislate in a bipartisan and sustainable way. Millions of Americans, tens of millions of Americans, came out and voted for Joe Biden, even though they might be Republicans, independents, or Democrats who either didn't vote four years ago or who voted for Donald Trump because they were choosing um, a more balanced, rational, predictable, and effective government going forward. I think Joe Biden's done just the right thing to lay the groundwork for a successful administration. Turning now to the runoff tonight in Georgia, I'm sure you're confident the Democrats are going to be able to pull off these wins. But if they don't, how much does it damage the ability of President-elect Biden to be able to implement his agenda if Republicans maintain control of the Senate? I've served in the United States Senate for 10 years now, Lindsay, and I've seen how Majority Leader McConnell has at times been the obstructionist who's made it very difficult uh, for the Obama-Biden administration to move their agenda forward, um, for Democrats in the Senate to get legislation moved forward, and for us to deliver solutions to the real needs of the American people. The last eight months, whereas the pandemic surged and uh, recession continued, uh, we failed in the Senate to move forward. COVID relief is just one of many moments uh, when I've seen that Republican majority control get in the way of our delivering solutions that meet the needs of the American people. My hope is that if Majority Leader McConnell continues in the majority in the next Congress, that he and Joe Biden, who enjoy a long working relationship, will still find some way to come together, that he will stop his obstruction and that he will give a fair opportunity for confirmation votes uh, for those nominated for a Biden-Harris cabinet, uh, and that we will find ways that we can work together on things like rebuilding our country's infrastructure, responding to the pandemic, strengthening education and health care, and moving our country forward. I know it's a tall order, but the only way that I can get up and go back to Washington in the days that we're in session is by being an optimist. It's an active choice. I think that our entire country really needs that dose of, of optimism at this time. And, and lastly, any word on when we can expect the final round of cabinet selections, including President-elect Biden's pick for attorney general? 13 of your Senate colleagues wrote a letter in support of former Senator Doug Jones for the position. Would he be the best choice? 
Lindsay, I think he would. I have both publicly and privately supported my friend and colleague, Doug Jones, uh, an experienced U.S. attorney and an experienced senator, um, someone who is from the Deep South and has been an advocate uh, for civil rights uh, and for um, stronger community policing. I think he would be a great attorney general. Uh, I expect announcements on the remaining cabinet positions in the coming couple of days. But more than anything, I'd like to draw your viewers' attention to the experienced and skilled and cohesive group um, that President-elect Biden has already chosen to serve as the core of his cabinet. I'm very optimistic that the great team he's assembled will deliver real results for the American people. Senator Chris Coons, thanks so much for your time tonight. We appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you, Lindsay. Next, turning to the COVID crisis. Imagine being in a serious car accident or being shot and knowing that an ambulance might not show up. That's the reality in America's second largest city already. Some patients in LA County are waiting for hours outside of emergency rooms just to be seen. All this is now a sixth state. Georgia is reporting a case of that UK variant. Matt Gutman has more. <laughs> With each new patient delivered to the doors of an ER tonight, the health system spirals deeper into crisis. L.A. County now issuing an alarming order to ambulances. Trauma such as gunshot, car crash, or cardiac arrest victims who cannot be revived after 10 minutes in the field should be considered dead and not transported to a hospital. This is absolutely a form of countywide triage. This is what they call crisis medicine. And this is something that any healthcare provider or first responder, this is our kind of our worst nightmare. Has this ever happened in the history of LA? It has not. That crash of COVID patients has log jammed ambulances at ERs. Some waiting as long as eight hours to get patients admitted, others turned away. I've never heard of emergency departments literally refusing to accept ambulance patients saying, we have no more room, go somewhere else. Tonight, a record 128,000 patients in hospitals with a 26% spike in the last month. Arizona, with the highest rate of infections in the country, patients driving as far as six hours to find an open ICU bed. I consider myself lucky that they just have me on oxygen. Tonight, that vaccine rollout continues to sputter. In Palm Beach, Florida, this line for seniors stretching for hours just to schedule an appointment. And in Daytona Beach, seniors waiting overnight. It is a combination of difficult, frustrating, and rewarding if you get it. About 4.5 million vaccinations administered, not even a quarter of the goal of 20 million. Vaccine reluctance remains a hurdle. New York City reporting 30% of health care workers turned down the opportunity to get a dose. In Texas, pediatrician Dr. Nira Butani died on Saturday. She was three weeks shy of getting her vaccine. And it would have saved her life. In California, funeral homes now using refrigerator trucks, they have six times the usual number of bodies. Unable to keep up, one mortician telling ABC News he's advising families to buy ice to keep bodies cold. The reality of the surge setting in. I didn't wear a mask. I should have. I didn't. I believe this was just the flu. Chuck Stacy is making this emotional plea from his Florida hospital bed. You don't want to end up like me. I'm having trouble breathing. Just wear a mask. Do it for your children, for your loved ones. Do it for yourself. People still being implored to wear a mask. Matt Gutman joins us now from Los Angeles. And Matt, turning back to the vaccine, there was a proposal to look into cutting those doses in half. What can you tell us about that? Well, the FDA has taken a look at that, and it says right now it's not solidly rooted in the science. So they're tapping the brakes on it. They're not ruling it out completely. So at this point, researchers from Moderna and the National Institutes of Health are going to spend probably the next couple of months or so researching if the vaccine can still remain effective if it's split in half, therefore essentially doubling the doses, right? But the problem in America right now is not the quantity of doses of vaccine. It is administering the vaccine at a fast enough rate, that is the bottleneck right now. In addition to that, by the time that the research is done, Lindsay, other vaccines like the Johnson & Johnson single shot vaccine that could be just as effective might be available on the market and ready for use. So this whole proposal might be moot anyway. Lindsay. Okay, thanks for that update. Matt Gutman, thanks as always.
Joining us now to discuss more on the COVID variants and vaccines is former acting CDC director and former ABC News medical editor, Dr. Richard Besser. Thanks so much as always for coming on the show, Dr. B. Now the UK has gone into lockdown due to the spread of COVID and the variant. Five states here have officially confirmed the presence of the variant. How concerned should we all be and, and how long do you think it will be before it spreads to the rest of the country? Well, you know, Lindsay, I, I think one of the things that is always certain when there's a new virus is that it will change, it will mutate. It's something viruses do. And so I think it's really important that we remain vigilant, that we look to see what's happening in the UK. And it does appear that this this strain, this this mutant is able to transmit more, more readily. Uh, and we should expect that what we're seeing in the UK may occur here in the United States. So it's observing, it's watching, it's being ready. And, and being able to, to respond quickly should we see that this strain starts to take over in, in the transmission in the United States. Now, it's believed that the vaccines will work on the UK variant, but there seems to be doubt when it comes to the South African variant. What's the likelihood that the original COVID-19 virus mutated in such a radical way that it would be resistant to this vaccine? You know, what, I, what I'm hearing from virologists, from vaccine specialists, gives me some, some, some encouragement that they don't think that's happening here. Uh, but it's something that we have to be ready for. And, you know, one thing about these mRNA vaccines uh, is that they can be modified very, very quickly. Uh, if that were to, to happen, they would need to do, a, again, additional safety and, and uh, effectiveness trials. Um, but that is something to watch for. At this point, there's no evidence that the vaccines are less effective against these variant strains. Now, let's talk about the topic of cutting vaccine doses in half. As the former acting director of the CDC, if you were in that role now, would you be advising this move in order to help curb the spread? And, and do you fear that a change like this could cause people to become even more hesitant about getting vaccinated? Yeah, I, I'm I'm not comfortable moving in the, in that direction without data. And my understanding is that the NIH is moving in in the direction of doing studies to see could you reduce the amount of of uh, material that's in the Moderna vaccine and would it still be effective? You know, in 2019, there were a lot of people, uh, myself included, who were very concerned about politics interfering with science. And I was really heartened to see the process that FDA went through, that CDC went through that their, their advisory committees were, were left alone to make science-based decisions. And I would hate to see that thrown away with, and, 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 and seeing a change that isn't based on data. If there's a way to safely and effectively expand the vaccine supply, that would be a terrific thing. But it has to be based on good, good studies, especially with the amount of hesitancy that we're seeing around the country. We want to do everything we can to inspire confidence, not to undermine it. Dr. Richard Besser, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Lindsay. And when we come back, the chilling surveillance and the parents now fighting back after their eight-year-old committed suicide, allegedly after being bullied for years. What happened to one of the richest men in the world who has not been seen publicly for months? But up next, the reaction after prosecutors decided not to bring charges against the officer who shot Jacob Blake in the back multiple times, leaving him paralyzed. We'll speak with Jacob Blake's father coming up. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burn. And now to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where a district attorney has announced that he will not bring charges against a police officer who shot 29-year-old Jacob Blake several times in the back, leaving him paralyzed. How the DA explained his decision and what happens next. ABC's Alex Perez is in Kenosha tonight. 
Tonight, Kenosha, Wisconsin, bracing for more protest after the prosecutor declined to bring charges against the officer who shot Jacob Blake seven times. No Kenosha law enforcement officer in this case will be charged with any criminal offense based on the facts and the laws. The ordeal back on August 23rd unfolding after police responded to a call about a domestic dispute. Cell phone video shows 29-year-old Blake struggling with officer Rustin Shesky and another officer. Both deployed their tasers, but they were unsuccessful. As Blake appears to lean into the driver's side of the car, Shesky opens fire. Blake's three young boys in the back seat, but not injured. Today, the prosecutor saying Blake was armed. We say with confidence based on Blake's admission, based on all the officers saying it, and this video evidence, he clearly is armed with a knife. The shooting sparked days of violent protest. A 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse charged with killing two in the unrest. Overnight, Kenosha issuing an emergency declaration, putting up fences and boarding up businesses. The governor deploying 500 National Guardsmen. Blake, paralyzed from the shooting, still recovering. His family tonight disappointed, but say they are determined to keep fighting for justice. You cannot have a Bill of Rights for the police and then have a Bill of Rights for the people. We're all people. Our thanks to Alex Perez and joining us now is the father of Jacob Blake, Jacob Blake Sr. and his attorney Patrick Salvi. Thank you both for being here. Mr. Blake, let's start with you. First of all, I know this, this was not the outcome you were expecting. How is your son's recovery going at this time and what was his reaction to the news that no charges would be brought against the officers? Well, of course, this was the outcome we were expecting. So, um, Nobody's disheartened. Nobody's stopping. The it's outcome you were hoping for. for. Well, uh, I mean, everybody is, is, is optimistic. We were, we, were, we were hoping for something different, but we were willing to deal with what we have to deal with. Patrick, today the district attorney said that he would, quote, have to disprove the clear expression of these officers that they had to fire a weapon to defend themselves in order to press charges. Do you feel that the video provided enough evidence for this? And were you surprised to hear that no criminal charges would be brought against the officer? Well, I'd have to echo uh, Mr. Blake's comments. I'm not sure surprised is the right word. I'm certainly very disappointed in the process that unfolded today. A district attorney uh, who uh, works with these police officers every day and a police chief uh, who came before everyone in that press conference and sounded like an advocate uh, versus a neutral fact finder. Uh, so I was very disappointed uh, in the process. The video provides no evidence. I challenge anybody to watch that video to see evidence of Jacob thrusting at the police officers. And so what we're talking about here are the statements of uh, police officers that were held in higher regard than a number of witnesses who I know are prepared to testify uh, that that's absolutely not what happened. And the video is evidence enough. And Mr. Blake, your family, along with other community leaders, are calling for the firing of Officer Rustin Chesky. Given the lack of charges brought against him, how likely do you think it is that you'll be successful in being able to get that accomplished? Well, I, I think they, they may be using the uh, the Louisville uh, playbook. You know, they didn't charge, but they fired those officers. So I feel like eventually he has to be fired because there was no threats, thrusting movement. He's changed from he was worried that uh, my son was going to kidnap children to he was scared for his life. Then he changed back. So now... We're doing a juggling act now, so it's one way or the other. You can't keep flip-flopping, not when it's this important. And Patrick, what are your legal options at this point? And has your fight for criminal charges ended? And what about the possibility of a civil case? Sure, so there are some options still available uh, to us as far as potentially uh, uh, raising, uh, I, I suppose, 
uh, criminal charges. That's, of course, not something we can do on our own, but we still have some options available. But with respect to a civil case, we do plan on pursuing a civil case uh, very soon. Uh, ben Crump, uh, my co-counsel, and the rest of the legal team intend on filing a case soon. And Mr. Blake, what do you think the next step is for you and the community in Kenosha in order to feel like some semblance of justice has been served and in order for, for healing to happen? What do you want from your elected leaders and those who took an oath to serve and protect? Well, until, until systemic racism is erased, um, we won't be able to heal. Racism is what, what brought this whole whole thing into uh, the two systems of justice and the racism that we have to deal with on a daily basis. That's the way we heal, changing laws. That's how we heal. So we'll be moving on to another level. And lastly, Mr. Blake, what was your son's reaction to the charges and what's his condition tonight? I'm sure he'll tell you soon himself. Okay. Mr. Blake, thank you so much. Mr. Saul, we appreciate both of your time. Thank you, Lindsay. Still ahead here on Prime, our journey to the original epicenter of the pandemic, Wuhan, China, one year after the outbreak that changed the world, how they are now faring better than any of us. The announcement from American Airlines, what they will no longer allow passengers to bring into the cabin. And we're, of course, keeping our eye on the results from the Georgia special runoffs. But you may be shocked at how these elections began in that state and why. We'll take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, intelligence agencies making it official that massive cyber attack was most likely caused by Russia. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source, ABC News. Breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, nonstop, straight to you. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live event and moments, this is live. all playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only ABC News gets. Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime. <laughs> Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and ABCNews.com. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. Here on the ground at the Iraq. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Yes. Ismail? Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. On this election night in Georgia with the U.S. Senate hanging in the balance, we take a deeper dive into the state's unusual runoff system and why some historians believe it has racist roots. In only 10 U.S. states, a candidate must reach at least 50 percent of the vote to win, triggering a runoff election if this does not happen. And only one of those states, Georgia, uses this system for general elections, not just primaries. Now, in 1964, the Georgia legislature voted to adopt this system, which was proposed just before the Voting Rights Act and pushed forward by former segregationist state representative Denmark Groover. Now, in 1990, the head of the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division argued that Georgia's runoff system, quote, disproportionately disenfranchised African Americans, but he lost the case. And today, Black voters are about 32% of the Georgia electorate, but historically their turnout has been disproportionately low in runoff elections. Outside the U.S., more than 40 countries, including France and Germany, use runoff elections, which experts say don't carry the same potential taint of racism and can help elect more moderate candidates. And we still have lots to get to on this very busy news day. The horrific video appearing to show students and even an assistant principal ignoring a young 
young boy who was laid out on the ground. The parents are now taking action. Not one, but two huge jackpots that could make your 2021 far better than your 2020, but you may not need $400 million for that. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. We move up to the vehicle. He detonates a bomb. The heroes who stopped the killer, who held the city of Austin hostage for 19 days. It's a tripwire. All hands on deck. The clues, the Home Depot video, that truck, and the agent who connected the dots. It was exactly the vehicle that we were looking for. Inside the investigation, Man's main contact. the takedown of the bomber, now streaming on Hulu. Tuesday, Georgia voters going to the polls one more time in a pair of runoff elections that will decide which party controls the U.S. Senate. Incumbent Republican Senators Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue and their Democratic challengers Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff making their final pleas to voters after none of the candidates achieved the required 50% threshold. My name is on the ballot and the bus, but this is a collective effort. Are you ready to show America that Georgia is a red state? More than 3 million Georgians cast ballots in the early voting period, a record for a special election. Polls show both races as extremely tight. If both Democrats win, they will be tied with Republicans at 50 seats apiece, with Vice President-elect Kamala Harris being tiebreaker. President-elect Biden campaigned here yesterday, and President Trump in his second trip to the state just last night. Hospitals coast to coast are under strain. Outbreak in California and surge in Los Angeles is triggering more problems. The Grammy Awards issuing a statement that the January ceremony will be postponed until March. Response, in hard hit LA County, Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital declared an internal disaster, turning away ambulances for several hours. The COVID-19 positivity rate there is a staggering 32%. It's nonstop. Add to that the top 
tough task of containing that new variant from the UK, also detected here in the US. Georgia now joining New York, Colorado, California, and Florida on the list of states with known cases. By the time a new variant is detected, it's already probably widespread. Experts and local officials calling on the federal government to help ramp up distribution and vaccinations. Lives are at stake. Federal government has to step up. Alaska Airlines was the first to do it, and now American Airlines will ban emotional support animals on its planes. The airline industry has had a hard time limiting which animals were allowed, so now none will be allowed. Passengers had been claiming their pets were emotional support animals so they could bring them on board for free and take them out of carriers on board. Official service dogs will be allowed. Small carry-on pets can be brought on board for a fee, and they must remain in their carriers. The school district still, three years later, has not told us what happened. Nearly four years after this third grader died by suicide, a federal court is allowing his parents to move forward with a wrongful death lawsuit. In the suit, parents of eight-year-old Gabriel Tay accused the district of covering up bullying and aggressive behavior at Carson Elementary School. They point to this disturbing security video, showing their son at school knocked unconscious and left there for several minutes. Some students appear to taunt and kick him. It took nearly five minutes before help came when the assistant principal showed up. Two days later, Gabriel took his own life. His mother says the school never told them about the alleged bullying, saying instead he had fainted. The school district was arguing, wait, don't let this case go forward, we'll get sued all the time. And I said, great, you should be sued if you're covering this up. Concerns are growing over the whereabouts of a Chinese billionaire. Jack Ma is worth $50 billion. He hasn't been seen in public since October when he gave a speech criticizing the Chinese government. The speech prompted Chinese officials to launch an investigation into his e-commerce company, Alibaba. It's believed Ma may have been told to lay low because of the scrutiny. Both Mega Millions and Powerball at more than $400 million. That's only happened twice before. Pandemic had an impact on sales. People weren't getting out there and buying the tickets. But $400 million, you'd still be worth more than Taylor Swift's reported net worth at $400 million. But you'd have to win both of them to be worth as much as Tiger Woods. It was about this time last year that alarm bells started to go off inside Wuhan, a mysterious virus claiming lives in the massive city. Next life as we know it altered. But one year later, we sent a team back to Wuhan, China to see what's changed in this original epicenter and what Ian panel will show us may stun you. You could be forgiven for thinking this is old footage, a reminder of a world left behind. Happy crowds jostling at New Year, sharing and breathing the same air. But this isn't an old film. It was taken this New Year's Eve. Because while most of the planet hid behind closed doors, the city where the pandemic began parted in style. It's almost surreal how normal it all looked in Wuhan, China. About a year after the first reported outbreak of COVID-19, China was largely able to get the country back on its feet. For the billions still in the grip of this pandemic, the scenes out of Wuhan are simply stunning. So much so, we sent a team to witness the citizens of Wuhan going about their completely normal, everyday lives. Never has the ordinary looked so extraordinary. Hubei is a businesswoman in Wuhan. She filmed what it was like going back to her empty office in April last year. Today, her office is packed. She even has face-to-face -face meetings. Now in most places, we basically don't need to wear masks. Life is back to normal like before. China achieved what's eluded much of the world by flexing its authoritarian muscle to impose one of the strictest lockdowns on Earth in one of their largest cities. Wuhan is a bustling metropolis of 11 million. It was also ground zero for the first suspected outbreak of COVID-19. Look at this airport. This is the international section of the Wuhan uh, airport, and there's basically almost no one here. Overnight, highways and airports turned into ghost towns. Health checkpoints were set up, and Beijing warned what would happen to those who tried to pass by with a temperature. The world watched aghast as people were confined to their homes. 
blissfully unaware that soon after, most of us would know what it was like to be locked down. Milan is an industrial, but of course, massive fashion powerhouse. Brands like these are having real problems with production. So whatever the medical reality of this virus, the economic consequences around the world are huge. Almost a year later, and 1.8 million lives lost, many countries continue to reel from a pandemic that just won't let up. We now have a new variant of the virus, and it's been both frustrating and alarming to see the speed with which the new variant is spreading. We're running probably 300% of our normal capacity, right? I mean, we have... 300%. China, on the other hand, now has an exhibit that celebrates all of its successes against the virus, but it mentions almost none of its mistakes. Citizen journalist Zhang Zhan was sentenced to four years in jail last week for reporting a far bleaker picture of the outbreak than China's official narrative would have us believe. And then there's Dr. Li Wenliang. He was the first to raise the alarm about COVID-19 and was accused by police of spreading false information. He later died of COVID-19 and now appears on the memorial wall. Many accuse China of hiding the threat of coronavirus and the true death toll. Just today, the WHO was unable to begin investigating the origins of COVID-19 after Chinese officials failed to finalise permissions for the team's arrival. And while life on the ground appears largely back to normal, it's not totally in the clear. China just placed a village near Beijing under lockdown after a new cluster was found there. But Hubei, like many here, is proud with the way her country's handled this pandemic. I don't think there has been any country that has been able to do this. For this reason, I'm really proud to be Chinese. But as long as this virus continues to rip through much of the world, the place where it all began, in Wuhan, will never be fully safe. Ian Panel for ABC News Live. Our thanks to Ian for that striking report. We will be right back in a moment as we continue to monitor those results now coming in in those two Georgia Senate races. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Do you 
reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. And finally tonight, our image of the day. Now we saw this in 2020 and in 2021, it still holds. Democracy, despite a catastrophic pandemic, is alive and well. The brave Georgians who decided not to send in their ballots by mail, showing up at the polls to make sure their voices are heard in person. And now we all await to see which party will gain control in the Senate. That is our show for tonight. I'm about to switch seats and be joined by Tom Yamas and the entire powerhouse ABC team. Those Georgia results continuing to come in. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night. may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. Americans here on the ground and the Iraq. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. This is an ABC News Live election special. 63 days ago, more Americans turned out to vote than any time in our nation's history. Six days later. The people of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory, a convincing victory, a victory for we the people. Tonight, all eyes on the state of Georgia. John Ossoff. Feel your power to make a statement that will echo from coast to coast and down the generations about what Georgia stands for. Senator David Perdue. The eyes of America are on us, and we're not going to let them down. With your help, we're going to win Georgia and save America. Reverend Raphael Warnock. Georgia needs a senator who will try to amplify the voices of the people, not diminish the voices of the people. Senator Kelly Leffler. We're going to stand up for conservative values, our Second Amendment rights, free speech, religious freedom, the right to life. With control of the Senate on the line, election night, the Georgia Senate runoffs. Here now, Tom Yamas and Lindsey Davis. And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. Thanks for joining us on ABC News Live tonight. And I'm Lindsay Davis. Two battles are raging tonight in the state that was decided by the smallest margin in the 2020 presidential election. And now, more than two months later, voters in Georgia will not only decide who will represent them in Washington, but which party will control the U.S. Senate. Right now, Republicans hold the majority with 50 seats. Democrats would have to win both races tonight to set up a tie. Then after inauguration, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris become the breaker, that tiebreaker that would give Democrats control of the House and the Senate, putting Joe Biden in position to push his campaign promises into action. Otherwise, he faces a GOP-controlled Senate led by Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Polls are closed. Votes are already being counted. You can see them there in Fulton County, Georgia, tallying the votes. Let's take a step back for a moment to get a better understanding of how we got here. A crowded field vied for these two U.S. Senate seats back in November, but according to Georgia law, in order to win, a candidate must receive more than 50 percent of the vote. That did not happen, which resulted in a runoff election in both races. So first, a special election. Senator Kelly Leffler, a political outsider who was appointed by Governor 
Governor Kemp after GOP Senator Johnny Isaacson stepped down, citing health reasons, is trying to hold on to her seat against the Reverend Raphael Warnock, who's a senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church, that famed church in Atlanta, a position once occupied by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Here is where the vote stands right now. We also want to make sure that we make this very clear. It is very early in the night. The polls just closed at 7 o'clock. 23% of the expected vote in, and with 23% of the vote in right now, Raphael Warnock is on top 52 to 48%. It's incredibly close. Just looking down at the monitors right now, we're talking about a spread of about 30 to 40,000 votes. Still very close. The second Senate race, incumbent Senator David Perdue, a longtime business executive and Trump loyalist, is facing off against Democrat John Ossoff, the 33-year-old, saying the election of President Trump motivated his candidacy. And look at this. It's almost a mirror image of what we just saw seconds ago. David Perdue with 48%, just behind John Ossoff at 52%. But again, only 23% of that vote in, Lindsay. It has been a nasty and expensive fight. Both sides have spent more than $500 million on ads, and the biggest names in politics have made last-minute trips, including both Biden and Trump trying to make the case for their candidates. Some say what happens in Georgia tonight will determine America's future, insisting the stakes are just that high as COVID continues to ravage our country and millions struggle to pay bills, all as America continues to grapple with racial injustice. And this is playing out in Georgia, a long-shot battleground state that turned blue and pushed President-elect Joe Biden to a victory. In fact, President Trump refuses to accept as he continues to make false allegations of voter fraud and tries to strong-arm Georgia election officials into finding him votes. And it's unfolding less than 24 hours before Congress is set to certify the vote of the American people and the Electoral College and seal President-elect Joe Biden's place in the White House. From Georgia to Washington, our powerhouse political team is with us to unpack every single aspect of this tonight. We're going to check in with them in just a minute. But first, let's get straight to the vote coming in at this hour. All right, Lindsay, let's take a look at that map as we start the night because it is still so very early. So here we have the map of Georgia right now, more than 150 counties. It looks a bit like a jigsaw puzzle right now. And the areas we're going to be looking at, of course, are going to be right through here, Atlanta, and the suburbs that surround Atlanta. This is where the Democrats have to really run up the vote and do really well. And then, of course, we're going to be looking at the Black Belt of Georgia here, areas where there are high percentages of African-American voters to see how the Democrats do there as well. And then, of course, in the northern part of Georgia and the southern part of Georgia, where Republicans are expected to run up the vote there. So when we look at this first race right now, with 26% of the expected vote in, we have John Ossoff and, and Purdue going head-to-head -head right now. A data point I want to point out right now in 2020, in the election, John Ossoff underperformed Joe Biden by 100,000 votes. So he has to make sure he does much better in some of those blue counties. Again, the Atlanta metro region. Purdue, for his part, he actually outperformed President Trump, but only by a little bit. But in Atlanta, in this key area, he did so by 12,000 votes. He's going to have to try to run up the score in any of the suburbs around Atlanta where he can do that. All right, let's go now to the second race that we're looking at right now. This race is a little harder to compare to the 2020 race, the Senate race, because there were so many people running in this special election. You can see there were three Democrats, two Republicans. If you add up the numbers here, Leffler comes out a little bit on top, but we do expect this to be a very, very tight race. So we want to go back to the second uh, special election here in Georgia to see where it stands. Again, only 26% of the vote. And we know that Kelly Leffler has campaigned very hard in the northwest and northeastern parts of this state to drive up the votes from some of those rural voters that supported her just a few months ago. And again, we're going to be watching the Atlanta metro region. So let's come in here and see where we're at. Fulton County, the largest county in Atlanta, 22% of the expected vote is in right now. You can see Raphael Warnock's off to a very big lead, uh, and he's actually doing better at this point, very early in the night. He's outperforming Joe Biden, who was at 72%. If he can hold that trend, that's the type of trend that Democrats want right now. Uh, but as we look at these races, we also kind of want to know where the early vote stands at this point. And at this hour, we don't have the early vote in yet. We have no idea what the numbers are. We know it's going to be 72% of the early vote. We know 3 million Georgians voted early. They broke records in, in that regard. So we're waiting to find out what that early vote is. Lindsay, it's still really, really early right now. It's, it's tough to say where the race stands because only 20%, 27% of the vote is in. 
Every minute, every hour, we're going to have more and more votes. And as those votes come in, we'll show you who's on top and where they're winning, Lindsay. Tom, thanks for breaking that down for you. I'd like to bring in our political director, Rick Klein. Rick, when do you think that we'll know the official results? And what are you watching for in particular tonight? Yeah, Lindsay, uh, settle in. I mean, it took a couple of days, uh, yeah. two months ago, to, to finalize those results. And then, of course, all those lawsuits. And every indication is that this is going to be just as close. And paradoxically, those early votes often get counted later. And those, those might be good for Democrats. So we could be, see a little bit of the, a, a shift in the numbers as the days go, go on. One thing I'm looking at, Lindsay, that I think is really interesting, this is coming from our exit polls. Uh, as people go into the, the polling places or telephone polls for early voters, this is the makeup of the electorate tonight. And you look at that key number, 29% of the electorate in Georgia tonight are, are black voters. That's a, that's a pretty sizable number. In fact, it's even a tick up from where they were in November. That's surprising because traditionally black voters have been less likely to turn out in these runoff races. So that's a very encouraging sign for Democrats. It shows that they're getting their base out. And why is that important? And take a look at this again from our exit poll. John Ossoff taking 93% of the vote uh, among black voters, uh, a slightly higher number for Raphael Warnock, who, of course, is an African American pastor himself. That's as reliable a Democratic bloc as there is. And so far, uh, the Democrats look like they did their jobs in getting them to the polls. Mary Alice Parks, I'd like to bring you in, our deputy political director. Uh, when you Think about us getting right out of the gate. Are you expecting that red mirage that we saw on the night of the presidential election? And also when you talk about that urban and rural divide, which voters in particular are you looking at tonight? Yeah, coming into tonight, we were expecting a red mirage, but I'm actually interested in the fact that some of these big Democratic counties right in the Atlanta metro are reporting numbers pretty early, and we're seeing state officials saying that they are processing some of those absentee ballots fast. They've learned lessons from November, and they do not want it to take days and days again. They worked with counties to make sure that those counties would be opening those ballots, checking signatures, uh, starting that process ahead of time so that when polls closed right at 7 o'clock, they could hit count on the machines and get some of those numbers out. So I'm right now, you know, an hour in, actually I think there's evidence we might see less of that red mirage, but, but we'll have to see. The fact is Republicans do better in much more rural counties, smaller counties, where it's just easier to count a few thousand votes compared to hundreds of thousands of votes in the very large counties of Atlanta. Thanks, Mary Alice. All right, Lindsay, uh, we want to go to our man in Atlanta now, Steve Oshinsami, who's been covering this race uh, since the first time it happened a few months ago back in November. So, Steve, so far there has been a lot of data that's been thrown at us, uh, a lot of research. What's the single data point that you've seen tonight so far that has really stood out to you? What stood out to me so far tonight is the break that Mary Alice referred to in the blue counties in the center of the state where most of the people who live in this state live. Fulton, Gwinnett, uh, we, we need to look out for Cobb. Right now in Fulton, and this is early, I think about 22% is the note that I saw of the vote so far. It's breaking eight to two in general in general for both of the candidates. Uh, in the other county, I think it was seven, three. That break is important because as you all have just been saying, what we are talking about is an urban versus a rural divide here, urban and suburban and rural divide. And what, what is going to really determine this race is which of those two sides can overcome the other. And, you know, as we've also been saying, you know, most of the urban and suburban votes were already in the bank. Uh, those votes were those votes are mostly people who early voted. Uh, they didn't have the lines here in Georgia that we are hearing about tonight in some of the more red friendly counties where people have been waiting in the line. And, you know, Ossoff and, and, and Warnock are, are, are probably enjoying what they're seeing right now. But of course, it is early. Um, it is interesting also to point out that Purdue and Leffler put out a joint statement today uh, thanking voters for the high turnout as they saw it uh, across the state. The state election officials who we've talked with say they would describe the turnout as steady. But the, the key data point that you should really, really watch is in the blue counties. And the reason why to focus on the blue counties is because of the 11 million people who live in this state, 6 million of those people live in the Atlanta metro area and its suburbs. Tom? Yeah, and one of the reasons why Georgia flipped a few months ago is because Atlanta and the greater metro region has changed so much. But there's a long history with Republicans and runoff elections in Georgia that we cannot forget. Explain that to our viewers. So in, in runoff elections in Georgia, the history is that Democrats don't usually do well in runoff elections. In fact, runoff elections are often um, 
poorly uh, attended by voters. Um, they are afterthoughts for many voters, especially those on the left. And the reason for that is in runoffs in Georgia, it's traditionally been hard to get Democrats in particular to come out and vote again. The runoff system, as you've described, uh, is set up so that if any candidate, except for the race for president, gets under 50 percent, uh, that those the top two candidates then meet in the runoff. If there were not a runoff election in Georgia, Raphael Warnock would have won his race and Senator David Perdue would have won his. But we are now where we are tonight. I will say that all of that old conventional wisdom about runoff races in Georgia was thrown out of the window when Joe Biden essentially did what President Obama couldn't have done twice, did, was unable to do twice and won election here. It changed the script. Democrats all of a sudden in this state uh, had a feeling of being able to truly win. In addition to that, the pandemic played a role into this and has changed all sort of notions of what we sort of have come to expect in runoff election in the, in the state. And that's because so many voters are now voting by mail. That mail-in vote has changed the dynamic. It's changed the expectations. It's changed the predictions. And this race is anyone's guess at this point. And because of all of that, Georgia is not the center of the political universe in this country. All right, Steve-O, stand by for us. We are going to be checking back with you throughout all of our coverage. Lindsay? Now let's bring in Rachel Scott. Rachel, you're at a GOP watch party tonight. Last night you were at that Trump rally in Georgia. Give us a sense of the sentiment of those you talked to in the crowd as far as the influence that President Trump has had. Of course, he said time and time again that the election in Georgia was rigged. Did they plan on voting? So many of them told me, Lindsay, that they were on the fence. These are runoff races that have been overshadowed by the president's repeated false claims that this election was rigged. He has called these runoff races illegal and invalid. That is also false. So I talked to so many of his supporters that turned out yesterday. This was in the 14th congressional district here in Georgia. It is an area where <coughs> conservatives are seeing lower voter turnout in comparison to the general election. And so the president flew in just yesterday. They want to drum up support for these two Republicans in this race so that they can hang on to control in the Senate. But I talked to several of the president's supporters who told me they were thinking about sitting this one out. They thought the president's repeated false claims that this election was rigged was true. Even though the votes in the state have been counted three times, the president and his allies have lost more than 50 cases in court. It is just simply false to say that the president won this state. And yesterday we saw him walk on that stage. And before he even said one single word about these two Republican candidates, he repeated that false claim, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, thanks so much. I'd like to bring in TJ Holmes. And TJ, these are unusual times for a number of reasons, but among them, it seems like on both sides, uh, you have uh, the opponents who are pretty much trying to play tag team or a package deal. You had the opportunity to talk to John Ossoff on GMA3, and he talked about that bond that he has with Raphael Warnock. Explain to us what he said. Yeah, and it, uh, to your point there, it seems like you do have almost two presidential tickets, if you will. They are like, you're right, you have Warnock and Ossoff running against Leffler and Purdue. It's exactly how it feels. It's exactly how it's set up. And it's amazing that this is taking place in a place like Georgia. But Ossoff today, um, we were kind of amazed. We, we had asks out to all of the candidates and he called us up. Yes, we want to we want to come on and we want to talk today on this busy day. And he was so on message today. We've had him on and we talked to him uh, in the past couple of months. Uh, but today he was on message that we want people to come out no matter what question we threw at him about Trump's rally, about what Trump said about him. He stayed on message about this being us being in a pandemic one. But also, if you want to change your circumstances, we want to get back on track. We need everybody. If you can hear my voice is even what he said. We need you to get out to the polls. So he was very, very consistent in that message today. And to watch this play out. And again, it's a place I'm very familiar with, Georgia. It's uh, I consider that my adult home. Like I said to you all, I'm, a, I'm an Arkansas born Atlanta boy from New York. Uh, at this point in my life. But Atlanta is something that's very familiar to me and Georgia to see these politics play out to where we now have, you talk about rural and you talk about urban, you talk about Atlanta Center with these uh, rural areas where you've got uh, uh, essentially the, uh, the black population versus, and you would argue, the white population. And this is happening in the South. And now you have this two tickets, you argue, with, with a, a Jewish kid, no disrespect to Ossoff, but he's 30 years old, a Jewish 
kid and a pastor who grew up in the projects in Savannah who quite literally leads MLK's flock today going up against two conservative Christian, the evangelical crowd on the other side. And this is so representative, Lindsay, uh, of so many of the politics in the country, but also the politics uh, and the conflict and the direction that some places in this country are going. This is it's amazing that this is playing out in Georgia tonight. Right. Raphael Warnock, his mother used to pick cotton and tobacco. He could be the first black senator in Georgia. Tom. All right, Lindsay, thank you. I want to go to Mary Bruce now. She covers Capitol Hill for us. She also covered the Biden campaign. Uh, Mary, how big is this race for the incumbent? coming administration for the president-elect. We saw him campaigning there just yesterday. This is huge because, of course, this isn't just about control of the Senate here that's hanging in the balance. It's also Joe Biden's agenda. Who controls the Senate will control how much of that agenda he's able to get done. So we're talking about tax policy, health care policy, a future stimulus, even that infrastructure bill that both sides talk about so much. And it's not just, you know, how much he can get done, but also the expediency with which he might be able to get things done. You know, Joe Biden today was out doing some interviews. He says he's feeling optimistic about these Georgia races and noted that if Democrats are able to pull this off, well, that means those $2,000 stimulus checks, for instance, the Democrats have been pushing for for so many months. He said that could happen immediately, that, that the additional aid uh, that Democrats want for state and local governments to be able to distribute the vaccine in a more timely fashion, he said that could happen uh, much faster than it normally would. So that's not to say, you know, that Joe Biden's agenda would, would hit a complete brick wall if Republicans continue to maintain control in the Senate, because, of course, Joe Biden prides himself on having a great working and personal relationship with Republican leader Mitch McConnell. But it certainly would make Joe Biden's uh, agenda and his political ambitions here much, much, much easier, of course, if Democrats were in control. And I think look no further to the growing rebellion that we are seeing uh, from Republicans in Congress, their attempts tomorrow that we will see to object to the certification of the Electoral College results to get a sense of just what an uphill battle Joe Biden may face if Republicans do, in fact, maintain control of the Senate. So, Mary, if he doesn't win, we know he's going to be dealing with the pandemic early on. If the Democrats aren't successful tonight, does that change anything in his lineup for his policies that he wants to push forward? And, and what do we know is at the top of that list? Well, it's a really good question. You know, how will he then uh, recalibrate if if Republicans continue to stay in control of the Senate? Obviously, uh, getting more financial relief for Americans who are desperately in need of a lifeline in the midst of this pandemic continues to be the top priority. But I suspect they may put, you know, higher up on the list areas where we know there is agreement uh, between the parties. That infrastructure bill we talk about so often, things like that may be moved higher up the list, whereas other issues that we know will be more challenging where Republicans may object more, well, they may move down on the list. And they're going to have to pick and choose, right? You only have so much political capital in this town. What fights uh, will the Biden administration be willing to really push on uh, versus others where they know that they're going to, you know, face more opposition from Republicans? So it will obviously change uh, the order on that very lengthy Biden to-do list. Okay, Mary Bruce, stand by for us. We do want to come back to you once we have more of the vote in. I want to go to John Carl right now, our chief White House correspondent. John, on that last point that I was talking to Mary, about Joe Biden is a creature of Congress and and before the partisan politics that took over now at the level they are um, with the Trump presidency he, he was friends with the Republicans he could cut deals if he's not successful tonight if the Democrats aren't successful tonight is that old Joe Biden going to be able to still make those deals or has Congress forever changed well, I think that this is why Biden was elected, and, and I think it's going to be a tremendous challenge. He's facing a, a Congress uh, where you have a number of Republicans, a large number in, in, the, in the House, and certainly a significant number in the Senate still refusing to accept him as the president-elect. So it's going to be an enormous challenge. But Biden does have those relationships. And look, no matter what happens tonight, he's going to have to work with Republicans, even if the Democrats pull off wins in both of these Senate seats. It's a 50-50 Senate. And you have um, somebody like, for instance, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who is a, a moderate to sometimes conservative Democrat, who is often going to side with Republicans on issues. No matter what, 
Biden is going to need to find uh, bipartisan support. The, mar the margin in the House is really narrow. And Nancy Pelosi, when all said and done, is going to have about a five-seat majority. Uh, she's going to have to uh, find a way to work with Republicans to get major initiatives done. And this, this is Biden's strength. It will be his great challenge. It'll be how his presidency is defined, whether or not he is successful in finding a way to reach out to at least some Republicans. John, before we let you go, and we're going to come back to you later in the broadcast, I do want to ask you about the phone call the president had with the Secretary of State that was leaked from Georgia. This is just, you know, days before this, this critical runoff election. Where is President Trump's mind right now? Because clearly it was not in the two Republican Senate candidates who were trying to win critical races there. It's entirely on his own battle and his own efforts to overturn this election. Look at that rally he had in Georgia. Sure, he urged voters there to go out and vote for the Republican senators, but most of his speech was about his grievances, about how he sees, he believes uh, this election falsely was stolen from him. And I've got to tell you, Republicans who are working hard on these races, uh, Senate Republicans, are deeply frustrated. They look at, at, at Donald Trump. Trump as somebody who has been trying effectively, whether it is subliminally or on purpose, trying to sabotage these Republican candidates. And you, Tom, you can see why. You know uh, Donald Trump uh, as well as anybody having covered his uh, his 2016 campaign. Look, how do you think Donald Trump looks at this? If these two Republicans win tonight, there's one person that lost statewide in Georgia in this election cycle, and that one person would be Donald Trump. Do you think Donald Trump, deep down, wants to see at the end of this uh, election cycle uh, that he is the only one that failed to win in Georgia? On the other hand, if they lose, he can say, you see, uh, it was all rigged from the start. They were out to get all of us. And, you know, it's a different argument. That said, you know, he is urging people to vote today. He went down there and went to this rally. But make no mistake, number one issue on Donald Trump's mind at this moment is Donald Trump. Sean Carl, we thank you for that. Lindsay? I'd like to bring Chris Christie in on that point. And also, Chris, how much are you concerned that potentially uh, President Trump has shot himself in the foot essentially by uh, trying to sow the seeds of distrust in democracy, in particular in Georgia, that it might prompt many Republican voters to sit this one out? I just don't buy it, Lindsay. I don't buy the fact that Republican voters can't hold two thoughts in, in their mind at the same time. <clears throat> you know, they hear what the president's saying. They heard what he said last night. Some of them agree. A uh, slight majority probably agree. Um, and, and, a, and a significant minority disagree. But it doesn't matter. They understand that the difference in this race is if they don't get out and vote for Loeffler and Purdue, that Bernie Sanders will be the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee. They understand that there will be issues that will be passed by the Democratic House and Senate and signed by President-elect Biden that they're opposed to. And so I think they know this is a really important election. They have been bombarded with advertising, door knocks, and every other contact. <clears throat> every other contact, excuse me, you could possibly have. So they're ready, and, and I think you're going to see a very large Republican turnout tonight, um, which will, I think, in a, in a very close race, um, put the race to both Senator Perdue and Senator Loeffler. If you take out your crystal ball, what's your expectation for tonight? I think a very close win for the two Republican senators. Uh, this race was always going to be close. The country is closely divided. Georgia is closely divided. It was the closest race um, of any state in 2020. Um, and so I, I've always thought it was going to be very close. But I do believe that both Purdue and Loeffler will get close wins tonight. And we may not know tonight. That may be a tomorrow or the next day issue. But I think they will ultimately prevail. I'd like to bring in Rahm Emanuel now. Rahm, of course, you were there during uh, the first two years when Obama had a, a called a governing trifecta. Of course, Dems had control of the House and Senate during that time. How much of a game changer was that then being able to get his agenda passed? And conversely, how difficult is it going to be for Biden if he doesn't win both seats tonight? Well, I mean, it's real simple. Uh, with the gavel comes control, with control comes power, everything else is commentary. That's how it looks at Lindsay. And the fact if you, if the Democrats win tonight, and I think it was brought out as an illustration by Mary Bruce, that $2,000 check issue, now I don't think the Biden campaign would be as ham-handed as the uh, Trump administration, in fact I know they would not be, but that would be on the floor. Minimum wage will be on the floor. 
Dreamers uh, legislation will be on the floor. Environmental legislation, protections of air and water will be on the floor. Con you have the gavel, you have control. You have control, you have power. It's that simple. Everything else doesn't really matter. Uh, and I think that, uh, well, now, there are narrowness there, and that means it's better to work with exactly the group that brought, brought together the first COVID relief package, uh, and that means working with Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, uh, obviously uh, Senator Murkowski, and others who want to be part of crafting legislation. I actually think one of the other pieces that's not often mentioned, a lot of senators do not really like what's happened over the last 10 years. They came to do something. And I think the um, motion and creating motion for the Biden administration will be to gather that kind of sense that we're here to legislate, not just to try to obstruct is the thing that I think Biden captures most. He knows the days of when the Senate was a legislative body, not an obstruction. And if he can capture that spirit that exists within a number of senators on both, uh, across both parties, but not as much in the Republican caucus, he will be able to get things done. But in the end of the day, the reason Georgia's come down is on election day, President-elect Biden did very well. There were no coattails. This would be the case to, to reverse that storyline and create coattails and then the ability to see through not only in this immediate area, but then also in reconciliation on the budget, his agenda. Rom, thank you. would like to bring in former Senator Heidi Heidkamp. And similar question to you, as a former senator, I mean, you know how the sausage is made and how the deals get done. How difficult would it be for Biden if he doesn't get control of the Senate tonight? Well, one thing that hasn't been mentioned so far is the fact that if Biden gets the majority, at least uh, an active 50 uh, uh, votes in the Senate, what you won't have is investigations on Hunter Biden. You won't have Ron Johnson running the uh, subcommittee on investigations at his GAC. And so that's a huge advantage. Um, for Biden, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think if you if you think about going forward, you're going to have to fashion a workable majority. And I agree with Rom that there are many many people on the other side, starting with uh, Lisa and even even Rob Portman, who is up in the next cycle, who are going to have to prove results. The other thing I want to say about this race, and I know everybody's looking at it nationally, but there was a dynamic in this Senate race in Georgia that wasn't in every race, and that is the allegations of insider trading. You have two multimillionaires who were both accused of insider trading, of, of dealing on information they received in the Senate, not saying whether it's true or not, but then they denied people a $2,000 check. And so that's a pretty powerful argument, and I think we're going to see that play out tonight as we look at um, kind of moving forward um, with this vote tally. And so we can't ignore that even though these races have become so nationalized, this is a very localized issue, and I think uh, uh, the Democrats were very wise to exploit it the way they did. Very personal for those in Georgia. Heidi Heidkamp, thanks so much. We're sending it back over to Tom as results continue to come in. All right, Lindsay, thank you so much. Yeah, that's right. We have 43% of the expected vote in. So the vote is coming in, I, I would say, maybe a little faster than we expected so far tonight. In the first race, uh, GA1, we have John Ossoff with 55%, Senator the incumbent Purdue with 45%. In Georgia 2, we have Raphael Warnock, Reverend Raphael Warnock with 54, Loeffler with 46%, essentially mirroring both elections. I want to go back to this first race and Ossoff. I do want to bring in our chief political strategist, Matt Dowd. Matt, I know you can yeah, hear yeah. me. I'm not sure if you can see me on the return but I want to talk through some data points with you and get your take on this because I think it's important. So when we started this broadcast, we talked about how Ossoff had underperformed from Joe Biden in the November election by about 100,000 votes in the Atlanta metro region. This is an area where he had a drive of the vote. When we look at an area like Cobb County, and a reminder, this is a place that uh, six years ago, Purdue actually won this county. If you look at the data right now, with 31% of the vote in, Ossoff is actually outperforming Joe Biden in Cobb County. Purdue is down to 33%. Again, only 31% of the vote in. We look at Henry County. 70% of the vote is in there. And John Ossoff is overperforming Joe Biden at 59%. Matt, it's still early in the night, but these are the kind of trend lines Democrats wanted in the Atlanta region, correct? 
I think the trend lines extend beyond the Atlanta region. I've looked at almost every county now, especially the counties that are 98 or 100 percent in. And all the indicators right now, every single indicator right now in this moment and time favors the Democrats, favors the two Democratic seats. The Democrats are overperforming right now in the blue areas, and they're overperforming by a point or two in the red areas. And I take a look at that, uh, Tom, vis-a-vis -vis Joe Biden's victory, who won by 11, 12,000 votes. If they're matching Joe Biden, it doesn't matter what they did in the Senate races in November. It's where they are vis-a-vis -vis Joe Biden, who barely won the state. In almost every single case, when you look at the county returns, all the county returns, almost every single case, the Democrats are either matching Joe Biden or they're exceeding Joe Biden by a point or two. So as of right now, at 8.30 on the East Coast, I would say that if you, you would much prefer to be the two Democratic candidates right now at this moment than the Republican candidates. My guess is they're looking at the same data I am, and they're worried, and they're concerned, and they're looking for other votes maybe that are still out there that haven't been tabulated yet. But it's a concerning moment right now for the two Republican candidates when you look at the trend data. I will, I will say, though, in, in northern Georgia and southern Georgia, the Republican candidates are mirroring where President Trump was just two months ago in the 80 percent rage in some of these smaller rural counties. But as we learned just two months ago, the race likely will be decided in the Atlanta metro region. I want to bring in Yvette Brown Simpson in as well. Yvette, I know you talked a lot about organizing in the state of Georgia and what the last two months was like for Democrats trying to get the early vote out. Uh, we have some new data in. This is the early vote so far. We have 57% of the early vote in. And again, both these res, uh, races, whether it be the warnock leffler race or the Purdue-Ossoff race, they're essentially mirroring each other. We're not seeing a split ticket, at least at this point in the night so far. So with 57% of the vote in, Democrats are on top, 57 to 43 in both Senate races. We expect the early vote, which we know is more than 3 million Georgians, to be about 72%. So this is the kind of position you want to be. Again, it's still very early in the night. We just started the this show, and we're going to be on for a couple of hours, but this is good news for the Democrats. Talk to me about how Democrats organized over the last two months, Yvette. It has been remarkable. I think when you think about where Georgia was a cycle ago with the big race being Stacey Abrams' race, I mean, you think about how disenfranchised people felt, how defeated people felt when you think about all of that and how they came back in November and how with this great new opportunity to, I think, be the heroes of the election here uh, and, and of our country if we get a good result here. Folks showed up and showed out. Organizers went out again. They registered new voters who were going to turn 18 on election day. So we had new registrants coming out. We had organizers going out and knocking on doors. And we talked earlier about how often during these runoff races, we just don't see that kind of turnout. They were not taking that chance this time, Tom, and they made sure that folks understood that this is not just about Georgia. This is about the nation. This is about making sure that we have the type of leadership that can get us out of the mess that we've been out of. And I think people saw that as an opportunity. And I think the fact, as you said, Tom, that these were linked together, that this wasn't just about Raphael Warnock or about Ossoff. It was about getting back control of the White House, getting back control of the Senate, getting back control of leadership. And I think they understand that. And so I'm really excited about the fact that the message was felt the fact that these races are tracking the way they are means that people understood that it was it was a two for a ticket and we needed both of these candidates to win okay, great organizing Thank you so much, Lindsay. One more data point before I send it back to you. This is Columbus, Georgia, 47% of the vote in. Raphael Warnock overperforming Joe Biden at this point in the race, 73% to 26%. Again, these are the kind of trend lines Democrats want. But, Lindsay, as we know, it's still so early. Still early. Joining us now is Georgia's Republican Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan. Thanks so much for joining our coverage tonight. First, the polls are now closed in Georgia. By all accounts, things went smoothly. Are you satisfied with how the election was run, and should voters have confidence in the outcome. Well, uh, certainly we have worked hard here in Georgia. We've been in the spotlight, uh, national if not international spotlight. Uh, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger has done a great job of continuing to try to uh, eliminate of as much of the background noise as possible uh, to put on a fair uh, and uh, legal election. And certainly I'm comfortable with what he's done to this point and looking forward to the results coming in. Are you worried about the constant claims of fraud without evidence by President Trump that that may have depressed Republican turnout? Absolutely. Uh, I've said it for weeks now on end that it is a distraction. 
Uh, I just heard the earlier piece, uh, somebody talking about the Democrats the last two months, what they've been doing, uh, signing folks up, uh, making sure that they get their message out. Uh, unfortunately, too many folks in our party over the last uh, two months have been talking about misinformation, election fraud, and creating a distraction. Uh, we've been outworked, outfocused, but my hope is that Kelly Leffler and David Perdue's hard work over the last two months is going to get them across the finish line and help us kind of regroup and as a party here in this state and also as a country uh, and uh, be able to roll back out and get the White House in 2024. And I'd like to ask you now about the president's call with Secretary of State Rathsberger Saturday, which you have called inappropriate. Should the call be referred to the state attorney general for investigation? I'm going to let the lawyers, uh, I'm not a lawyer by trade, so I'm going to let the lawyers and, and, and the folks uh, in the legal community figure that out. I, I just once again reiterate, I'm disappointed uh, not only at the timing, but just the, just the content. Uh, it was cringeworthy, and certainly it's hard to imagine anybody gave him that advice to have that call. Uh, I hope ever, anybody on my team would have, would have stepped up and said, hey, we're going to move on. Uh, but it is what it is, and uh, I'm proud of Kelly Leffler and David Perdue's effort as they've kind of marched through all this background noise and, and whatnot, and uh, hopefully we can get them across the finish line tonight. If, when all the votes are counted, your party loses both Senate seats, in your mind, could that potentially help the long-term future of the Republican Party? Because you have said in the past that the Republican Party needs to reckon with its future. Yeah, I think win or lose here, this is a pivot point for the Republican Party. Uh, we've got to, to go back to the fact and remember that this party is bigger than just one person. I'm grateful for, for Donald Trump's four years and the policy wins that he put, but uh, we cannot base our future just on one person. We've got to get back to what we're good at, and that's, that's policy. Uh, I think we've got to get better at our empathy and understand the folks that we're trying to bring into our fold. And we also got to figure out a way to communicate better than, than 280 characters. If our tone doesn't change, we're going to continue to have defeat after defeat if we can't just you know, crisply, cleanly communicate to America. Thank you so much, Jeff Duncan. And when we come back, our coverage continues with the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms. most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day. Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Right now, at this defining moment in America, with so much on the line, we gonna be all right. We gonna be all right. From ABC News, Turning Point, the groundbreaking special Nightline series, taking over, taking on this moment for America, my America, your America, our America. This is Turning Point, the special Nightline series. We gonna be all right. Late night on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. For Streaming now on ABC News Live. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC.
Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. The last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people were just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. This is the first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night, 24-7. ABC News, there for you. And welcome to our breaking news live coverage of the Georgia runoff elections. And right now we do have breaking news with nearly 50% of the expected vote in at this hour. We are taking a look at both these Senate races. We'll start with Senator David Perdue at 47%, John Ossoff 53%. In the Georgia second election there, we have the Reverend Raphael Warnock 54% with Kelly Loeffler at 46% at this hour. Some interesting so far, Expected votes in the findings that we've seen so far. I want to bring in Nate Silver, who is the founder and editor of the world famous 538, one of our partners here at ABC News. Nate, so far we're looking at the map. I was comparing what the map looks like right now, the jigsaw of all the counties there in Georgia, to what we saw just two months ago in Georgia with the presidential race and, of course, these yeah. Senate races as well. They, they almost look identical to each other. What is standing out for you tonight so far? To me, it's the turnout, actually, where in these blue counties, you seem to have slightly higher turnout than in the Republican counties, and that would be enough maybe to shift toward. You see our polling averages here showed Ossoff ahead by about two points, Warnock ahead by about two points before the election. If you look at projections like the New York Times upshot needle, they have actually results converging toward maybe a one-point lead for the Democrats. So it's going to tighten, we think. There is a lot of Election Day vote out there that should be more red. Um, but like, you know, like people have been saying, there are definitely more good signs for Democrats than Republicans. Republicans should be nervous right now. They should not, you know, they should not resign, be resigned to anything. It's still pretty early, but they should not be terribly happy with the data we're seeing so far. On that point, though, Nate, you know, we, we have heard from Georgia election officials who say a lot of the vote that's being counted right now is the early vote. That's what we're seeing right here. Yeah. I, is it possible there's a blue mirage? Because we also heard in some counties that there was record turnout for in-person voting as well. No, we do expect we're not going to probably see Warnock win by eight points, whatever he's up right now. So you should see a red shift. The question is, will it be enough? There is a lot of Election Day vote out there, but a lot of it is in Atlanta, which is not going to be so great for, for Purdue necessarily. Um, look, it's a numbers game. And if you look at the best data out there and you're forced people to commit to a number, they'd probably say we'd rather be Democrats than Republicans. But, but it more likely than not, will tighten some, for sure. You know, Nate, you wrote about a possible split ticket here, but explain it to me because I find it, I don't, I don't want to say I don't don't believe you. I understand your argument, but I, I, I'm just seeing right now so far with almost 50 percent of the vote in, they're almost carbon copies of each other, both these races. And what type of Republican or I would ask what type of Democrat maybe votes for Purdue and then votes for Raphael Warnock or vice versa? It just seems like a strange gamble, but I, I know you wrote about this. I mean, you have to hit right on the nose, right? You have about a one-point gap between these races. So if you have one race is won by one or half a point, the other race is lost by half a point. But remember, Leffler is not an elected incumbent. She has not won an election before. She also pivoted to a very far-right platform in the November election, whereas Purdue is a bit more moderate. So, you know, if one in every 100 Georgians is a split-ticket voter, it's not very many, but if you have a very, very close result, and you might, you could have that split. It's a possibility, not a likelihood, but, but you do see Warnock doing a bit better than Ossoff at the margin. Okay, Nate Silver for us. Nate, stand by for us. We are going to be coming back to you throughout this broadcast. I do want to bring in the mayor of Atlanta right now, Mayor Keish Lance Bottoms. Uh, Keisha, uh, thank you so much for joining us and our coverage. I'm going to start with Fulton County, where you're the mayor there in Atlanta. Right now, Raphael Warnock with 75% of the vote in, 83% uh, of the vote in, excuse me. Uh, Warnock on top with 75%. He's outperforming Joe Biden. As we look at the Ossoff Purdue race, Ossoff with 74%, outperforming Joe Biden as well. Democrats have to be very encouraged by these early numbers. Again, 83% already reporting in Fulton. We're very encouraged, and there's been an excitement and energy on the ground here that we've not ever seen in a runoff, a statewide runoff anyway. Um, President-elect Biden was here on yesterday. Uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris on Sunday in Savannah. I was able to join her there. 
and people are paying attention. And the thing that's always challenging for us is to get people to care about runoffs. There have been groups on the ground, one group in particular, Battleground Georgia, has been trying to turn out people who did not turn out in November. They've been very successful with that early vote. They were showing 40,000 people they had turned out who didn't turn out in November. And so there, there's, um, there's energy and effort that we've not seen before, and I think the numbers that you're seeing are reflecting that. You know, Democrats have been so disappointed before in the past with these runoff elections. Our Steve Osinsami, who is our correspondent based in Atlanta, was talking about this earlier tonight. What worries you tonight? You know, we have 50 percent of the vote in, so we still have a lot of vote to come in. What, what is worrying you so far about some of the things you're seeing, if anything? Well, what concerned me was election day, and that's what concerned me in November. My 18-year-old son went to vote today. He walked right into our precinct, voted. There was no line, so that's always a concern. But I'm encouraged by the fact that we had a record early vote turnout for the runoff. So again, people were paying attention. And anytime you have national attention on a race in our state, whether it be a, a local race or a statewide race, it really uh, gets people's interest in a way that otherwise, you know, runoffs can be very boring. And people were excited to see Joe Biden here, Kamala Harris. They were excited to see D Nice and Jermaine Dupri and Jeezy and Neo. There was a national energy that we felt on the ground, and it got a lot of people uh, paying attention. They early voted. A steady stream uh, throughout the city and throughout the state and talking with my fellow mayors, but that's what concerns me. What will we do on election day? Mayor, Atlanta right now is dealing with serious COVID issues. It's also dealing with serious crime issues as well. Whomever wins tonight, what will be the first thing you ask for help for your citizens there in Atlanta from the new senators that are coming in? We've got to get some help with vaccine distribution in our state. We are per capita, I believe, second to last with distribution. So we've got to get some help with that, getting more vaccines in the state. Um, and also something that I've talked with President-elect Biden about uh, on more than one occasion has been the mental health recovery piece that we aren't having a big discussion on. And that's what we're seeing across the country. Mayors across the country are talking about the spikes in violent crime that we're having. You know, domestic violence cases are up. People are suffering from depression and anxiety and it's spilling out into our streets, and we're going to need some national leadership with that. Mayor Bottoms, thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate it, uh, as always. I want to bring in Republican strategist Sarah Fagan. I'm also going to go back to the map. Sarah, I just want you to kind of hear me out with some data points here. So, you know, with 50 percent of the expected vote in, Republicans may have some things to worry about. I want to take you to, Alabama, uh, to Georgia's Black Belt, excuse me, uh, an area that they call the Black Belt because of a lot of the African-American residents who've lived there. Twiggs County, this is a county that President Obama won that flipped to uh, President Trump. And right now, Purdue is holding the line. He's actually just slightly below President Trump. We go to another county as well over here, Dooley County. Again, this was a county that swung from Obama to Trump, and Trump held it, you know, two months ago. Purdue's holding the line there. A lot of times people forget that President Trump was able to grow his base and that Republicans can still win these elections in the rural counties. From what you're seeing tonight, is there any optimism on the Republican side so far this early in the night? Well, you know, it's interesting. So Republicans went in tonight, I think, fairly pessimistic yeah, across the board. Almost everybody I talked to felt not good about this election. Uh, uh, spirits built throughout the day because of high turnout in these rural areas. There was fear because of uh, Trump's comments and his attacks on the governor and the establishment in the state that turnout would be depressed. It, it appears like it won't be depressed, although it is still early and the, the tale is yet to be told on that. So, you know, it's cliche to say this, but it really comes down to turnout. And we know this is going to be a close race. I think what's different about tonight compared to November is Republicans came in strong. Uh, election Day turnout showed up early. Republicans were leading. People were less worried about Georgia until we got late in the night. And, of course, as the absentees were counted outside of uh, Atlanta, Democrats picked up, picked up, and overtook very, very late. Uh, in the process, uh, this is different tonight. And so I think people are scratching their heads a little bit about why that is. 
uh, some of the suburbs are coming in earlier, some of the absentee and early vote being counted early. So I don't think we know yet. Um, I trust Matt Dowd as much as anybody as a numbers analyst. So uh, as a Republican, that gives me uh, concern listening to his comments. Sarah, on that point, we do have some of the early vote numbers, and we, we expect it to be 72% of the total vote uh, when it's all said and done, with 63% of that early vote counted, and that's a lot of what we're seeing tonight so far. We know that from Georgia yeah. election officials. We can see Raphael Warnock with 56% of the vote, Senator Leffler with 44%. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a tough margin to catch up to. It can be done, but what you're saying, it's not going to happen in this early vote. It's going to be from the voting in person that happened today. Yeah, Republicans will need to get, I think, about 900,000 people at least to show up today. Uh, they walked into today probably down about 200 to 230,000 votes, so you've got to make it up. Of course, you don't get all the votes. So I think we're looking at 900 to a million people having voted, and if that happens, Republicans uh, will win these seats. Okay, Sarah Fagan for us. Lindsay, I'm going to shoot it back over to you. All right, let's bring in special contributor Mike Muse now. Earlier in the show, we were talking about that urban-rural divide. Traditionally, as you know, Mike, uh, urban voters tend to vote Democrat, rural voters tend to vote Republican, but black voters often buck those trends, and regardless of where they live, they tend to vote Democrat. Uh, we also heard from the mayor uh, who was talking about those community organizers, those boots-on-the-ground efforts. Intentionally, they have seemed to be uh, really singling out and going after the black rural voter. Why? That's an important vote. I think it kind of goes back to Stacey Abrams back in 2014 with her initiative, the New Georgia Project. What Stacey really focused on was she recognized that when we think rural, we think white. Um, but the whole narrative is that there are a lot of black Americans who make up the rural South. And what was recognized was that a lot of people hadn't went to them. They weren't seen. They weren't invited to participate in the democratic process, which is voting. And so what they did was really focus on that black rural South. And what we're seeing in the numbers in terms of early voting and possibly same day voting is not only just Atlanta, we keep focusing on Atlanta and Fulton County, but that South rural aspect of Georgia, that is where I'm really interested in seeing in terms of does the black rural South of Georgia cut off of the rural aspect of the northern part of Georgia? And so I think that is going to be really key as we go through the night. Mike Muse, thanks so much. I'd like to bring you back in, Steve Osinsami. You know, throughout the night, we've also been talking about this idea of the new South, this real intentional shift. What do you attribute that to? Well, a couple different things. You have not only the black vote, uh, but you also have new populations here to the south, especially the Atlanta metro area, a large Latino population, a large Asian population. Um, there, was a, there was a period of time here in the south where there was white flight from the city of Atlanta to the suburbs. And you had suburbs that, when I first moved here, were almost entirely white in the northern suburbs of Atlanta. Now, many of those suburbs are quite diverse. Cobb County, Gwinnett County, which we keep talking about just north of the city, has a large Asian population and Latino population, and both of those counties are now blue. Uh, something, Lindsay, you and I talked about earlier, I was explaining that, you know, some of the history here, just to show how different things are, how the population shift has happened, when the trains were set up in Atlanta, the residents of one county, Cobb County, to the north of Atlanta, successfully were able to prevent the trains from coming into their county because they had crime concerns about uh, crime coming from the city. That county now has a large Latino population that has changed the nature and the politics of those counties. So there is a major population shift that has happened. I've talked with, um, with a, a, a friend who used to work for one of the Republican governors here who explained to me that every two years, about 50 50,000 more people move to the Atlanta metro area, and that is changing sort of the dynamic here. And so this friend estimated that if Stacey Abrams were to run again today, she would have gotten the 50,000 votes that she needed to win because of the population shifts that are happening and keep happening here in Georgia. And what's happening here in Georgia is reflective about reflective of what's happening in many other uh, areas across the country. Right. And of course, that we've seen that there's been a 5 percent increase in registered black voters in Georgia in recent years. I'd like to bring back in T.J. Holmes. T.J., of course, as you talked about before, used to live in Atlanta, work there. And so you have seen this shift. 
shift really firsthand because then you were back in Georgia for the election. So kind of talk us through that Stacey Abrams effect, if you will. You were there, it was ruby red, now quite a purple state. Quite purple, but we've been talking about the numbers and the increases over the past several years, but if you look from 2000 to 2019, there were about two million new people added to the electorate there in Georgia. Half of those were African Americans. There has been a shift. We talk about the Great Migration, right? When African Americans were trying to free the uh, or flee the Jim Crow uh, South, but so many people are coming back to the South. African Americans. They have roots there. They have family there. They have history there. And now it's a place that they, they see a place certainly like Atlanta, which is referred to as the Black Capital of the United States, where African Americans can do well, where African Americans are flourishing, where you have this center the, uh, of, of education with with Morehouse and Spelman uh, and colleges Clark Atlanta University so it's a place that has great appeal uh, these days more so for African Americans who are coming back and, and, and we talk about guys this runoff election that we're in we, we will see this dynamic continue to change uh, over the years no Stacey Abrams was not successful but what she has done is set up Georgia probably for years and years maybe decades and decades to come and that she got so close in a controversial election but we talk about the runoff and how Al, Al Warnock would have been uh, the, the new U.S. senator. Well, some of these runoff laws, it's important to note, these runoff laws have a history in Jim Crow in trying to keep African Americans from getting political power, trying to keep African Americans from voting as a plot as a block against multiple white candidates to make it more difficult. So even though we look at a runoff now and say, oh, those are just the rules there, and it seems pretty innocent, all of these things were put in these in place to actually suppress black voters and also to keep black folks out of office. And they're in place in Alabama, Mississippi. Arkansas, Georgia, South Carolina, places like that. So all of this is coming to a head and coming together in a state like Georgia, where it's now a national race and all eyes are on a place that's becoming diverse and really representative in a lot of ways in how the country is changing, how the face of the country is changing, how we're getting diverse, where you have people trying to hold on to some old ways, and you got others, Lindsay, and you had Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms on. Do you know on her transition team, she had T.I. and Killer Mike. If you don't know who that is, then you're not only missing some good music, but you're missing the point of what's happening in a place, a cultural and a black mecca like Atlanta is having such such uh, uh, an impact on this race and on national politics, and it is a beautiful thing to, to kind of watch us all go through it, no matter what side you're on, to just to see the country evolve like this, and it's happening in Georgia tonight. And with the Jeezy and the Gucci Mane uh, versus as well, they gave the plug yeah. to go out and vote. I'm sure that you are watching that. We appreciate your dual citizenship uh, <laughs> between Atlanta but, and New York. But Lindsay, you make that point we about... We'll be right back. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right Right back with more from our legal team. time, anytime, Nightline. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not 
Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Ossoff versus Purdue. Warnock versus Leffler. Election night, the Georgia Senate runoffs. Here now, Tom Yamas and Lindsey Davis. And welcome to our special coverage of the Georgia Senate runoffs. We have breaking news coming in. We have a tied race, folks, as the entire country right now is watching what's happening in the Peach State. Of course, so much importance and emphasis on tonight as control of the Senate hangs in the balance. And after all, Georgia has not sent a Democratic senator to the Senate since 2000. We want to take a look at where the race stands right now. And as we said, we've just gotten breaking developments at this hour. So we're looking at the incumbent here, Senator Purdue, at 50%, John Ossoff at 50% as well. This is in the first Senate runoff. In the second Senate runoff race, we have Senator Leffler at 49%, Raphael Warnock 51%. And this is with 60% uh, of the expected vote in, almost carbon copies of each other. I want to explain what happened because before we went to break, there was about a 6 to 8% gap with the Democrats on top. So how do the Republicans catch up? It, a lot of it is on Cherokee County. This is the, the, the county with the most Republican voters. This is where they had to run up the score. 90% of the expected voters in. And you can see Senator Perdue with 68% of the vote. He's holding the line almost exactly where President Trump was just two months ago. This was an important development for the Republicans in this race with 60% of the vote coming in. But as we look at the Atlanta metro region in places like Fulton, the largest county in all of Atlanta, you see John Ossoff at 74%. Joe Biden was at 72%. But just that 2% in this large county in Georgia is going to make a difference. A reminder, Joe Biden won the state of Georgia by just 11,000 votes. So any kind of incremental advantage the Democrats have is going to help them in the long run. We are seeing Democrats so far at this point, both Ossoff and Raphael Warnock outperforming Joe Biden in some of these major counties. That's a trend line, Lindsay, that Democrats hope to hold. But as we just saw, this race can immediately change with just one county reporting. Lindsay. All right. Thanks, Tom. I'd like to break bring back in Rachel Scott and, and Rachel we were talking earlier about how the Republican candidates have had to walk such a front a fine line really because the party is so fractured and trying to uh, remain uh, that keep their allegiance to President Trump and at the same time uh, keep a little distance as well. Yeah, and just one of those examples is when it comes to those stimulus checks. You had both of the Republicans in this race vote for and support the $600 in that bill that the president's own team helped negotiate. And then we saw the president in the 11th hour come out and say that he wanted $2,000. And then they flipped their stance on that. Neither of the senators here either voted for or against overriding that veto that the president did on the defense bill. That's another example. And then, of course, you have the president's long, weak fight to 
overturn the results of an election that he lost. And Kelly Leffler yesterday came on the stage at that rally that President Trump was at. And before she even started to tell his supporters why they should vote for her tomorrow and the next day on the election day, she, she said that she supports this push by Republicans that we are seeing 100 and at least 140 members in the House that are supporting this, at least a dozen senators that are going to be pushing to reject the will of the voters tomorrow when Congress meets. She says that she does support that. But, you know, voters here are taking their cues from this. I talked to one woman, Shauna Anderson, yesterday, and she said that she is very concerned that the fractured party right now is going to send the wrong message to Republican voters, the president's base that they absolutely need to turn out today in order to keep control of the Senate, Lindsay. And let's also talk about Senator Purdue, who's been in self-quarantine uh, the last few days, the most critical time in this election due to an exposure that he had with somebody who was tested positive uh, for COVID. How critical has that been for his campaign? And it really could not have come at a worse time. When you're talking about this close election, his team knows that this will absolutely be a tight race. 88,000 votes is what he ended up winning by for just the last time a hair, but it just was not enough for him to seal the deal there, which is why this went into a runoff. And so just the final weekend heading into Election Day, he uh, is now in self-quarantine after a campaign staffer tested positive for COVID-19. He is physically off the trail. He has been participating in virtual campaign events, but there is nothing like just that interaction with voters. And we have seen the Democrats do it today. We have seen, obviously, Kelly Leffler hit the ground running, working late into the night, trying to get out the vote. There's nothing that beats that. And right now, Senator David Perdue just does not have that option, Lindsay. All right. Thanks so much, Rachel Scott. Let's bring back in Mary Bruce and just kind of give us a sense of what's at stake here uh, for the Biden administration and potentially how difficult it might be if they don't win both seats in the Senate tonight. Well, Biden's agenda is at stake here. Now, when talking with the Biden campaign, obviously, I think they say that his priorities will remain the same, first and foremost, uh, tackling this pandemic, getting more economic relief to Americans, that, that those priorities won't change, whether it's Democrats or Republicans in control of the Senate. But there's no denying that the scope and the scale uh, of Joe Biden's agenda and the issues that he decides to tackle, perhaps the order in which he decides to go after and try and fulfill these campaign promises, will inherently be shaped by who is in control of the Senate. Now, Joe Biden is adamant uh, and very optimistic that even if Republicans maintain control, that he will be able to get them to the table. Uh, and he's relying in part on those relationships that he forged over many, many years in the Senate. He is a creature of the Senate, first and foremost. He has a very strong relationship with Republican leader Mitch McConnell. And he is adamant that despite uh, the deep divisions within the Republican Party, despite the incredibly partisan the nature of Washington politics now, that he will be able to work across the aisle. Uh, that is a lot easier than th said than done. Uh, the Washington that Joe Biden is inheriting is very different, far more uh, bitterly divided than the Washington that he left. Uh, so Joe Biden, if Republicans maintain control of the Senate, will have a lot of work ahead of him. And I do think you don't have to look much further than the, the fight within the Republican Party uh, over whether or not to certify the results of the Electoral College, as Rachel just mentioned, to see really what Joe Biden may be up against if Republicans maintain control uh, of Congress. All right. Thanks so much, Mary Bruce. Let's bring back in Jonathan Carl. And, and John, give us a sense of, in your estimation, how large Trump looms over this election. And what does it mean if, uh, what's the, the signal, I guess, if you don't have Asif or Warnock with a victory tonight? Uh, well, look, he looms large over the entire Republican Party, and this is the single biggest event uh, left uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Trump presidency for his party. He has had a very hard time uh, helping Republicans win when he is not on the ballot. Look what happened in 2018. Uh, you know, Donald Trump got out there. He campaigned uh, uh, for, for candidates all over the country. Uh, but, you know, every one of his rallies is ultimately a rally about Donald Trump. Uh, the supporters are there for Donald Trump, and, and Republicans fared very poorly uh, in, in those midterms. Now uh, you have the extraordinary circumstances surrounding uh, this runoff election, where Donald Trump has been largely absent except to complain about his own election in Georgia, some members of his party, uh, some people working on these two Republican Senate campaigns, uh, musing privately about whether or not Donald Trump is trying to sabotage uh, their election.
election. He did come out. He did uh, speak very strongly on behalf of both Purdue and Leffler uh, in his rally in, in Georgia yesterday. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But I, I think that ultimately uh, Donald Trump will either uh, take credit or get, uh, or get a heck of a lot of blame if the Republicans lose tonight. But if you think if, if potentially Ossoff and Warnock both lose, do you think that that means that this blue shift was perhaps a, a more of a referendum on President Trump than anything else? Uh, you know, perhaps, but but you know, th this is you consider the history here, as as Steve Wilson Sami uh, talked about earlier. Uh, Democrats have a hard time uh, with these uh, runoff elections in Georgia. There have been many of them. There have been many uh, Democratic hopes of knocking off Republicans uh, that, that, that have crashed and burned. And I think that Republicans, uh, w you know, believe that if if. Trump had made this less about himself and more about providing a check on, on a Biden presidency, uh, that the Republicans would have won both of these easily. If they win, if they pull off victories here, there will be narrow victories. Jonathan Carl, thanks again. All right, Lindsay, I want to invite back Rahm Emanuel and Chris Christie, two of our political analysts, to talk about some of the data that we're seeing so far. Rahm, I'm going to start with you. So as the race stands right now, 63 percent of the expected vote is in. It is 50-50. Both races, both the first and second Senate races runoffs, are, are carbon copies of each other. The only difference is maybe about 600 votes more for, for Ralph Warnock uh, than Ossoff. But, but I want to talk about Ossoff and how he's doing in places like Fulton County. This is where Atlanta's at. He's overperforming for Joe Biden. He's about 2% over in Fulton, in the entire Atlanta region, really. In Clayton County, a smaller region, 75% of the vote in. He's at 89% versus 85%. And then DeKalb County as well, 85% for John Ossoff, 83% for Joe Biden. Ron, these numbers are important for Democrats because going into this race, there was some real worry about this 33-year-old political newcomer, if you will. Could he actually win a statewide race in Georgia? He underperformed from Joe Biden by about 100,000 votes, but but tonight, with 63% of the vote in, you got to be happy with what you're seeing, Rom. <laughs> yeah, look, I actually, one county you left off there, you did a lot of Democratic counties. <clears throat> I think the Democrats are doing better in some of the areas. Take Cherokee County. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, Donald Trump won that by about 58,000. And right now, the Democrats are only losing it by 36,000. So they are doing better in those rural areas and Republican strongholds than Biden did. And they're doing much better in the Democratic areas, uh, uh, like around the metro uh, Atlanta area, than Joe Biden did. And the turnout in the Democratic areas is bigger or as big as Election Day November. So that bodes well for the Democrats at this point. And I want to pick up on what Jonathan Carl said. Three weeks ago when we did the Sunday show uh, with George, I said that Donald Trump wants to see the Republicans lose because he wants to, A, send a gift back to McConnell. He doesn't think McConnell's been uh, as loyal, which would be a shock. But he wants to say, if I'm not on the ballot, you guys can't win. And that's what he's doing with all the chaos and all the noise and everything like that. This is a setup for him to show that he is indispensable to the Republican Party, and this is his bouquet back to Mitch McConnell and the Republicans, who he thinks, bizarrely, have not shown a fidelity that uh, he deserves. And that's what's going on right now. And the Republican Party, here forward, is going to be learned as Donald, before Donald Trump and after Donald Trump. And we're in the early stages of that after Donald Trump, and it is going to be, uh, it's going to like the, make the Sunnis and Shiites look like a very calm family gathering. All right, I want to bring Chris Christie. Chris, I want to talk to you about two counties, Cobb County and Gwinnett County. They're just outside of Atlanta. These are counties that Senator Perdue won when he first ran for Senate back in 2014. Tonight, with 39% of the vote in, he's underperforming from President Trump just two months ago. How much do you think President Trump's actions over the last two months has hurt the Senate candidates in Georgia? Uh, we won't know until we get the final results of the election. But what I will say is that when you look at counties like Fulton, for instance, you've got well over 85 percent of the vote in Fulton already counted. Um, and you have a race that's now, you know, in uh, eight or nine thousand vote difference. Um, so I still feel very good about the way these numbers look for Republicans. Um, the day of vote is just now being counted. Um, a large amount of the uh, early vote and mail in vote has been counted already. And so, you know, I like the way the numbers look for Republicans. I always said it was going to be very, very close, but I still think that both Senator Loeffler and Senator Perdue um, appear to be in good shape. And on the Cherokee issue, very little of the vote in Cherokee has been counted yet. And so I, I, if I were Rahm, I wouldn't start dancing quite yet. 
Governor, I do want to ask you something, though. On election night, I should say election week, we, we were here for so many days. And one thing we kept pointing out was President Trump was losing states, but his base was growing. He brought more voters to the table on, on election night. My question is, with that type of momentum, even in Georgia, where 11,000 votes separated him and Joe Biden, you know, you got to think, and I guess I guess it's still early. We, we don't know how this is going to end up. But you got to think if the president focused on Georgia, if, if he campaigned there a little bit more, if he truly fought for these Senate candidates, and I know he was there last night, but we know what his focus has been the last few days. You got to think these Senate candidates would be in a better position. Tom, I just don't agree with your premise. I mean, you know, the fact is that everybody's base grew um, in the 2020 election. So did Joe Biden's. Um, he got more votes than any presidential candidate in American history. And so everybody grew more. Why? Because we had COVID and we had rampant broad mail-in voting um, that made voting uh, a lot easier than it is normally. And so now we're having a second race, six, seven weeks, uh, or seven, eight weeks after the last one. Um, of course, there's going to be a bit of a lower turnout. Uh, people's enthusiasm is not nearly as much for a race like this as it is in a presidential race. Now, all the work that's been done by both sides, the advertising, the get out the vote efforts, the grassroots efforts that have been done make this the greatest turnout race for a runoff election in Georgia history. But, uh, you know, I think that the, the obsession of the media is to, to tag everything with Donald Trump, either pro or con. It's all about him. It is not all about him. And David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler have records. Their, their opponents have records. And the candidates in the end matter much more than the president does or than President-elect Biden does, who, by the way, just won the state. So the same argument can be made in the other direction, Tom. You know, Joe Biden just won the state. Why, aren't, uh, the, why isn't that momentum paying off for Warnock and, and Ossoff? But, but, Governor, I, I mean, I don't know if it's an obsession. You talked about leadership. Leadership does matter. Who's the head of the Republican Party? The head of the Republican Party is, is, right. is President it's Trump. Not. And wait, hold on, let me, let me finish. And, it, and, and the question was, do you think— It's It's an you, obsession. No, I, I hear you. But do you think that do you think President Trump, his actions, the actions of people like Rudy Giuliani, confusing voters maybe in Georgia about whether their vote counts, do you, do you think that hurt the two Senate candidates who, no, who were competing no, I, for a very competitive race there? I have a lot more faith in the voters of Georgia than apparently you do. I don't think they're confused. I don't think they're confused about anything. I think that they know what the stakes are here, and they're going to turn out and vote. Both sides are going to turn out and vote because they know what the stakes are. I don't think anybody is confused um, at all about what the stakes are tonight. And the stakes are tonight, if you want your party to win, if you want your preferred candidates to win, you got to turn out and vote because everyone has said from the day after the last election that this was going be a very, very close election no matter what. And I just don't believe that Donald Trump is the determining factor in tonight's election, given the numbers that I've seen so far. Now, if Warnock and Ossoff were to pull away in a much bigger way and win this thing tonight, which I don't expect will happen, then maybe we'd have to reevaluate it then. But right now, Tom, I know, I know everybody just wants to talk about Donald Trump all the time, um, but this is about Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue. It's a lot about a lot of people. I agree with you. It's about the two Senate candidates. All right, Governor, we thank you so much. I do want to bring in Terry Moran, our senior national correspondent out of D.C., who has covered so many political races for us, along with the White House and, of course, Washington. Terry, the way you see this race so far, because we have seen it sort of get a little bit tighter with 63 percent of the expected vote in. And, and I want you to take up some of the, the points that Governor Christie was making. He, he was saying essentially, you know, and we just heard him, but that, that this wasn't about President Trump. It was about the people who were on the ballot. Do you, do you buy that? Well, I, I, A, defer to Governor Christie's political expertise. I've never run for office, and I agree with him that basically trust the voters. They, they can walk and chew gum at the same time. It never seemed logical to me that, that by uh, Trump saying, don't trust uh, the results of my election, people couldn't go out and vote for the candidate they wanted to. The problem that Donald Trump made for Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue is he changed the issue. The issue is not an ordinary bread and butter issue about higher taxes the way the Democrats are going to run the Senate. The issue is, do you want to betray the Constitution with me or not? And he forced Kelly Loeffler and uh, David Perdue to sign on to his effort to overturn the democracy. And the problem is that the, today's exit polls show that 70 percent 
of the people of Georgia demonstrating their very good common sense believed that their election in the November in that state was held fairly, as every court has demonstrated as their own Republican election officials certified, along with all the other 49 sovereign states. So he forced them to get into his cartoon view of what happened in November. And that, it turns out, uh, was at least as far as that particular issue is concerned. It could well be that they'll both win at the end. But Donald Trump twisted this election around his vanity and his need to defy reality to say that he won Georgia when 70 percent of the people of that state, according to today's exit poll, said, you know what, I think we had a fair election in November. That and, hurt the Republican candidates. And so many major elections since President Trump was elected, and even in his first race, were about President Trump in one way or another. I want to bring Rahm Emanuel back in, because I know he wanted to get in when, when his good friend Governor Christie was making his point. <laughs> yeah, but look, if anybody sitting there on November 7th said, okay, we're going to have a runoff, it's clear. Let's design it where the president's running around for the final three weeks, making charges about the election and throwing doubts about ballots and on the integrity of the vote. That would be not how you choreograph it. And the, I, Donald Trump has always, for, since four years ago, been the centrifugal force that drives energy on both parties. And the notion that somehow this was all about Purdue or uh, Senator Leffler and had nothing to do with the uh, overarching uh, environment and atmosphere that Donald Trump did. In the end of the day, no voters got persuaded for or against a candidate in any way. They got motivated to vote. And what Donald Trump was doing was con creating confusion around that vote. And that was not helpful. That is not how anybody, and I know Governor Christie campaigned for state legislators, yeah. state senate. This is not sure. how you organize a campaign. Now, will it have a detrimental effect? It wasn't helpful. We don't know if it was detrimental. Governor Christie, I know you want to get the final word in before we hit this break. And I'm not taking dancing advice well, Rom, from well, him. <laughs> yeah, well, you, sh you shouldn't. You're a much better dancer than I am, Ron. Yeah, but, that's very uh, clear. But listen, at the, end of, at the end of his point, it took Ron a while, but he finally got it right. My point was... Thanks, Chris. It, it's, it's not going to be determinative. I mean, does the president have an effect on the election? Of course he does. The same way Joe Biden right. has an effect on the election, but not a determinative effect. Mm -hmm. And my point is that every question comes at me about Donald Trump. And did Donald Trump do this or should he have done that? And my point is that the candidates ultimately are the ones who matter the most and the campaigns they run and how they do things. And when you look at it right now, with 68% of the vote in, David Perdue's now pulled ahead and Kelly Loeffler is, is within 5,000 votes of, of of Raphael Warnock. Um, this is going to be a very close race and one that's going to be determined ultimately by Warnock and Ossoff versus Loeffler and Purdue with Biden and Trump as background music. Governor Christie, Rahm Emanuel, Terry Moran, please stick with us. I want to show you guys something fascinating that's happening right now in this race. Take a look at our big board right here. And, and we have what Nate Silver was sort of talking about, a, a, a split ticket right now. Again, still very early in the night, 14,000 plus for Senator David Perdue, 11,000 plus for Raphael Warnock. It is still very early. Our continuing coverage continues right after this break. This is what being live is all about. Now, I can see. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source, ABC News. Wow. Breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, nonstop, straight to you. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live events and moments this is live. all playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only ABC News gets. Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime. 
Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and ABCnews.com. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere, right to you. ABC News Live. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail? Yes. David. David. You can see just home after home. David, thanks nice to meet you. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. All right, welcome back to our continuing coverage of the Georgia Senate runoff elections. And so much has happened over the last 30 minutes. Republicans now on top with 68% of the expected vote in. Still very early. A lot of the vote is still out there. A lot of this vote, from what we understand, at least in the early part of this broadcast, was the early vote that was being counted. But you can see right there, Senator Perdue on top, 24,000 votes over John Ossoff. And then you have Senator Leffler on top by 2,000 votes. First, Raphael Warnock, the Reverend, of course, of Ebenezer Baptist Church. I want to bring in our political gurus right now, Mary Alice Parks and Rick Klein, our co-political directors. Mary Alice, I want to start with you because we almost have a split ticket here. And you'd have to wonder what type of Democrat or what type of Republican would vote for one of these candidates and then would vote for the other party in the other race. Look, I still think it's pretty unlikely that the, at the end of the night we have a split ticket. But uh, coming into tonight, everyone thought if that was to happen, it would be this scenario. David Perdue has been elected as a senator before. He's the only one on that board that has won an election in Georgia as a senator. Kelly Loeffler was appointed to her seat. She was largely appointed with this idea that she might be able to win back some women in those suburbs that, um, you know, really hasn't happened. We've seen Democrats start to really run away with the Atlanta suburbs instead. She's really uh, hitched her wagon completely to President Trump, um, as has David Perdue, but he just has more name recognition in the state. He's been around longer. His family is well known in this state. And so if, if one of the two Republicans is to win and not both, I, I think that this is the more likely scenario, but I still think at the end of the night, it's pretty unlikely. I think it's probably going to be two D's or two R's. Okay, Rick Klein, you were talking about this before we started tonight, saying that Perdue, like Mary Alice has been saying, has the name recognition, especially in some of the rural areas. And, and in areas that voters may have voted for, for Raphael Warnock, they may have gone with Purdue as well. Yeah, we saw some split tickets back in November. Obviously, that's how Joe Biden won, and neither of these Democratic senators uh, actually topped where the Republican votes landed. So it obviously happened at that time. And I think what's really interesting, uh, if you look at some of the messaging that seemed to break through in, in this election, all you heard from the Republicans was these guys, these Democrats are liberal stooges. They're going to go enact a socialist agenda. And it really seems like that worked. That kind of messaging worked. Forty-six percent of voters overall saying that, that Warnock is too liberal for the job. You contrast that with the, the alternate messaging is Kelly Loeffler uh, too conservative and, and it just doesn't, it didn't, it didn't really hit the same way. So I think when you saw messaging that was uh, aside from the Trumpism of this election was rigged, focusing on the ideology of the candidates, it's a reminder that Georgia still is a relatively red state. These candidates are much different animals and a lot of these voters were able to process that information and make some different decisions. One point I want to make before I kick it back over to Lindsay, one of the biggest Republican counties 
counties in Georgia, Forsyth County. We're still waiting on votes to come in there. Uh, one of your, your guys' deputies, Quinn Scanlon, one of our political producers, points this out. That's going to be a huge number of Republican votes. We're still waiting on that. 63% of the vote in. Lindsay, it's 50-50. It's, it's essentially where we were with the Trump-Biden race. <laughs> and where we started at the beginning yeah. of the night. Anybody's race. like to bring in now Leah wright Rigor, a special contributor here at ABC News, also an American history professor at Brandeis. So let's take a step back, if you will, and let's think about the idea that since the 1990s, Democrats have only won one of seven statewide runoffs. So give us the backstory of this controversial history of the Georgia runoff law and the connection with Jim Crow. So what we know is that these kind of laws emerge right around the same time that we start to see laws, anti-discrimination laws emerge around uh, voting rights. And so we see, we start to see in Georgia's case, we see in 1963, roughly, we begin to see these laws emerge that are designed to really stamp out what we call black block voting, or the power, this large power of black, uh, large black voting. So it sends it to, it essentially sends it to runoff county. But we also see other kinds of, you know, preventative measures. So this kind of runoff works well with things like grandfather clauses, poll taxes, literacy tests, these kind of old, you know, uh, techniques designed to keep black people out, of, out at the polls. So we may think that this is something that's ancient history, but in fact, it's still very much in place and it's very much designed to dilute black voting power and has that kind of effect and historically has had that kind of effect, particularly in Georgia. All right, thanks so much, Leah. I'd like to bring in now Kate Shaw, legal analyst. And Kate, many people are saying that uh, President Trump's call to Georgia's Secretary of State on Saturday crossed a line. But is it your estimation that the right move at this point would be for the Fulton County DA to investigate it? You know, I think it's interesting that the Republican officials across the state of Georgia um, have sort of been uniform in condemning the president's call. Um, you know, it's a it's a state that is basically run by statewide elected Republicans, um, and none of them have been willing to disavow the possibility that some local uh, prosecution or at least investigation of the lawfulness of that Trump phone call uh, might be in order. So, you know, it seems to me that that doing that, making that call in the run up to this election, uh, may have had a very significant political cost for President Trump and. For these two Senate candidates, um, but also could conceivably at least lead to an investigation. The problem, of course, is a criminal justice standard will typically involve um, a state of mind, right? Establishing that the president knew that he was attempting to uh, coerce fraud or commit fraud. And it's just not clear what he knows or believes about what transpired uh, during the presidential election in Georgia. So that, I think, would be the obstacle to potentially obtaining a conviction. Uh, but I think an investigation certainly seems to be a live possibility at this point, at least after January 20th when he, le when he leaves office. If I can put you on the spot for a moment, Kate, what was your immediate reaction when you heard the call? It was really shocking, honestly, Lindsay. Um, you know, I, I listened to the full hour. I, I'm sure a lot of people did. Um, and, it, it, you know, the headlines didn't really even do justice. Uh, the experience of listening to someone, you know, who really seemed to dance around and then actually come right out and say, I need you to change the results of the election for me, right? Of, a, you know, the democratically sort of the will of the people uh, pointed in one direction. And I need, you know, 11,780 votes. And I need you to find those for me. So, so he talked about fraud. But at a couple of points, he seemed pretty explicitly to be seeking the commission of fraud. Um, so for a sitting president to do that, I, you know, I think I, I continually to continue to be shocked by it. And we will see what, if any, a legal fallout there might be. I'd like to bring Terry Moran in on this, specifically about the call, Terry. And we heard uh, earlier from the lieutenant governor of Georgia, who has said in the past that he believes that it's uh, the Republican Party needs to have a reckoning. What do you feel uh, the role and the impact of that call, specifically uh, to the secretary of state in Georgia, how that might play out, not only in this particular election, but down the road for the Republican Party? Great question, and I think we saw in Lieutenant Governor Duncan's answer to your question the beginnings of a post-Trump uh, uh, Republican Party. Look, uh, he knows his colleagues. He, he wants to stand by the citizens of his state who overwhelmingly believe that they held a free, fair, and uh, true election in November. And so he said very carefully uh, that one of the things that had mucked up this election was Republicans talking about these issues of fraud, which were not true. He praised uh, the other uh, 
uh, his, his, the Secretary of State and, and um, uh, the, uh, uh, Brad Raffensperger uh, and, and Governor Kemp. And he also went on uh, to essentially open the door for the pivot. He explicitly said, let's talk about a pivot. He is an ambitious man. He's a talented young politician. He clearly thinks of himself as a rising politician in Georgia, and he is moving away from Donald Trump. And I, I, I've asked him specifically about that, about that call. He says, I believe in law enforcement. I'm not, I'm not a, a lawyer, but I believe in law enforcement. Uh, that's the kind of thing that most Republicans have been terrified even to whisper. Uh, with Donald Trump in the White House. This is a guy who looks to the future for himself and for his, for his cause and his state, and I think he's seeing a future post-Trump in part because of that call. Terry, we're going to pick up on that call now with Sarah Fagan. You also wanted to play. What's your thought as far as the role uh, of that call on this election and also the Republican Party at large? Well, I think it was really inappropriate, uh, the call, and I'm glad that the Secretary of State and the Governor and others have pushed back on it. I believe it deserves to be pushed back. I think that, you know, the President doesn't put any strategy into how he approaches these politics, and sometimes that has really benefited him. He's, he's done some amazing policy things because he doesn't know what he doesn't know, and the Abraham Accords and tax policy, but here in a political race? Man, it's really a problem. And I, you know, I look at this race and I think there's, there'll be a lot of factors as to why uh, candidates win or lose, but, but he is going to be the biggest factor. And if our candidates, Republican candidates, lose cl a close election, all of the sowing he has done and the distrust will undoubtedly, in my mind, be the biggest factor. Yvette, you wanted to play with this as well. What's your thought as far as the, the implications of the call? You know, I think when we think about all the things that Donald Trump has done to erode Americans' confidence in democracy, and there's a long list, this just tops the cake. I mean, when we think about all the controversy around the Ukraine scandal and did he do it and what did he mean and whether it was intentional or not, there's definitely no question um, that he was asking an elected official, a member of his party, uh, to swing the election in his favor. And I think when we think about the fact that Americans already have such little faith in government, particularly over the last four years, what this does to make people, and what we've got to do as a country, I think, to restore people's faith in democracy is the work that I think starts on January 20th at 1201 is, you know, the, the checks and balances, the fact that next time we might get a Donald Trump that's not so clumsy and not so obvious. And how do we make sure that we guard against that going forward? But I got to tell you, even though I'm someone who always is never, never surprised about Donald Trump, this surprised me. This was really overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly shocking. And anyone who listened to that, who didn't see clear criminal activity, I think wasn't listening close enough. Yvette, thanks so much. I want to switch gears here for a moment and bring in L.Z. Granderson, special contributor, also a columnist for the L.A. Times. Now, you have said, and you're taking us back to the back, back story a few years, that we might not be in this predicament had Stacey Abrams actually won and become governor of Georgia. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, considering how much credit she's gotten, uh, and deservedly so, for helping to flip Georgia for Joe Biden, remember, if she was governor at the time, she would be consumed with trying to manage a COVID crisis in her state. If she was governor at the time, she probably would not have been organizing to get African Americans to vote the way that she did over the last two years. So in a lot of ways, the corruption that preceded this election actually kind of created the scenario that we have here today. But, you know, one of the other things I think that's really fascinating about what Stacey um, Abrams has been able to do is that she has really challenged this notion that the South is still the South, which is a phrase a lot of us, particularly who are black, to talk about about the South. That yes, there are hubs, urban hubs like in Atlanta, but you go a little bit further outside of Atlanta and it's still the deep South. What she has illuminated for the entire country is that outside of Atlanta is a booming multi-generational, multi-racial voting block that is ready and mobilized. And they may actually inspire other cities around the country to look to see if they too have these untapped sources of voting blocks outside of their major urban hubs. Um, it's a fascinating sort of development, but I firmly believe that if Stacey Abrams was Governor Abrams, um, Georgia may have gone to Trump. 
Heidi Hegkamp, I'd like to bring that same question to you. Do you agree with LZ? And many people talk about the Stacey Abrams effect. Uh, perhaps it has dual meanings. Well, I've known Stacy since she was a junior in college. She is incredibly talented and can uh, chew gum and do a lot of things all at the same time. And so I think that um, she's a force to be reckoned with. But I want to weigh in a little bit on the side of Chris Christie on what all of this means. One thing that Stacy did, and if you watched her interviews, if you watched the interviews of the Democrats, they had message discipline. They did not make this about Donald Trump. They made it about Loeffler and, and Purdue. They made it about insider trading. They made it about COVID and the lack of getting COVID relief. She knew what she was doing and they knew what they were doing. This was very disciplined and I think that's why this race is close because they ran against those two candidates and did not run against Donald Trump. Heidi Heitkamp, thanks so much. Tom, we'll send it back to you. Yeah, I want to bring in Amanda Renteria. She worked with Hillary Clinton during that campaign in 2016. She knows how hard it is to get voters out in Georgia. And, um, you know, the race changed so much from 2016 to 2020. Joe Biden really overperformed from Hillary Clinton. It was plus 150,000 in Atlanta and the suburbs. It was plus 180,000. And still the race was so close, 11,000 votes, but it went to Joe Biden. As we look at the race tonight, I want to check in on the boards right now to see where we're at, where the race stands because we have had a lot, a lot of vote come in over the last 10 minutes. 77% of the expected vote in. Senator Purdue is up plus 43,000. As we look at the second race, Senator Leffler is up as well, plus 24,000. As you look at the numbers, and there's still Atlanta, the, the suburbs, there's still a lot of vote out there. Are the trend lines now worrying you or are they still encouraging Democrats at this point? Well, I, I think you don't want to see uh, getting behind in this way, of course. On the other hand, I got to tell you, from 2016 to now, so much has changed. Not only has it been easier to vote in all the court cases that Stacey Abrams won after 2018 and then and changed the policies in order for people to vote, but secondly, I just want to say, seeing a woman of color, a black woman, win st or run statewide, begin to play a leadership role nationally has huge implications for for what happens down ballots, for the kind of leaders you you engage and you inspire. And you did see that in this last election. The first uh, Latina actually won a county seat um, in Georgia. Those kinds of things, no matter what happens in this election, will continue to matter, not only because people see themselves, but also building upon the momentum of even having this conversation tonight that we are this close. We'll see what happens. But this isn't ending. This is just the beginning of the future that Stacey Abrams started, but certainly it carries on with all the grassroots and the people she has now engaged. Okay, Amanda, thank you for that. With 75% of the expected voting, I want to bring in Steve Osinsami, our man in Atlanta, and Matt Dowd as well, our chief political analyst. I want to get both their opinions on what we're seeing so far. So, Steve-O, I'm going to start with you. A lot of the votes still out in the Atlanta metro region, but we have both Republicans on top. Still a very close race. What is standing out for you at this hour? Well, I'll say first that the vote is coming in a lot faster than what we're used to here in Georgia. For example, Fulton County, with that much of the vote in, I think uh, uh, is, is, is really atypical. We're used to seeing Fulton come in late, so we're used to seeing all of those blue votes coming in later. Um, I haven't seen the exact percentages of the counties that were still out, but I would say keep an eye on Clayton County, which is a, a, a very large and blue county. Keep an eye out on DeKalb County, see how much DeKalb County's vote is in the next time you look at the map. Uh, also, Gwinnett and Cobb, those are where your large population centers are. Um, it is interesting that this is coming down to as tight a race um, as, as many people were predicting. It now means maybe those provisional ballots and military and overseas ballots may factor into deciding who wins this race. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a, a lot has been said about this urban and suburban versus rural divide. We are certainly seeing that here. Um, we don't know exactly how many people actually showed up to vote today. We were told that it, they were expecting about a million people to come out to vote. It could have been as low as, as 600,000, higher than a million. Um, that number, when, when all is said and done, is going to factor in to who won this. And, and I will uh, um, uh, mention something about a split ticket that, uh, that, that people have 
have, that you've been talking about for a little bit. You know, there is plenty of evidence here in elections, in the November election, that either Republicans or Democrats chose to vote for a Republican in, in one race and a Democrat in, in, in the other. And proof of that is Joe Biden's victory here. Uh, Joe Biden won the state by, what, 11,000 or so votes. Uh, but in the race between John Ossoff and David Perdue, Purdue was up, you know, a little under 100,000. Purdue was up a little under 100,000 votes, which says that some people switch parties and, and, and voted for one person for president of one party and a person for Senate in another. So that indeed does happen. And by the numbers that we're seeing now, looks like it's probably happening here again. Steve-O, we thank you for your reporting out of Atlanta. I want to go to Matt Dowd. Now, Matt, we, we hit you at the top of the broadcast. You said the trend lines were encouraging for Democrats. Steve-O mentioned some of those, you know, counties around Atlanta that, that the vote is still out. But some of them, the vote is, is coming in, and, and, and a lot of them, you know, we almost have all the vote in. I'm looking at the rural counties, and both Republicans are performing either at where President Trump was or slightly better in those rural counties. At this hour, with 78 percent of the vote in, tell me what you're seeing, Matt. I still think all the indicators are that, that favor the Dems in this race. And it's not what the number is total right now. It's what's remaining. And then when you add to it, it's I always do this. Keep in mind that in 2020, Joe Biden had an early lead. Then Donald Trump took a big lead. And then as the remaining 25 percent of the vote, 20 percent of the vote came in, Joe Biden took a lead. That's what I think is going to happen in this race. Let me give you a couple of facts. First, the majority of the votes remaining to be counted are early votes. Our early votes are people that cast votes in person or by mail. So that's what remains. And the majority of the votes that were cast on Election Day that remain to be counted are in the Atlanta suburbs. DeKalb County alone, the remaining votes in DeKalb County alone that haven't been added to the mix yet, will give both, de both Democratic candidates a net 80,000 margin just out of DeKalb that's remaining to be counted that will be added to the mix. So to me, if you're a Democrat, and I know they see these numbers overall slightly behind, which is why every time I'm in a room in a campaign, I tell people, don't just look at what the overall numbers, look at what remains. And right now, I mean, obviously, this is a close race, a point or so on each side of it, and we'll see what remains. But all of the remaining vote looks much more favorable to the Democrats than it does to the Republicans. Matt, are you the guy in the campaign room with a calculator, or are you just doing, you're doing this in your head? Uh, well, I learned to do it in my head. I did have a calculator, but I learned to do it in my head. And, I, and it's, it's just a pattern that you fo follow in all of these things. And as people watch the overall numbers, I looked at, like, already while we were not, while I wasn't on, I looked at whole counties that had come in. And one of the things you mentioned, Tom, this is why the Republicans are, are going to end up being behind when that DeKalb vote comes in. Um, is that even where they're matching Donald Trump, the percent of total vote is under 90 percent of what it was in November. And where the Democrats are exceeding them in the blue areas, their vote is above 90 percent of what it was in November. So even where Republicans are matching, they're not matching on a total net vote. They're matching on a percentage, but not total net vote. And Democrats are exceeding the turnout of Republicans in the red counties from the blue counties from November. So look at what's remaining. It's still a lot of early vote and still a lot of absentee by mail that's out there. And as I said, the remaining, the remaining election day votes, the majority of the remaining election day votes are in the suburban. They're in DeKalb, Gwinnett, Cobb. Those are the remaining, the majority of the remaining election day votes. So if I were the Dems, I know they get nervous and they run around like cats in a rocker factory, that, th that they should feel pretty good. It's going to be a close race. It'll be a point or so. But they should feel pretty good right now at this point in the evening. All right, Matt Dowd, we, uh, we love you for your brain and for your sayings and your analysis. We appreciate it all. I want to go to Nate Silver, a man who doesn't need a calculator. Nate, so we're seeing Republicans on top right now with 20 percent of the votes still out, 22 percent. Uh, Senator Purdue looks to be growing his lead, 62 percent, 62,000, excuse me. Leffler with 36,000 uh, ahead of Warnock. But do you agree with Matt Dow that there's still a lot of Dem vote out there, a lot of the, those blue counties? There's so much of that vote out there that, that Democrats could come out on top? 
Yeah, for sure. In fact, that's the probability at this point. Um, as Matt mentioned, DeKalb County, we probably have about a 100,000 vote shift there alone when these early uh, election votes are, 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 are counted for in DeKalb County. Um, the rest of it beyond DeKalb is also fairly blue. So if you go to betting markets, they have Warnock as about a 95% favorite and Ossoff about 85%. So people putting money on the line are looking at where the vote is, and the math is actually not that hard here because we know how blue Atlanta is. We know roughly how many votes there are. It's going to be close especially in an Ossoff race. I would not count on anything, but, like, but you know, that's who you'd favor at this point, for sure. Okay, Nate Silver for us. We're going to take a quick break. Things are changing pretty fast in this race, so stick with us. On the other side of this break, we're going to break down all the numbers and talk about some issues we haven't touched upon just yet. Stay with us. can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now. When it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. And welcome to our continuing coverage of the Georgia runoff Senate races. This is where the race stands at this hour right now. With 79% of the expected vote in, you can see Senator David Perdue, the incumbent, plus 58,000 vo votes at this hour. Senator Leffler, plus 32,000 votes at this hour. Again, 80% of the expected vote in. But this race is far from over. We're going to explain to you why as we come over here to the map of Georgia. So as we've been telling you all night, a majority of the votes in the state of Georgia are going to be coming from Atlanta 
and the metro region. This is the most important part of the state when it comes to garnering votes. And when we go into one of these counties, a place like Gwinnett County, you can see there's 89% of the expected vote in. Ossoff is on top here. But if you start adding up all the percentages that are out, DeKalb County, one of the largest counties in the state of Georgia, only 37% of the vote in. In other places like Cobb County, 55% of the vote in. You can see the Democrats are on top here, but there's still so much of the vote that needs to come in from the Atlanta metro region. And that's why Democrats still feel like they have a chance here. I want to bring in both Rick Klein and Mary Alice Parks. They make up our team of political directors here at ABC News. Rick, I know you have some new reporting from the Secretary of State of Georgia. What is he saying tonight? Yeah, the Secretary of State's office has just updated reporters and said that the biggest outstanding votes are exactly where you were just pointing at in those Atlanta suburbs. Those are heavily Democratic parts of the Atlanta suburbs. And the point that they are making is that the, the remaining vote is big batches of Democratic votes and smaller batches scattered around the state of Republican votes. We're seeing record turnout, huge numbers, including many on Election Day. That actually, in some cases, appears to be favoring Democrats as well as Republicans. Now, Mary Alice, I want to bring you in on this point. So when we look at the amount of early vote, we can see Democrats are on top. We have 86 percent of the early vote in. But you were telling me just before the break, this is a little misleading because there's still some of the early vote and provisional ballots that are coming in up through Friday. Right. Democrats worked really hard to make it easier for folks to vote by mail. You could turn in an absentee ballot as late as today. So that term early vote is a little bit misleading because you could have an absentee ballot, not a traditional ballot that was just dropped off today for someone that that waited to turn it in, that didn't trust the mail. And remember, if this if this race is really, really close, uh, mi uh, military ballots, ballots coming in from overseas can arrive as late as Friday. People that had issues with their absentee ballot, maybe a signature match issue. They can cure their ballots as late as Friday. So if this gets really close, we could still be in for a long haul. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot for both of you. Do you guys see a scenario at this point where we go to a Friday where it's going to take a few days to figure out who wins in Georgia, similar to what we saw in November when it was the presidential race and Joe Biden was up against Donald Trump and it was so tight? I, I think it depends on two factors, Tom. One is going to be how, how quickly these places report in and then what the ultimate margin is. And that's really all you're looking at. You know that the early votes favor the Democrats. We're going to get that coming in over the next couple of days. I think there's some X factors that if it's, if it's close enough, where it seems to be right now, it's just going to take a while. All that's going to matter is that margin. Yeah, somewhere like Cobb County, like you were just saying, we need more vote from there to really understand. If the margins as they are right now hold, that's really good for Democrats and they could wrap this up actually quickly if uh, we get another big drop from Cobb County. But if it starts to narrow somewhere like that, then we could be in for a few days. Okay, guys, thanks so much, Lindsay. I'm going to kick it back over to you. All right, let's bring back Terry Moran. And, and Terry, you know, going into this night, people said that this race was going to be neck and neck, that it would be a statistical dead heat. And these races are really coming off as advertised. With the races being so close, with them being so tight, what are the necessary next steps to make sure that we can verify and validate? Well, that's a great question. I assume that they are being taken right now. In fact, uh, Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger were, tried to reassure voters knowing that this kind of election was going to play out very close with some of those big population centers, which trend Democratic, bringing their vote, uh, dropping their vote uh, totals in as they tabulate. That'll be later given the size of that vote and giving Democrats an edge there. That will lead to distrust. Look, a lot of voters have been told uh, that they can't trust the election results. So what have they done? Well, they put monitors and cameras in there. They've, they've made sure that the observers are in and that, and that they have the appropriate oversight of the counting itself. None of that is likely to help if Republicans follow in the footsteps of Donald Trump and without any facts that stood up in court, scores of court courts uh, allege that those Democratic counties fixed the vote. That is unlikely uh, to have happened, uh, obviously given the security around it, but what Georgia needs to do, and frankly what we in the media need to do, is report on the kind of security around this count. I've covered elections in other countries uh, where the military counts the ballots, and the military is run by a strong man. I've, I've seen that. Uh, you can't trust that count. In our country, the votes are counted by your neighbors. Uh, and they are overseen uh, by other of your neighbors. And the decentralization of the American election system, uh, the way that local officials are responsible for it, they're proud of that responsibility, they take it very seriously, as we've seen in Georgia, has probably helped save the democracy from what was an anti-democratic assault from the White House. But tonight, they'll have to make that case again. 
Terry Moran, thanks so much. We'll give the final word to T.J. Holmes. And T.J., earlier tonight we heard from Chris Christie, and he called uh, Biden and uh, Trump just background music. And, and earlier you and I were talking about the literal music, the rappers who have gotten involved with the Get Out the Vote effort. We talked about the young generation, the Rayshard Brooks, the Stacey Abrams, and how all of this is coalescing to really uh, culminate in this, producing this one moment. Uh, and it's happening in Atlanta. How appropriate is it? And that's what I can't help but think about. It's happening in Atlanta. Rayshard Brooks' funeral was last summer at Ebenezer Baptist Church. A month later, in that same Ebenezer Baptist Church, was the funeral of Congressman John Lewis. Two different men from two different generations who still suffered at the hands of police um, for different reasons in different places, but still representing the struggle of their times in a lot of ways. And not too far from Ebenezer Baptist Church, still in downtown Atlanta, is a place that a lot of people may have heard of, iconic, Magic City, where two rappers sat in a strip club and had a rap battle. But before they battled, they had a video message from Stacey Abrams that played, that was seen by millions of young people who tuned in to watch that rap battle. All of those things come together in a way that only it can in a place like Atlanta, that has led the way for years and years and years now when it comes to black planning, black struggle, black protest, black hope, and representing the black struggle, but also the black hope for what can be. And so I look at Atlanta now and once again, and I see this work that Stacey Abrams have done to get black voters involved, the work that, yes, the rappers have done down there to get black, young black men and women involved in the process to show that, no, this system was not set up for you. That's why it doesn't work for you. But you can't sit on the sidelines and expect that system all of a sudden to start working for you. That message seems to be getting through to some young people and all of these things are kind of coming together in a place like Atlanta, which has led the way for change in this country, Lindsay, for so long. And we might be seeing it, maybe not tonight, but somewhere in the near future, Atlanta is still going to, in a lot of ways, be leading the way for some type of change and an example for this country. And you brought up John Lewis. This all really all comes full circle because John Ossoff was just 16 years old when he wrote to the congressman that he would like to volunteer. And here we are 17 years later, that full circle moment. Tom. All right, Lindsay, we thank you for that. And as we say goodbye for right now, we want to just check in with the race where it's at right now. We do have 80% of the vote just coming in. Both Republicans on top, Senator Perdue with plus 69,000 votes at this hour, Senator Leffler with plus 43,000, but Democrats are poised to be in very good positions as more of the votes come in from those blue counties around Atlanta. So much is happening in this race. It's changing every minute. We are going to continue our coverage with our powerhouse station, WSB in Atlanta. And we are not going anywhere. We'll be right back here at 1030 on the East Coast with George Stephanopoulos. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. Hi, I'm Justin Farmer. Results coming in by the minute, so let's take you there. Showing you the latest numbers that we have as we're just a few seconds past 10 o'clock now. Yes, taking a look right here, U.S. Senate, 61%, some absentees outstanding. We have 50.9% for David Perdue leading John Ossoff, who has 49%. As you'd imagine, you're going to have very close as it's uh, Kelly Leffler against Raphael Warnock. And right now they're separated by just a few thousand votes. And uh, this is going to probably stay quite close for some time. Though our political analyst believes that the way the votes are being counted, uh, in terms of what Metro County votes are still outstanding, according to Bill Crane, our political analyst, lean Democratic at this point in his view. We are covering every angle of these U.S. Senate runoffs. We have reporters and photographers live as the results come in tonight. Our live Team 2 coverage starts with Channel 2's Dave Huddleston. He's live in Buckhead. That's where the Republicans are having their watch party tonight. Dave. <laughs> okay, thank and you. And Vita, the Senator David Perdue supporters are feeling good right now, now that he has taken the early lead in this race. But they do say it is going to be a long night, and it may not be called this evening. Now, earlier, the senator's cousin, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture and former Governor Sonny Perdue, spoke and said, we are in this fight for the long haul. We're not ready to surrender, are we? And I don't think we will. We're encouraged by the early returns, and I think we're on track to have a good evening. 
Hopefully we can get it done earlier so we can truly celebrate here together as a, as a good family of people who love one another. And we are still hoping to hear from Senator David Perdue before the evening is over. Reporting live from Buckhead, Dave Huddleston, Channel 2 Action News. Dave, appreciate that. Now, Channel 2's Richard Elliott continuing our live Team 2 coverage also in Buckhead, but with Republican Kelly Leffler's campaign. Richard. Yeah, we are in the same uh, ballroom at the Grand Hyatt. Uh, it is a shared watch party like it was a shared campaign. We do expect to hear from Senator Kelly Leffler. She will make an appearance here tonight to address this crowd. You can see the large crowd here. Actually, as the night has gone on, we've seen fewer and fewer masks being worn here. Leffler has become one of President Trump's staunchest allies, said earlier she would be one of the U.S. senators to object to the Electoral College. Georgia GOP Chair David Schaefer once again brought up tonight the issue of election security, even though so far there's been no evidence of any massive voter fraud. They brought in some 8,000 volunteers, many of them from out of state, to act as poll watchers and to watch the ballots being counted. We will have eyes on every part of this process, and we are doing everything in our power to restore the confidence of the people and the integrity of our elections. And again, there have been uh, three recounts and uh, no evidence so far of any massive voter fraud during the presidential election. We do expect to hear from Senator Leffler. That should happen later tonight. We're live in Buckhead, Richard Elliott, Channel 2 Action News. Now the two Democrats, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff, both hoping to get enough votes to send them to Washington, D.C. Channel 2's anchor Sophia Choi continues our live Team 2 coverage now in Northeast Atlanta at Ebenezer Baptist Church tonight. Sophia. Jovita, we spent our day speaking with voters here in the Sweet Auburn District where Warnoff is a senior pastor right there at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Now he spent his day talking with voters uh, at campaign sites like this one and on this campaign bus. He stopped at this rally in Cobb County to speak with members of a local labor union. Everyone at this event had to wear a mask and because of the pandemic, Warnock will not hold a traditional campaign party tonight. Instead, he plans to make up virtual statements and as soon as he does make one, we'll bring that to you for now. We're live in Northeast Atlanta. Sophia Choi, Channel 2 Action News. Sophia, thank you from Northeast Atlanta now. Channel 2 anchor Lori Wilson continues our live Team 2 coverage in Cobb County, and you were able to speak with John Ossoff, Lori. Yeah, Justin, I spoke with John Ossoff earlier today, one-on-one, -on -one, and asked him how he was feeling after such a hard-fought campaign. Uh, you know, he said he felt encouraged by the early voter turnout as he continued to campaign today and speak with voters and reporters. He said the stakes are so high right now. This election is not just about two Senate seats. It's about giving President-elect Joe Biden the ability to get things done for the American people. The United States Senate right now is blocking $2,000 relief checks for the people that President-elect Biden and President Trump and I and Reverend Warnock support. That's why yesterday I spoke with Joe Biden about those $2,000 checks. We're ready to get those moving immediately. Ossoff saying earlier today he felt very confident. Now, I was in touch with the Ossoff campaign just to, uh, within the last half hour. They said as of right now, Ossoff has no plans on addressing supporters tonight because, quote, there's still a long way to go. Live in Cobb County, Lori Wilson, Channel 2 Action News. All right, Lori, thank you. Let's go ahead and take a look at the races. Your voice, your vote. Let's go ahead and do this first. Take a look. This is 71% of the precincts reporting. That's that number right up here. We have 48.9 to 51.1, David Perdue in the lead. I'm going to click over to the Warnock Leffler race. Take a look. The other Republican also in the lead 50.7 for Leffler, 49.3 for Raphael Warnock. Let's go ahead and bring in our political analyst, Bill Crane. Bill, most of the metro counties still counting DeKalb. This is the DeKalb County story right here. I'm going to click this. I preset this. We have DeKalb County highlighted here for Ossoff and Purdue, and DeKalb County highlighted here for Warnock and Leffler. We have 82%, 83% for the Democrats, around 17, 16 for the Republicans. They're at like 0% reporting. What are we going to see in DeKalb and the other metro counties? Well, 0% of the early vote in Fulton County and DeKalb County, which together is about 700,000 votes, has yet to be reported. Some of the absentee is in, and some of the election day reporting at the precinct level is in. But none of those two big blocks of, abs of uh, early votes in either of those counties are in yet. In addition, there were about 300,000 absentee ballots 
that hadn't been received in yet that have until 7 p.m. on Election Day. And all of those early voting absentee lockboxes won't even be cleared out until tomorrow morning. And again, in those metro counties, they were all full on November the 3rd. We would expect they would be pretty full again tomorrow. Those ballots yet to be tabulated in counties that are going for the Democrats more than 70 percent. One minor footnote, Bubba McDonald, the Public Service Commission Republican candidate right now, has more votes than both John Ossoff and, and uh, David Perdue in the statewide contest. Interesting factoid there. So again, you're saying that there's hundreds of thousands of votes out there still that we have not seen on these maps that are coming from the metro area that will most likely be blue. Now, question, 124 of the 159 counties are done counting. Yeah, those, those, yeah, smaller, the outside counties, right? A lot of those rural I, counties. I, you know, we'll know tomorrow for sure. And, and like I was telling you earlier, I can read charts and I can read maps. The Republican Party will carry about 140 to 145 counties. It's just not the counties where most of the votes are. Because, as we said, the counties where most of the votes are, we have the Black Belt here, a lot of black settlements decades ago. They stayed. This is that blue area we see here when looking at the Ossoff and Purdue race. This is the metro area, also blue. But we're talking hundreds of thousands of votes for both Ossoff and Purdue and also in this race with Warnock and Leffler. That's where these votes are coming from. When are we going to see these votes? Well, um, typically we don't see these larger metro counties or even Savannah and some of the secondary population centers till between 10 and 11 p.m. We are seeing more because the ballot only has three races on it. But we haven't seen all of Chatham yet. We haven't seen all of Augusta Richmond County yet. We haven't seen all of Macon and Bibb County yet. So those larger population centers and the nine county core metro aren't in yet. If uh, things are not looking different by 11 o'clock, then we may have a long night. But I would say between 11 and 11.30, we're gonna see large blocks of votes, which are the early advanced voting in DeKalb and Fulton, and then more returns from those secondary population centers and everything I'm hearing talking to those local election superintendents, those numbers are not close and those margins are not close and that will start to show up in the statewide tallies. I have one analysis that we can for the first time tonight at 10.09 do apples to apples when using the big board. Take a look. I've highlighted Rockdale County that is east of the metro, part of the metro area, blue community, suburb of DeKalb. Take a look. This is right now 100% in. First county, big county, 100% in. 72% for Ossoff, 27.6% for Purdue. Now wait, I'm going to go to 2020 with these same guys highlighting Rockdale again. 69% to 28%. So when you go and see the difference, you see pretty much the same thing. What does this mean from the difference from November to now? We're only talking about the difference of eight weeks. So you don't see a lot of change in voting patterns. That's why we keep talking about turnout elections. It's who's energized, who identifies their votes, who gets them back to the polls. And in the examples you've shown, the Democrats are a little bit higher, the Republicans are a little bit lower. That makes a wider gap. And you're going to see that play out. Rockdale County is, has been a democratically controlled county for a little bit more than 12 years, started with their county commission as that county became majority minority. And now all of the office holders, the sheriff, the school board, are all African American. And those shifts in demographics have been starting to across basically from southeast or middle part of the east across the, you know, through Gwinnett County right. over into Cobb County. And that kind of outside 285 next circle of counties is where the Republican Party has to start at, at a future date recapturing voters or they will no longer be the majority party in Georgia. And again, talking about Warnock and Leffler again, highlighting Rockdale for 2021 right now with 100 percent in 72 for 27, something you expect to see. Bill Crane, we will check back with you a little bit later. Jovita. George. Thank you, George and Bill. Happening now, let's take a look. This is a nine camera live look inside of the Fulton County ballot counting process right now. The county is live streaming this on YouTube. So you at home, uh, anyone who wants to stare at their screen for a couple of hours, you can do this as well and take a look at the process that's happening. And if you look in the bottom middle box there, like right at uh, 630, that's Channel 2's Audrey Washington there in the yellow. She continues our live Team 2 coverage now at the World Congress Center in downtown Atlanta. Again, that's where Fulton County's election workers are counting ballots tonight. Audrey. Yes, and I just got briefed by Fulton County election officials just about an hour ago, and they told me they are still counting those absentee and mail-in ballots. I'm going to step out of the shot so I can give you a live look at what it looks like inside here at this hour. We are live inside the Georgia World Congress Center here in downtown Atlanta. You can see election workers checking those ballots and getting them scanned. Now, Fulton County election officials told us about 270,000 people voted early in Fulton County. 
and that doesn't include the absentee ballot drop boxes. Here's more from Fulton County election officials. We should be able to process almost all, if not all ballots tonight. And we are uploading, uh, we will be uploading early voting results uh, shortly. We will continue working tonight until uh, probably around 2 a.m. Yeah, so you heard that correctly, 2 a.m. Uh, Fulton County officials say if not by 2 a.m., they should finish up by 9 tomorrow morning. Now, it's important to note that earlier uh, today, there was a, a bit of drama that happened here behind me. There was an election worker who notified officials here that someone, one of the observers, had a camera. So what happened was, of course, that is not allowed for observers to take pictures. So one of the officials came over here. They checked that observer. They told me they did not find a camera on that observer. So everything went back to normal. As you can see, the counting continuing. And we are live here in downtown Atlanta. Audrey Washington, Channel 2 Action News. Audrey, thank you. And that's a perfect example right there, that shot we saw of Audrey. We saw people counting votes in that county. Bill Crane talked about the data dump that's going to come from large counties like where Audrey was. So we're going to be seeing that in the next few minutes, in the next hour. We will be here to watch it all. So at 10-13, in 2020, Georgia became a blue state for the first time in 28 years when it comes to the presidential race. The flip is historic. Many say the result is a rise in naturalized voters and a growing Latino electorate. Channel 2 anchor Wendy Corona learned the collaborative effort among minority groups is becoming a force in Georgia. We just finished knocking on 67 doors. 2020 has been a busy year for Monica Cruz and Jasmine Trejo. They canvass neighborhoods with Latino voters daily, ensuring those who can vote make a plan and do it. It feels great to see that we have a lot of younger Latinos who are really trying to go vote, and not only that, helping their parents go vote. Latinos now make up about 10% of the state's population. For 17 years, Galeo has worked to promote civic engagement and leadership development in the Latino community, and its efforts are working. The Latinos in Georgia uh, that are registered to vote are showing up to vote and are really participating in our democracy. In 2003, there were only 10,000 registered Latino voters in Georgia. Now it's estimated to be well over 250,000 with the majority of the Latino electorate being millennial. So that means that the uh, power of the Latino electorate is only going to continue to grow because the average age of a Georgia voter is much older than that. One in 10 Georgia voters are naturalized citizens. And at naturalization ceremonies across the state, groups like Galeo reach new citizens in the moment. They register them to vote on the same day they become U.S. citizens. This ensures their first step in the process. I wouldn't have been able to become a voting, active, naturalized citizen had it not been from community organizations that have been doing this work. And now as executive director of the Latino Community Fund, Gigi Pedraza is among a team of volunteers who help voters at the polls with translation and guidance for many first-time voters not familiar with the process. Of Georgia's 159 counties, only DeKalb has voluntarily made sample ballots available in Spanish and Korean. Gwinnett County was federally mandated to offer ballots in Spanish due to the Voting Rights Act. We think after the next uh, census, uh, we're going to see other counties and jurisdictions have to comply with the Voting Rights Act and provide English and Spanish and possibly other languages as well as for, for voting rights. In a candidate forum hosted by WSB's own Condis Presley, Representative Brenda Lopez Romero noted the margin of victory is shrinking and look who's leading the way. Of the Latinos that voted, 75% of those were Latinas, were women. And women are also leading the charge to get out the vote, even if they can't vote themselves like canvasser Monica Cruz, a DACA recipient. Sometimes it gets emotional for me because I'm out here um, basically asking them to be my voice and to be the voice of all of us who can't do it. It's a plea that gets even the unmotivated voter thinking. I like to ask, do you know or care about anyone who is a resident? Um, or someone who might be undocumented. And if your answer is yes, your ballot should reflect that. 
Years of work from a collaborative effort by numerous minority groups in Georgia have harnessed their potential, committed to vote, and now flex their power at the polls. In DeKalb County, Wendy Corona, Channel 2 Action News. And we continue our special report and your voice, your vote. Take a look at your screen right here. This is the results right now. When you take a look at the map and walk over, we can go ahead and unselect that. You can have the entire state of Georgia right here, 49% for Raphael Warnock, 50.9% for Kelly Leffler. And we click this on right here. Take a look at the other race we're looking at, 72.4% for John Ossoff, 26.6%. Uh, sorry, when I click on the entire state, it's 48.7% and 51.3. I had one county highlighted. 72% of the precincts reporting. Let's go ahead and toss to Justin Gray. Justin Gray has been following the Secretary of State's office at this point. And Justin, you have rare insight into what's going on in there. You actually have the Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, right now. Yeah, we, George, we got the Secretary of the State pulled him out of the command center here, and you're telling me that big batch of votes that everyone's wondering about, those early votes from DeKalb, you expect those to be coming very soon. They should be here before 30 minutes, so uh, that'll make a big, you know, give us a good indication where we're going with this race. Our and, race is. yeah, as you say, that's the largest group of votes still yeah. outstanding. Yeah, one of the largest groups out there, and it's obviously going to be a bellwether, but... Uh, it's uh, interesting watching how it all's turning out. Uh, obviously, everyone loves Bubba right now. Yeah, you're alluding to the Public Service Commission race where he's running stronger than either of the Republican Senate candidates. Yeah, well, Bubba's just a great person, and he's been around for a while, and people really value what he's done for, on the PSC Commission, obviously. Do you think there's anything else going on there? No, I just think that uh, everyone loves Bubba, and that's a great thing. I'm sure he's feeling really good right now, and we'll just see how this all shakes out. The secretary has a mask. There might be a smile underneath that mask there, I think. Um, talk about how quickly these results seem to be coming in. This is much faster than we've seen in either the general or the primary. Yes. Well, that's really because we told the counties with a new SEB rule that you had to go ahead and scan those ballots one week and one day before. And so they are up to speed, and that's why we're not having this big delay. So we're going to get some results a whole lot quicker than we did in the November race. And you were always saying wait till tomorrow, but do you think we might have a final answer here? If not final, a good idea where we're heading tonight? Well, I know that some people are already making projections about some of the races, but uh, we're not there yet. But obviously, you know, they'll be working fairly late tonight, so we'll see where it really leads, leads us, and definitely by tomorrow. Secretary Raffensperger, thank you. Again, the big news here from the Secretary, that cache of outstanding DeKalb votes, those early votes in DeKalb, a very large number. We expect those down here in a matter of minutes. Reporting live at the Command Center, Justin Gray, Channel 2 Action News. Justin, thank you. Now, of course, we all know about the Senate races. There is one other race on the ballot that could affect how much you pay for your power bills at home. It's the runoff for Public Service Commission District 4. It is between the incumbent Republican Lauren Bubba McDonald, you just heard Raffensperger refer to him, and the Democrat Daniel Blackman. As you see right now, almost done here. 80% of the ballots uh, counted. Of course, absentee ballots across the state also being counted right now. And McDonald has nearly 52% of the vote. His challenger with 48% of the vote. Now, the PSC is important. It regulates utility services across the state, which also sets our rates for Georgia Power and Atlanta Gas Light. So it really does matter what you do in terms of deciding on a public service commissioner because those members of the PSC are the ones who completely control what you pay for power and other utilities. So you heard it there from Clark. Now, PSC commissioners serve six-year terms. All of the seats on the commission right now held by Republicans. Well, as we watch this evening's results coming in, remember, you can see them at the bottom of your screens. How did we get here? You may be wondering why Georgia even has this kind of runoff system. Channel 2 investigative reporter Richard Belcher now with us live to look at a law here. Maybe you don't know some of its history. It's quite fascinating how it works both ways. Richard. Yeah, after a Republican uh, surprised everyone and nearly won the governor's race in Georgia in 1966, Democrats who dominated the legislature quickly passed a law that said that in statewide races to win, you had to have a clear majority, 50% plus one or there would be a general election runoff, which is what we have this year. In fact, we've got a couple of them. Republican incumbent David Perdue got 88,000 votes more than Democrat John Ossoff November 3rd, but he did not get a majority. Without the requirement that the winner get 
50% plus one. We're the only state that does it quite like this. The law backfired on Georgia Democrats in 1992. Incumbent U.S. Senator Weich Fowler got more votes than his Republican opponent, but not a clear majority. Political analyst Bill Crane says even Fowler didn't initially appreciate that he faced a runoff, which he ultimately lost. He got 49% of the vote and had been declared the victor by all three major news networks and cable news network. He thought he'd won re-election, only to find that that law also applied to Senate contest. Incumbent Republican Senator Saxby Shambliss was forced into a runoff in 2008, but he held on to the seat three weeks later. It's a different landscape in this year's Purdue Ossoff runoff. A federal court ruling requires that Georgia now wait nine weeks before voting again. Crane suspects that will reduce what had been a Republican advantage in late runoffs. Crane also notes that the Democrats in the General Assembly in 1967 clearly thought that they were doing uh, something that would benefit their fellow Democrats who were running statewide. It hasn't happened so far, but perhaps 54 years later, we'll see whether it does tonight or tomorrow. Live in Midtown Atlanta, Richard Belcher, Channel 2 Action News. All right, Richard, thank you. I want to play a game right now I like to call Ring Around the Metro. We're going to do it with each race. We're going to start with the Ossoff and Purdue race. We're going to go around the Metro. Metro, we know it's going to be blue. What does Purdue need to do? Let's click on Bartow County. Not enough precincts reporting, but obviously a very strong lead. Let's go to Cherokee. Almost all precincts reporting, 70%. That is a good lead for Purdue. Forsyth, 67% over 32% but only 40% of the precincts reporting. So keep following that number. You see 74, we go to Butts County, 71, we go to Spalding, we have 100% in, 59.3%. This is exactly what David Perdue needs to do, the ring around the metro, and needs to stay strong. Let's go ahead and bring in Condis Presley right now, and then we'll go to the other race. Condis, from what I just told you here, does anything surprise you at 1024 with, I don't know, about 60% of the precincts reporting? No, uh, Justin, nothing really surprised, or George, I'm sorry, George, I know you, nothing surprises me <laughs> it's at, all this, good. At, this, at this moment. What I'm thinking about, though, is the late Congressman John Lewis and what he said to us in that final essay that ran in the New York Times, where he said that the vote is the most If I owned a bank. Wow, that's a great question. If I were a bank owner, I'd give people a break. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As America fights back. GMA is there with breaking new details. With every challenge, question, concern, we'll be here for you every day. The answers you need, the information you want. We will get through this together. Right here with you on Good Morning America. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. And download the app now and sign up to get important breaking news alerts wherever you are. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This week on GMA, it's not just another New Year weight loss series. No, no, no. What if we showed you how real people just like you lost the weight they wanted, got in shape, and felt great? Join the movement, GMA's Motivation Nation, on ABC's Good Morning America. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? 
and figure out what's really out there. From inside our homes to your home, now is the time. We all just need each other. And that's why we love starting the day together with you. We'll see you in the morning on ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. COVID-19, what can you do to help protect yourself? Where can you get your questions answered? The new daily podcast from ABC News with Dr. Jennifer Ashton and a team of experts. Listen free on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Right now, at this defining moment in America, with so much on the line. From ABC News, a groundbreaking month-long event every night, taking on this moment for America. Turning Point, the nightline event. Late night on ABC. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. This is an ABC News special. Tonight, the battle for the Senate. Ossoff versus Purdue. Warnock versus Leffler. Election night, the Georgia Senate runoff. Now reporting, Chief Anchor George Stephanopoulos. Good evening. Just five days into this new year, 15 days before Donald Trump leaves office and Joe Biden takes the presidential oath, voters in Georgia tonight are determining control of the U.S. Senate and the initial course of the Biden president. Presidency. Two seats at stake. If the Democrats win both, the Senate will be split right down the middle. And the tie-breaking vote of Vice President Kamala Harris will give them majority control. If the Republicans hold on to at least one of these seats tonight, they will control the Senate, with Majority Leader Mitch McConnell the chief obstacle to Biden's agenda. Which is why both parties have fought so hard in this state that Biden won in November by less than 12,000 votes. They have spent record amounts of money. They are driving record turnout. And as we come on the air tonight, here's where things stand right now. It is very close. In that first race, Senator David Perdue, former businessman leading John Ossoff, independent filmmaker, just 33 years old. In the second race, Kelly Leffler, Republican senator, she was appointed to the seat by the governor of Georgia, leading Raphael Warnock right now, at least the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. Of course, that was Martin Luther King Jr.'s church. I want to go to Steve Osinsami, who's at the World Congress Center in Atlanta, where they are counting the votes right now. And Steve, it seems like they've been counting the votes and recounting the votes ever since November 3rd. You know, there have been so many recounts, so much attention focused on this election, so many allegations of fraud that state officials here who are who run the government, who are all Republicans and Trump supporters, have had to fight back against. You know, everyone here is looking forward to the end of this, to the end of the national spotlight. This is going to be a close race. The numbers that are coming in tonight keep jumping back and forth between the two candidates. We're still waiting for some of the larger blue counties to report some more of their vote totals in to see where this ends up. George? Let's take a deeper dive into that right now. Steve Osinsami, thanks. Tom Yamas is here with that. And Steve, as Steve just said, the numbers have been jumping around all night. Right now, Purdue and Leffler have small leads, but there's a lot of votes still left to be counted. There is, and I want to start in DeKalb County right now. And George, this is the number I want to focus in on, 42% of the expected vote in. So Ossoff is running well right now. He's running like Joe Biden did at this point. But with 42% of the vote in, there's still about 171 thousand votes still outstanding just in DeKalb County. This is one of those blue counties Steve-O was just talking about that Democrats need. That's a type of trend they like to see. Another trend they're enjoying as well when we look at some of these other counties, Henry just outside of Atlanta. Ossoff's at 63%, Joe Biden at 59.7. When we look at the other Georgia race, 
Ralph, Raphael Warnock, 63, Joe Biden, 59. Those two are almost mirroring each other. And we go to one more county here, Rockdale. You can see the Democrats at this point right now, George, are outperforming Joe Biden in some of these suburban counties around Atlanta. Two trend lines we are seeing. Senator Perdue is outperforming Senator Leffler, and Raphael Warnock is outperforming his fellow Democrat, John Ossoff. Tom Yamas, thanks very much. Let's get more on this now from Lindsey Davis. And what's driving the Democratic numbers right now, of course, black vote. You know, normally it's funny. We look at votes as they come in in terms of two colors, red and blue. But tonight it really appears to be a red, blue, and black thing. As once again, similar to November, it appears that the black vote is potentially going to be pivotal in both of these races. Uh, traditionally in Georgia, uh, the black vote decreases, the turnout decreases during the runoffs. Uh, but this year, according to the exit polls, we're actually seeing an increase in black voter turnout. According to Pew Research, when you look back at, at 2016 from that time, uh, there's actually been a 25% increase in black voter registration. That's the largest of any ethnic group. And so it really appears that for the Georgia candidate, they now have to reckon with the power of the black vote. Lindsay Davis, thanks. Nate Silver, a lot of high quality pollsters decided to sit this race out uh, coming off of the November 3rd election. As Steve Osinsami said, the numbers have been bouncing around all night. What are you seeing? What are you looking at? I see DeKalb County where it's projected that about 150,000 votes could net out toward both Democratic candidates and that would be enough for them to overtake the current GOP lead. So it really is kind of like a, a waiting game on DeKalb. So we're waiting for DeKalb County right now. As we do that, I want to go to John Carl, uh, who covers the White House, our chief White House correspondent. John, we saw uh, President Trump come in last night, but over the, so just about every day since November 3rd, he's been making these false claims about his own loss in Georgia, and that's led to recriminations within his own party. George, I've been talking to Republican leaders tonight who have been watching these returns and are frankly furious at Donald Trump. They are blaming Donald Trump right now. Both Republican candidates have a narrow lead, uh, but you have all these outstanding votes. They believe that if it weren't for Donald Trump effectively sabotaging the election for those Republican senators in Georgia, that these would have been easy victories in a solidly Republican state, uh, making the argument that these Republican senators would be a check on Joe Biden. That argument was thrown out the door by Donald Trump. Of course, you had that phone call to the Secretary of State that was leaked over the weekend where the president was trying to get him to change uh, the votes. Uh, it's led some to speculate that maybe the president wasn't all that eager to have the Republicans win these races. There are a lot of Republicans who think that the Republican, that Donald Trump did not want these Republican senators to win, that if they win, there would be one Republican, one Republican who lost in Georgia this, this cycle, and that would have been Donald Trump, and that, that he just simply did not want to see that happen. John Carl, thanks very much. I want to bring in Mary Bruce, who's been covering the Biden campaign, the Biden transition. So much at stake for the president-elect tonight. George, Joe Biden's entire agenda is at stake here. This is not just about control of the Senate, but how much Joe Biden and his administration will be able to get done going forward. Everything from getting his cabinet picks confirmed to future judicial nominations to, to the future of another round of COVID stimulus relief. All of that is at stake here. And Joe Biden and his team said they were optimistic going into this. You have to imagine that they like what they are seeing here. And if they are able, if Democrats are able to pull this off and gain control of this, the Senate, well, then Joe Biden will have a much easier time of fulfilling those campaign promises. It means that things like raising the minimum wage will be on the table. It means those $2,000 stimulus checks the Democrats have been pushing for, those would happen at a much more rapid pace. Now, if, if Republicans do maintain control of the Senate, Joe Biden has been optimistic all along that he will be able to work with Republican leader Mitch McConnell. We know they have a good relationship, but George, that is a lot easier said than done. Mary Bruce, thanks very much. We're going to take a quick break. Right now, the races are too close to call. We'll be back with our Powerhouse Roundtable in just a minute. Reality is our country can collapse from within. Why 
you see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. We are back covering these special elections, these special Senate elections in Georgia tonight. You see the board right there. These races are close right now. The Republicans, David Perdue and Kelly Leffner, right now leading John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock, but there's still votes left to come in. I want to talk about this now with our roundtable. Let me start with Rahm uh, Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel, uh, former chief of staff to Barack Obama. You know, this could be determined by about 100,000 votes either way. As someone who served as chief of staff to, an income, to a president as he started in office, those Hundred thousand votes could make all the difference for Joe Biden these first six months. Every one of those hundred thousand votes can make the difference, and you know, with the gavel comes control, George, and with control comes power. Period. That's it. Not more. And if you think about it, everything as Mary Bruce was saying, if you rather than go on bed to knee and ask Mitch McConnell, can I put a minimum wage in, and he's going to extract something. You can go to Chuck Schumer says, we're going to run the minimum wage. It's going to be $15. Here's how it's going to go. And your negotiations are different. Now, it's still a narrow path. Uh, that means nobody's allowed to get this flu, COVID, sick. Nobody can be missing for any reason. But those 50 plus one votes is a real difference to the agenda. And it means pointing forward, when you have a reconciliation on the budget about 12 months, everything the president talked about from revenue to taxes to spending to climate change, that's where you can get it done because in reconciliation you only need 50 plus one. But that he can he he's still only as strong can only be an, as ambitious as his most moderate Democratic senator. Oh, every senator thinks they're a king and they're going to be a king. There is no doubt about it. And everybody can hold something up in that effort. Now there's going to be a sense of teamwork. We have a Democratic president, and but uh, you're going to have to work from Bernie Sanders to Joe Manchin in the caucus. But I also, and I really do think this is going to be the president-elect's instinct, and he's going to not want to prove that he's not like this, which is there are a lot of Republican senators who don't want to do obstruction. They want to do legislating. It is incumbent on the White House to make them feel like they're part of something, and that allows him to play a triangulation to Mitch Connell's caucus. There's going to be about five or six, as you saw in the budget in the COVID relief bill, who want to legislate. They are tired of just no, saying no. 
This is the opportunity to give them a chance to sit at the table, roll up their sleeves, and if they can be players, a senator wants to be a player. And that's going to be incumbent on the White House, and I think Biden's team, from the chief of staff down, Steve Reschetti also is a counselor, know exactly that. Of course, the votes are still being counted, but Chris Christie, as John Carl was reporting just a moment ago, the recriminations already beginning inside the Republican Party over the prospect, perhaps, of losing these seats tonight, blaming President Trump. Does he deserve it? Well, George, I'll tell you this, you know, I think that we still have a lot to go here tonight, and I'm not ready to, um, to to declare this race over one way or the other. I've been saying all along it's very close. But remember, um, a leader of the party, one of your obligations and is to make sure um, that you do everything you can to help all the members of your party. And so if uh, the Republicans were to win tonight, the president will get a good deal of credit. If the Republicans lose tonight, very fairly, the president will deserve a good part of the blame. Um, that's what happens in politics when you're the leader of the party of the country or the leader of the party in your individual state. Um, and building on one thing that Rom said, if it were to be a 50-50 Senate, you know, he said every senator is king, and that's true, but the king of kings will be Joe Manchin. Uh, the only surviving standing Democrat in West Virginia left of any consequence is Joe Manchin. And both President-elect Biden and Chuck Schumer, if it's a 50-50 Senate, are going to have to be very careful not to put undue pressure on Joe Manchin, because quite frankly, his life would be a lot easier in West Virginia now as a Republican than a Democrat. Thank you, Chris. Of course, Mitch McConnell is still hoping he is going to be the Republican leader. I want to bring in Sarah Fagan on this. Sarah, since November 3rd, Mitch McConnell has been laser focused on winning these Senate seats in Georgia, but he's been facing rear guard actions in his own caucus, people taking up President Trump's cause against the last election, the president not helping him all that much. No, I don't think he is, particularly in this race. You know, look, in a close race, which this clearly is going to be, Every vote matters. And this noise and the call the president made to the secretary of state, these are all distractions. Think about his attacks on the governor of Georgia, a, a, a person who's done a very good job for the state, all the thousands of appointees. How many of those individuals stayed home? 100, 200? That matters, it adds up. And we've seen some reports that perhaps rural turnout is a bit depressed here. I think that's going to land squarely on the shoulders of Donald Trump. Sarah Fagan, thank you. Yvette Simpson, a uh, woman who started this all when she ran for governor, Stacey Abrams, continuing with the turnout drive through these special elections, hoping it's going to pay off as we all wait for DeKalb County. That could tell the whole story. I think that's right, and I actually feel really optimistic, George, when you think about the numbers that still are remaining to come in in DeKalb County and some of the other counties where we have large urban centers or suburban centers where we expect to see a huge Democratic turnout. And I think all thanks goes uh, to Stacey Abrams, who started this march uh, several years ago, all the organizers, black, brown, indigenous organizers across the state of Georgia who have been fighting through this thing. I can tell you Georgia's going to want a national day off after this uh, from all of the pressure that they've been under, and they should probably get a national holiday uh, for saving democracy, uh, both with the Trump win and also saving the future of this country uh, by giving Mitch McConnell a seat and letting him sit down so we can actually get some real work done. So I think all things goes to, to those organizers who registered new voters uh, in this second election, who got folks out who traditionally don't vote in runoff elections. They deserve all the credit and certainly all the voters in Georgia who, who came out during this very deadly pandemic. Thank you, Yvette. Matthew Dabb, boy, there is no question about it. Whatever happens tonight, the state of Georgia is changing uh, before our eyes, becoming a brand new factor in American politics. Yeah, it's George, it's one of the states that is moving in the opposite direction uh, than some of the other states that have moved more red, as we've seen over the last 10 years. Georgia, Arizona, ultimately a place like Texas, Nevada have moved towards purple. Um, and, I, you know, this race obviously was still to be called, still, to, still out, though I think all the data points, George, in this race point in the same direction, which is it's very much like 
uh, election night, Georgia, in 2020, when Joe Biden took an early lead, then Donald Trump took a big lead late in the night. And then as all those count, uh, counties, blue counties, ended up getting counted, like DeKalb in, in, in November of this year, it put Joe Biden over the top. And so I'll, I'll agree with a number of things. Races are always multiple factors in these things. The African-American vote in this race is key. Well, also key in this was a continued inroads into the suburban vote. But I'll emphasize something Sarah said. If the Democrats end up winning both of these races, which I think, as I said, the indicators point that way, two other factors came in. Underest underperforming in rural areas and red turnout, GOP turnout being down. And that lay squarely at Donald Trump's feet. Matthew Dowd, thank you. Let me bring Heidi Heitkamp, former Democratic senator uh, from, from North Dakota. Heidi, whatever happens tonight, uh, Chris Christie was talking about Joe Manchin. He's going to have an awful lot of power. Actually, the, the balance of power in the Senate is going to belong to people like Joe Manchin, also moderate Republicans, who will, uh, be, will be needed for any major piece of legislation. Yeah, I wish I had a dime for every person who speculated that Joe was going to sh shift political parties. He has way more power as a Democrat. Plus, he is a Democrat. And on economic policy, he's going to stand with people like Bernie Sanders. On fiscal policy, on things that, that matter to the country, he's going to vote like he's from West Virginia. So it's going to be an exciting time. I think it's going to be a time when we have a real shot at getting things done. And so uh, yay to Georgia if this works out. And uh, I think that we're going to see a whole new day in Washington, D.C. What's the first thing Joe Biden should do with this new Senate? Well, I think sit down with some of his colleagues on the other side. The people who are part of the common sense coalition that we started when I was there, and they, they now have the ability to drive the agenda for the people of this country. And it's going to be an exciting time, but it also is going to have to mesh with uh, Joe Biden's agenda. And so I think that Joe Manchin has an incredible opportunity to provide leadership to bring Republicans along because they trust them. They know that he is a straight shooter and he can get things done. Thank you, Heidi. The votes are still being counted across Georgia. We're going to go back there when we after this break. most the straightforward facts abc news is america's number one news number one in the morning number one in the evening with america's most watched newscast number one in late night versus the competition the number one news magazine on friday nights number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition the number one daytime talk show and number one in streaming news abc news is america's number one news powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? And figure out what's really out there. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch.
Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people were just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. This is the first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night, 24-7. ABC News, there for you. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast. There you see the numbers right now. These special Senate elections in Georgia. Republicans David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler holding on to their leads with 91% of the expected vote in. Right now, I want to go to Rachel Scott, who's at a Republican watch party, outside a Republican watch party in, uh, in Buckhead near Atlanta. Rachel, what's the mood there? Well, Republicans here know that this is their last line of defense, and so now comes the waiting game, and they really are looking at the rural counties, the suburbs here in Georgia, especially northwest Georgia, where the president was campaigning just yesterday for these two Republican senators trying to turn out the vote. But, George, I talked to so many of the president's supporters who said they were on the fence on whether or not they should even cast their ballot. Those allegations of a rigged elections that just simply are not true really sunk in for them. They were asking what was the point, and that message is just something that Republican leaders here really feared heading into these critical runoffs, George. Rachel Scott, thank you, Tom. Let's take another look at where the numbers are coming in right now. 91% of the expected vote. Yeah, 91% of the expected vote, but a lot of the area we're still waiting on the vote is the Atlanta metro region, the area where there are the most votes, where Democrats hope that they can run away in this election, break away from the Republicans. I want to talk about two counties around Atlanta. The first is Gwinnett County. You can see John Ossoff right now, who's taking on the incumbent, Senator Purdue, is outperforming Joe Biden by two percentage points. Now, you may not say that's not that much, but in a tight race, it's important. And it's even more important because in 2014, Purdue's first race, he won Gwinnett County, and now he's at 40 percent. When we look at Cobb County, again, this was the, the political home of Newt Gingrich at one point. John Ossoff at 57.2, running about close to where Joe Biden was, 94% of this in. But again, 2014, Joe, uh, George, this is a county that Purdue won. But the big unknown right now is still DeKalb County. We're waiting for any minute for the votes to come in. And we're talking about plus 170,000 votes. Once that dump comes in, and again, the president is already tweeting about this, but once that dump comes in, these are votes that are still being tabulated. That's going to change this race, and that's what we're waiting on, George. Okay, Tom, thanks very much. The president is also tweeting about uh, tomorrow in Congress, a momentous day in Congress. They're going to count uh, the electoral votes. Normally, that is a ceremonial. Uh, that is just a ceremony uh, in the Congress. But as you know, there are Republican challenges to some of the states, Pennsylvania and Arizona and Georgia, tomorrow prodded by the president. John Carl, I want to go to you with that. Uh, the president is not giving up this fight, despite the fact that he has no chance. The vice president in his ceremonial role as the president of the Senate will actually be presiding over that count. And Donald Trump somehow believes that because Pence will be holding the gavel when the votes are counted, that he has the power to overturn the election, to discredit uh, the electoral votes from states that Trump is contesting. Trump has made it clear to Trump that this, uh, I mean, Pence has made it clear to Trump that he does not have this power. And I am told, George, uh, that Donald Trump is prepared to go out after his own vice president and go after him hard uh, if uh, he does as expected and follows the rules tomorrow. Okay, John, Mary Bruce, you cover the Congress every day as well. This is a vote that Mitch McConnell does not want to have. 
George, he had urged his Republican colleagues not to do this, not to object to the certification of the Electoral College results, and yet you are seeing more than a dozen Republican senators, more than 100 Republican representatives who are siding with the president here. What is normally a routine ceremony has become very clearly a loyalty test for Republicans to the president. This is going to be a show for an audience of one in many ways that is going to drag on for hours, and yet you are seeing this huge divide within the Republican Party because of this, and it raises a lot of questions about where this party is headed going forward. Right, but we do know the outcome. The votes will be counted. Joe Biden will be the next president of the United States. I have to take one more break. This is what being live is all about. I can see me pushing through. This is ABC News Live. Dying neighborhoods are underwater. 24 7 streaming news source, ABC News. <laughs> Imagine breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non stop, straight to you. Imagine instant, incredible access to the most compelling live video. That's grenade. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all the most innovative storytellers, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live events and moments this is live? all playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? Go We're there trying now. To put this fire out right now. ABC News Live. Think of it as your live streaming adrenaline rush. Just look at all of the smoke here. Real, raw, live. The Columbus Zoo. No matter where the next step takes us, we're taking it. It's frightening. And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only ABC News gets. Behind the scenes, exclusive access. Take you inside for an extraordinary tour here at ABC News Live. This is it. It's time to go there, Blind, be there, cloud. experience it, live on the scene. <laughs> Maybe Where? that's why, in just one year, ABC News Live is already America's number one live streaming news. No, no, and imagine no, no, this. No, no, no. It's free. Wow. Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime. Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and abcnews.com. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. This wraps up our network coverage of the special elections in Georgia. The Republicans still holding on to leads, but about 9% of the votes still to be counted. We're going to continue our coverage on ABC News Live, and I'll see you tomorrow morning on GMA. When it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime.
Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show and number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? To figure out what's really out there. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch ABC News on location for Facebook Watch. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. But that did not stop it from getting the axe. Shame on you! Shame on you! Shame on you! The 150-year-old tree taken down in the UK to make way for a housing development that apparently did not include the tree in its plan. A strangely symbolic moment for a country that's been knocked down and now locked down again. Showdown in Georgia, voters taking to the polls today, waiting on some long lines to decide the balance of power in all of Washington, D.C. The high stakes battle between Senate candidates who've accused each other with some low blows. President Trump attacking fellow Republicans in the state, how his high pressure campaign is playing out. Meanwhile, President Trump issuing a veiled threat to Vice President Pence, calling on Pence to step in on that brewing electoral college fight. The nation's capital on high alert with thousands of Trump supporters expected to protest there tomorrow. The COVID crisis not slowing down. Hospitalizations nationwide hit a new record high. Los Angeles County ICUs at three-fold capacity. Ambulance is told to not transport any patients who have little chance of surviving. As more people sleep in their cars overnight for a chance to get vaccinated, only to be turned away. And the emotional plea from a hospital bed from someone who once regularly went maskless. Just wear a mask. Do it for your children, for your loved ones. Do it for yourself. No charges to be filed against the officer who shot Jacob Blake in the back multiple times. A state of emergency now in place as the city of Kenosha, Wisconsin, braces for possible unrest. What Blake's family is saying tonight. 
with all the excitement that the new year will move us past the pandemic, the original epicenter already has. A look at how Wuhan is thriving while so many Americans are dying. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Well, I can't sing it like James Brown or belt it out like Ray Charles, but many of us have Georgia on our minds tonight. Polls have been closed now for several hours while votes are counted in the runoff that will ultimately decide the balance of power in Washington. Democrats need to win both runoff elections to get to 50 seats in the Senate. And with Vice President Kamala Harris breaking the tie, they would ultimately have control of the chamber. So let's show you the two races that we'll be tracking all night long. Republican Senator David Perdue is taking on Democratic challenger John Ossoff and Republican Senator Kelly Loeffler, appointed one year ago by Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, is trying to win election for the very first time over Pastor Raphael Warnock. Voters lined up before sunrise this morning in Atlanta after a record early vote of more than 3 million. Tonight, Democrats hope their strong early turnout will prove decisive, while Republicans are banking that a big turnout today will give them the victory. And with tensions mounting in Washington over Congress's certification of President-elect Biden, ABC News has now learned that Vice President Pence pushed back against President Trump during their weekly lunch today, telling the president he does not have the power to reverse the outcome of the November election on Capitol Hill tomorrow. We'll have more on that in just a bit. But first, our Steve Osinsami leads us off tonight from Atlanta. In Georgia tonight, they are starting to count the votes and ending the national focus all over this one runoff election. The future of the country is on the ballot here in Georgia today. Y'all sound like you're ready to win an election. It is super clear to voters here who were lined up before the polls even open that their decision is bigger than Georgia, that the results will decide if Republicans keep control of the U.S. Senate, allowing them to put a thorn in the president-elect's agenda. At the 11th hour, Joe Biden and the Democrats are saying that what happens here today could determine if Americans get those $2,000 stimulus checks. What do you think about this election? It's a lot. My phone has been vibrating. <laughs> Have you voted? Do you have a voting plan? Have you told three friends to vote? It's insane. Do you think that the two Republicans can win? I hope so. We'll see. You know, I hope democracy does, uh, does what it does and the people of Georgia get to decide who's best. Democrat John Ossoff, who's hoping to take the seat of Republican David Perdue, was out late trying to get more of his supporters to the polls. Georgia voters have never had more power than you have today. That's the reason the whole world is watching us in Georgia. A constant noisemaker in this election is the president of the United States, who held a rally for the two Republicans Monday night. After weeks of saying that the November election in Georgia was rigged, he was here telling supporters to go out and vote anyway. Senator Kelly Loeffler, who's hoping to defeat Democrat Raphael Warnock and is trying to please the president and his supporters, announced that she'll join the group of senators trying to fight the election results. I will object to the electoral college vote. That's right. That's right. All of this has put election officials here, who are all Republicans, in a tough spot as they try to convince their voters that this election was safe and secure. The secretary wants me to make clear that everybody's vote is going to count. Steve Osinsami joins us now from Atlanta. Steve, you've been covering Georgia politics for years. So what stands out to you tonight from what we know so far of the vote? Well, what stands out to me are a couple things. One is that you saw the same sort of split in the early vote in the blue counties that you saw in November, which was seven to three, eight to two in favor of the Democrats. But you're also seeing this city and suburban versus rural split that's taking place between votes that are already in the bank and votes that happen tonight, which is why this race is so close. It is possible that we are looking at some of these provisional ballots starting to matter if this race continues to stay this close. Lindsay. Steve Osinsami in Atlanta for us. Thanks so much, Steve. Rachel Scott joins us now from a GOP watch party in Atlanta. Rachel, what's the mood there as a result of him coming in throughout the night? 
It is definitely a waiting game here. Look, Republicans knew that this was going to be a very tight race. It's one of the reasons why President Trump was in the 14th congressional district just yesterday. That is an area in the northwest part of Georgia that they are particularly concerned about. It had lower voter turnout than it did in the general election. The president there trying to rally supporters, get them to head out to the polls and vote. At this point, they are liking what they are seeing in sort of the suburbs, the rural areas that are coming in that are showing a little bit of strong turnout. The Republicans in this race were betting on their voters to turn out today. They weren't really looking at those early voting numbers and seeing very strong signs for them. They know that Democrats uh, traditionally like to turn out early to vote. They're hoping that their base got out today and they hope that last night's rally for President Trump and, and the candidates in this race did the job, Lindsay. And you talked about that rally last night. It was at that rally that the president repeatedly pushed Mike Pence to, quote, come through tomorrow during the Electoral College certification. Were voters more fixated on the November election or, or the runoff? way more concerned about overturning the results of an election that the president has already lost. And President Trump, before he even said a single word about the candidates that are running in these two critical runoffs that are going to determine control of the Senate, he went on this long riff for pushing these false claims that the election is rigged. And so I talked to several of the president's supporters yesterday as they were heading into this rally, and all of them said they were on the fence, worried whether or not they should even cast their ballot because they believe the president's false claims. Take a listen. I don't have a lot of faith in it. It's frustrating. It's just very frustrating. But I still believe in the democratic process, that we have a right to vote. Just kind of like after the election for the president, it was just kind of like, wow, did our vote count? You think the mixed messaging could potentially cost your party the Senate? It could. I don't know. I, I have friends that have been even, and these are people that were door knockers, like they were on the ground, boots on the ground people, all in for the GOP that actually have felt conflicted because our Secretary of State has lost our trust and we have not understood why our governor didn't call a special session like we asked. We called our state legislators, we sent them emails and phone calls we did and we feel ignored and we don't understand what's going on. Yeah, and that woman, Shauna Anderson, said she was personally trying to convince her friends and her family to get out and vote, but she said it was a total change from what she was seeing earlier. She had friends that were door knocking for President Trump in the general election. Now they were worried about sitting this election out because they believe the president's false claims. And we just have to say this, Lindsay, we cannot say it enough. There's been no evidence of the widespread voter fraud that the president is claiming. I've already gotten text messages from his campaign tonight continuing to push that narrative. He has lost lost more than 50 cases in court. What the president is saying is just simply not true, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, thanks so much. After today's high stakes runoffs, we'll take a preview at tomorrow, big day on Capitol Hill with Congress set to certify the presidential election results as Vice President Mike Pence presides. But President Trump is pressuring the vice president to overturn the electoral count, something that Pence has no constitutional power to do. Meanwhile, Republican senators remain divided on whether to certify Biden's win or to object. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. He lost at the polls, he lost in the courts. Now Donald Trump is demanding that his own vice president act to overturn the results of the presidential election. I hope that our great vice president, our great vice president comes through for us. He's a great guy. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much. Tomorrow, like vice presidents in the past, Mike Pence will preside over a joint session of Congress as the electoral votes are formally counted. Though it's a purely ceremonial role, today Trump tweeted, quote, the vice president has the power to reject fraudulently chosen electors. That's just not true. Pence has no actual power to change or reject any electoral vote. And one of Trump's longtime lawyers is saying as much, directly contradicting the president. I actually don't think that's what the Constitution has in mind. If that were the case, any vice president could refuse Andy any election. Pence has been trying to walk a fine line, not repeating the president's conspiracy theories while remaining ever loyal. I'm here because I stand with President Donald Trump. 
Trump's effort to pressure his own vice president come after he tried to turn the screws on local officials in Georgia, demanding the secretary of state find enough votes to change the election result. So what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. Now Trump sees tomorrow's joint session of Congress as his big last chance. He has summoned his supporters to Washington. So far, several hundred have arrived. 13 Republican senators say they'll join the more than 100 House Republicans expected to vote to reject Biden electors. But more and more Republicans are coming out to say the effort to overturn the election is unconstitutional. There is no role for the Congress to object to, to the electors. Senator Tim Scott, a top ally of the president's, released a statement saying, quote, there is no constitutionally viable path. As for President-elect Biden, he said he is encouraged to see Republicans standing up to Trump. There are enough really decent Republicans, you're seeing them step up now in, in the United States Senate, who don't want to be part of this Trump Republican Party. Biden making a distinction between the Trump supporters and Republicans. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, we know the President Trump and Vice President Pence met today. What are you hearing from his camp on how the Vice President will handle tomorrow and how do they think that President Trump will react if he ultimately certifies Biden's victory? Well, the bottom line, Lindsay, is that the president believes that v the vice president has a power that he just doesn't have. And the vice president himself is fully aware that he doesn't have this power. So Pence has said nothing publicly. We've asked uh, his spokesperson nothing uh, in response to what the president has said here. Uh, but I am told uh, by people close to the vice president that he intends to defy the president on this, that he intends to follow the rules, which means that at the end of the process, tomorrow, it will be Vice President Pence who is the one announcing that Joe Biden officially, formally, and finally has won the Electoral uh, College and has won the presidency. And, and that is something that, by the way, they, uh, the, these allies of the Vice President fully expect will incur the wrath of a very angry Donald Trump. Right. We heard him say at that rally last night that he'll like Pence a little bit less if yeah. that is to be the outcome. Now, Republicans in the House and Senators are divided on how they'll vote tomorrow. So just explain to us the process for tomorrow's joint session and how these objections will be raised. Uh, Republicans are deeply divided on this. I mean, it's interesting, although you're going to see a large number of Republicans uh, object to this, that some of the most prominent Republican voices uh, in Congress are on the other side saying that this is wrong, this is dangerous, it's unconstitutional. That's what Mitch McConnell has said. That's what Liz Cheney has said. They have said that to a degree publicly, but even more strongly in their private conversations with fellow Republicans. But what's going to happen is uh, it's, it's a, usually a formal process that you know is kind of an afterthought. Uh, each state uh, 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 ballot is presented, uh, e each state's electors, and counted, starting with Alabama and going through alphabetically. And uh, there are at least six states that Republicans uh, intend to uh, challenge, at least House Republicans intend to challenge. And on several of those states, uh, they will be joined by Republicans. If a Republican and a, a Republican from the Senate and from the House both both step forward to challenge a state's electors, then there are two hours of debate and, and a vote about whether or not to accept those electoral votes. So I expect to see on several of those states, at least three, maybe more, uh, there will be senators and House members objecting and two hours of, of debate and a long voting process. Because keep in mind, this is happening in the midst of the pandemic and only 70 or so members at a time are allowed on the House floor where this will all be uh, taking place. So the voting takes place in waves. It's going to take a very long time. Each vote uh, will take uh, at least an hour, perhaps quite a bit longer. Uh, so this could go on into the night. Sounds like a long night ahead. Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. Thank you, Lindsay. We're joined now by Delaware Senator Chris Coons, a close ally of President-elect Biden. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Senator. Now, as of now, 13, you, 13 Republican senators plan to object to the final certification of the Electoral College vote tomorrow, instead calling for a commission to conduct an immediate audit in certain states where there have been allegations of voter fraud, which we note there's been zero evidence to support. So what's the Democratic strategy to respond to this at this point? How do you anticipate that this law play out tomorrow? 
Well, Lindsay, I expect senators, both Democrats and Republicans, in the Senate tomorrow to emphasize what we know is the truth, that on November 3rd, the American people elected Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to be the next president and vice president of the United States, that in more than 60 court cases, state and federal court cases, um, they've either been thrown out for lack of evidence or withdrawn, and that state after state, with both Republican and Democratic governors and secretaries of state, have certified their results, in some cases like Georgia, after several recounts. There is no compelling evidence for the efforts being made by a small band of Republicans to challenge this important part of our democratic institutions, and I'm confident it will have no impact on the fact that two weeks from tomorrow, excuse me, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris will be sworn in. So let me ask you this. If the fraud allegations are completely baseless, would it be in Democrats' interest to agree to some kind of bipartisan commission in the new Congress to look at any and all fraud allegations and fully debunk them so that these claims don't stay alive? Lindsay, that is something we might consider, um, looking at ways in which voter suppression has been a real challenge in recent elections and to consider allegations. Uh, but let's be clear, we should not be considering that in any way that would slow down the swearing in of the next president. We have a raging pandemic. We have economic recovery to get to. We have bringing our country together, um, that our commitments that Joe Biden made as candidate and that our important efforts he's going to begin as president, we should not be delaying that valuable work one more day. Would you say that there's any chance that President elect Biden has been too passive in letting this drag out as President Trump and now multiple uh, Republicans question the legitimacy of his election? It, it seems like he's waiting for this to maybe all just blow over, but does it hurt his ability to be an effective president from day one if large portions of Americans potentially believe that his election wasn't legitimate? Lindsay, it does harm the prospects of a successful Biden presidency that President Trump, rather than focusing on responding to this pandemic, which is surging out of control, has spent the last two months golfing and tweeting and indulging himself in conspiracy theories and in whipping up opposition um, to Republican acceptance of the outcome of the election. That is a real challenge. But I don't think uh, President-elect Biden has in any way been passive. He's instead been doing the hard work of assembling a talented and capable cabinet, of putting together detailed plans for how to take over and to lead the fight against this pandemic, and how to begin the hard work of bringing our people together after the divisive Trump presidency. Now, I know you've been an optimist on the idea of bipartisan cooperation in the new Congress, but how can a President Biden and Democrats work with these senators who are questioning the results of this election? Are Biden's unity efforts going to be harder to achieve after January 20th than he expected? Lindsay, I'm heartsick at the colleagues who've chosen uh, to throw themselves in the way of what is an important next step in our democratic process tomorrow. Uh, I'm surprised at some of my colleagues who are uh, lashing themselves to the mast of Trumpism and refusing to recognize the legitimate outcome of the election. Uh, but frankly, we don't have any choice going forward but to try to heal the wounds of this election, to bring our country together, and to find ways to legislate in a bipartisan and sustainable way. Millions of Americans, tens of millions of Americans, came out and voted for Joe Biden, even though they might be Republicans, independents, or Democrats who either didn't vote four years ago or who voted for Donald Trump because they were choosing um, a more balanced, rational, predictable, and effective government going forward. I think Joe Biden's done just the right thing to lay the groundwork for a successful administration. Turning now to the runoff tonight in Georgia. I'm sure you're confident the Democrats are going to be able to pull off. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News. This is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline.
The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Ossoff versus Purdue. Warnock versus Leffler. Election night, the Georgia Senate runoffs. Here now, Tom Yamas and Lindsey Davis. Welcome back, everybody. We are interrupting ABC News Live Prime because we have some new reporting in a large number of votes coming into Cab County, the fourth largest county in Georgia. Tom, what do we know? Yeah, let's look at the big board right now to see where the vote stands at this hour. We have about 96,000, uh, excuse me, 96% of the expected vote in at this hour. Right now, when we look at the numbers, Senator Purdue is up about plus 15,000 votes over John Ossoff. Ralph Warnock up plus 20,000 votes over Senator Senator Leffler, uh, Raphael Warnock, I should say. Uh, so this race has gotten really interesting. What's the big change here? So let's look at DeKalb County, as Lindsay just mentioned. We now have 93% of the vote in. When we came off the air, we had about 40%, so 50% more of the vote has come in DeKalb County, the quote-unquote voting dumps that have come in now. We have John Ossoff at 82%. Let's see how he compares to Joe Biden. Let me pause our, our telestrator here. He's, he's basically matching up to Joe Biden right there, but he's taken such a big jump in the raw vote, and that's why these numbers have changed. His uh, shrinking Purdue's lead. When we go to Raphael Warnock, he's up 83% matching Joe Biden as well, but again, a huge lead over Senator Leffler there with 93% of the vote in. Now, you may be asking, why is Warnock doing much better than Ossoff? If you essentially come out and you look at all the counties that surround Atlanta, Warnock is overperforming Ossoff by about 2,000 votes so far in each of those counties. I want to make one more point about places where Democrats are running strong. Savannah, Chatham County. So you have Raphael Warnock with 58% of the vote. He's about where Joe Biden was two months ago, but there's only 82% of the expected vote, and so there's still a chunk of the vote in a very blue county. The race is very close. Senator Purdue looks like he's in good shape at this point, Lindsay. But again, some of those blue counties were still counting votes there. There's still about... Uh, five to four percent of the vote still in. We're talking about more than 100,000 votes still out there. So this race could change, Lindsay. All right, thanks, Tom. Let's take it back to Nate Silver. And Nate, we were talking earlier about the outstanding vote. So as Tom just said, still about four to five percent uh, that we're still waiting on. What are you seeing in those numbers uh, that have yet to come in? They are all very blue votes. They're mostly early votes in very blue counties. So Democrats might win those votes by three to one or four to one. That's why you'd much rather be, I mean, frankly, I think, Leffler is in very, very deep trouble. Purdue in slightly better shape. Um, but if you have 100K thousand outstanding votes and they're going to go three to one to Democrats, you can do the math and you probably expect Democrats to overtake um, the GOP in the end, maybe close enough though for a recount potentially. And, and Mary, wanted to get, Mary Alice, wanted to get to your point as far as the, the 140 years that you have to go back where you had to wait, right? I mean, we're talking about uh, right now 50-50 still in uh, both races, really a, a nail biter. And, and what is it? Half of a percentage point, one candidate would have to win by more than half of a percentage point in order for this not to get tied up in a lot of litigation. Exactly. We saw that in November. We saw the race was so close that the votes in Georgia were not counted once or twice, but three times. And then a fourth special audit to work on signature matching. So the Georgia officials know how to do this. They know how to go back and check by hand, by machine. So if this gets really close again, if neither one of these, uh, if none of of these candidates is able to win by more than that half a percentage point, we very likely will be in a recount scenario. Um, and then the, the larger question you're getting at, that point of, of does that mean we could still be waiting even longer to know which party is controlling the Senate? That would just be remarkable because you're right. I was doing a lot of my, uh, spending a lot of time on Senate.gov today and turns out you'd have to go back 140 years to the great Senate deadlock of 1881 before you saw America Americans have to wait just this long to know who is going to have the gavel, who's going to be able to have committee assignments, decide the floor schedule. It's really unusual for us to not know what that's going to look like next year. And talk about unusual.
unusual, Lindsay. I mean, this was the same ballot that, that everyone in Georgia got to vote on. And the fact that you'd have this 20,000 vote margin, you know, one candidate being up by about you know, 10,000 or so, the other down by a, a similar margin, it's remarkable. I mean, rem reminder that you know, Senator Purdue is the only one of the four candidates to have won a race at all uh, among any of the people running tonight. But, but, but it, is, it is a testament to how tightly divided things are. Keep in mind, Joe Biden won this state by only 12,000 votes. So seeing that 20,000 vote margin, that looms huge tonight. That's control of the Senate, potentially, if you take that snapshot, and that's how things end. And, and what's your speculation as to why somebody would say, I'm going to vote for Warnock and I'm going to vote for Purdue? Yeah, so David Purdue, keep in mind, he, he won an election uh, six years ago. And his, his, his cousin, Sonny Purdue, is a former governor uh, and a former agriculture secretary that pulled very well among black voters. So that's a name that actually means something among black voters. And of course, his, can, his opponent was white. John Ossoff uh, is the, is, as we've been talking about, the pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh, Raphael Warnock has a constituency and has established himself a lot more. John Ossoff, only 33 years old, he would become the youngest Democratic senator since Joe Biden, of all people. Uh, and he just doesn't have the same kind of name recognition, connection to voters, or natural constituency. So it's possible that a lot of people split their tickets. A lot of people did do that in November. We know they did, and that's why we're in this runoff situation. But the fact that it seems to have continued during this runoff, despite the, both, the fact that both tickets basically ran as teams, is a remarkable thing. Tom. Yeah, I want, I want to show you guys a point since we're talking about this, to, just to show you where John Ossoff and Senator Perdue are. So at the end of, of November, after the November election, this is how they ended up. So this is, this is two months ago. Senator Perdue was on top. This is what led to the runoff. John Ossoff, uh, two, about 2.4 million to John Ossoff's 2.3 million. The separation here was about plus 88,000 for Senator Perdue. When we look at the big wall right now, Henry, follow me up here. Senator Perdue's lead is now plus 3,000. Again, less people voting in this runoff election, but Rick Klein, I wanna go back to you when we talk about this. That's actually pretty good numbers for Ossoff, considering where he was at the end of, of the general election and where he is tonight, because we still have those outstanding votes in those blue counties. Yeah, he lost to David Perdue. Uh, he lost pretty pretty substantially. Uh, David Perdue uh, did better than Joe Biden and was able to was able to, to to outperform in a whole lot of parts of the state. And that it, only because of the the fact that Georgia has this this runoff rule, where you have to crack 50 percent, uh, that that we even have tonight as an evening at all. Otherwise, David Perdue would have been reelected already. So coming into the night uh, and coming. Into to a runoff, a, a lot of strategists thought you, you got to pencil in the Republicans. They tend to do better in the runoffs, and you had Purdue at the top of the ticket, who came pretty close to, to winning the election in the first round. So the fact that they were able to make it competitive is a testament to their turnout efforts and I think to the messaging. Mary Alice, I want to talk about the Republicans now in places like Cherokee County, where most of the Republican votes, the, the county with the most Republican votes, uh, are going to happen. In Cherokee County, Senator Leffler, I mean, she performed well. She overperformed from President Trump with 99% of the vote in, but what we're seeing in these red counties across the state, you were talking to me about this, they can be a little deceiving because even though the percentage numbers are overperforming President Trump, the raw votes are not, correct? Yeah, exactly. And we don't know what the final raw vote will be. Those percentages are our are, are guesses, all right, what we assume, what we're thinking the expected vote will be. But Democrats have been saying all along that they don't believe they've hit their ceiling yet in Georgia. They are trying to register new voters. And frankly, the newer voters in Georgia are, are in Democrats' favor. They're younger voters. They're diverse ethnically and, and racially. And so one or two percentage points in those really big urban centers can just represent a lot more raw vote than in the smaller rural counties. Yeah, and I want to talk about one more county we really haven't talked about a lot tonight, which is Clark. It's a Democratic stronghold. It's Athens. Uh, and you can see even a place like this, when we talk about one or two percentage points, you can see Warnock's on top from Joe Biden, just a percentage point. But those little increments and advantage of Democrats are going to help in a very tight race, Lindsay. What we're seeing throughout the state is the Democrats in a lot of these blue counties some of the Democratic senator, senatorial candidates did better than Joe Biden, and that's going to help. But again, as we're ticking down the clock, 4% left to be counted. This race is so close. We're seeing Senator Perdue's lead shrink, and we've seen the Reverend Raphael Warnock, his lead increase now over Senator Leffler.
Tom, like to bring back in Steve Osinsami at this point. And, and Steve, you know, Asaf underperformed. If we go back to the general election for a moment. Asaf underperformed uh, President-elect Biden by about 100,000 votes. Is there an indication on the ground there in Georgia that a number of voters there really wanted Biden uh, for president but wanted to make sure that Republicans would remain in control of the Senate? Well, you know, I, I, I'd say that more of what I saw from, uh, and this is anecdotally, um, for example, there was a lot of focus on a particular voter um, south of the city who uh, was accused of, uh, of a dead voter voting, and it turned out it was a woman who was voting for her husband, and she was approached by a local reporter who explained that, you know, she really wasn't trying to vote for the Biden guy, as she said. She just didn't want to vote for the president, and she sounded like she probably was a voter who the president could have expected. I think there was a lot of that that happened here. And, you know, this idea of the split voting, that, that, that doesn't happen. That was disproven here in the general election. As you point out, you know, if people were voting a straight ticket, then the lead that Joe Biden enjoyed, John Ossoff should have enjoyed a similar lead, and he didn't. Uh, we're seeing something similar happen tonight. And one thing I'll point out about uh, uh, Reverend Warnock and that particular campaign, his race with Kelly Leffler, you know, race played a significant role in that campaign because of Leffler's attacks on using his sermons from a historic black church. He's the reverend of Ebenezer Baptist, Ebenezer Baptist Church. She was using sermons to portray him as anti-police, anti-military, and anti-Israel. And a number of black Americans here in the Atlanta area in particular were offended by that. A group of black pastors got together and wrote an open letter to her saying that she had crossed a line. Um, that no doubt played a role in this election. I know a lot of, of black voters in this region who were offended by that line of attack. And when you look at DeKalb County, which is the county that I live in, it's majority black, the numbers that just came in, you know, that may have played a role in that county's totals and the voter for the voters in that county who are majority black, who, un, who absolutely identify with this reverend. And, you know, and there's also something else to say, you know, when you, when you, you know, we, we still, of course, have votes to be counted. We don't know where this is going to wind up. But, you know, Reverend Warnock, he appealed to a lot of constituents here. In his commercials, his dog was a star. He made his puppy uh, part of his campaign and said that, you know, they're going to say that I hate puppies, too. And it, 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 was, it was really well done and appealed to a broad section of voters. And, and, and I personally am not surprised that we're seeing a split and that there could, in the end, be a split. And, but vote. what do you think also, uh, Steve, about the role uh, of the WNBA players who really opposed her stance as far as Black Lives Matter? Of course, she is uh, an owner of the, the WNBA uh, team there in Atlanta. It seems like she got a lot of pushback in the black community as well for that. She did, and, and, and there are a lot of people in the black community who found it a, a little rich that she would argue that Reverend Warnock was more out of touch with Georgia voters than she was, uh, considering the, you know, her positions and the fact that she is, frankly, one of the wealthiest lawmakers in American history. Um, and so all of that factor, factors into what we're seeing tonight, and, and, and we'll see how, how, how these votes fall. All right, Steve, thanks so much. I want to bring back in Rachel. Scott, Rachel, let's talk about the push to engage uh, young voters on yep. the ground there in Georgia. There was a big push this time around. When you look at these numbers, especially Joe Biden winning uh, the general election in Georgia here, this state for the first time in nearly 30 years by less than 12,000 votes, there were groups that were looking at the numbers and they saw that from that point in November to now, there were around 23,000 young black voters who turned 18 years old. And so there's been a push on the ground here to engage those voters, to get those voters out to the polls and to broaden it, not just 
from here in Atlanta to reach out to the suburbs and, and to reach out to different areas. That's why you saw uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president elect, coming down campaigning for the Democratic uh, candidates in this race just this past weekend, trying to bring it home for them. Obviously, Joe Biden, the president elect, here as well. But this has been a months long effort uh, by by so many here on the ground. And and what I've been hearing from Democratic voters, uh, especially at that Harris event that she was at, was that it was really about the investment. It was really about the face to face conversations that they had with people from their own communities, Democrats engaging those vote, engaging their neighbors to turn out and knock on doors. And, and that really did pay the difference for, for a lot of Democrats in this race. Rachel Scott, thanks so much. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart not. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. We move up to the vehicle, he detonates a bomb. The heroes who stopped the killer, who held the city of Austin hostage for 19 days. It's a tripwire. All hands on deck. The clues, the Home Depot video, that truck, and the agent who connected the dots. It was exactly the vehicle that we were looking for. Inside the investigation. Vans made contact. The takedown of The Bomber, now streaming on Hulu. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. And welcome back to our continuing coverage of the Georgia Senate runoff races right now. And, and this story and this race is changing almost every minute. We have 97% of the expected vote in right now. And with that, Senator Perdue, the incumbent, going up against John Ossoff. Right now, we are seeing his lead almost evaporate in real time. At one point, he was up by tens of thousands of votes, now up by only 456. And then in the next race, the other Georgia race, the Reverend Raphael Warnock up 34. 4,000 votes. He actually has the most votes so far of the four candidates in this race. 
up 34,000 ahead of Senator Leffler right now. We want to go to the map to show you where some of the outstanding vote is still left at this hour right now as we ask our steady cam operator to come right back around. So this is the map of Georgia. This is where it looks like right now. We still are waiting on 3% of the vote still to come in. There's also other votes that we're waiting on as well. This map, the way it looks like right now, this jigsaw puzzle of red and blue is identical to the way it looked at the end of the election just two months ago in the presidential general election there in Georgia. So not much has changed. What have we been watching? We've been watching the areas of Atlanta, the suburbs around there, Savannah, Chatham, and Liberty County, and then, of course, the Black Belt of Georgia as well. So why are Democrats leading in one race and almost leading in the other? The, the, what we've seen so far is that in those blue counties, they're overperforming the percentages of Joe Biden, which has helped them tremendously, while Republicans, on the other hand, have been holding the same percentages as President Trump, but the raw votes just aren't there, so they're not overperforming technically to President Trump. We're going to have to wait and see what happens. There are still outstanding votes, including some provisional ballots and early votes that came in today. I want to go to Rick Klein, our political director, to talk to us right now about what exactly is happening and the votes that are still outstanding at this hour, Rick. Well, yeah, I'm mean, making the point that, you know, this election night is about whether we're going to have a 50-50 Senate. We've got two 50-50 races. I mean, look at those numbers, all 50s. It's as evenly divided as you can possibly imagine things to be. And in that universe, small batches of votes that might take a little while to come in or to get counted matter quite a bit. Uh, this matters less in the Warnock race if that lead holds. But looking at the numbers in, in the purdue Ossoff race, uh, there's a universe of as many as 17,000 overseas and military ballots. Those could take as long as uh, until Friday to arrive. Now, not all of them are going to be sent in in time or sent in at all, but that's just one batch in addition to the outstanding vote that we're still expecting to get counted that's going to make this potentially last several days. Again, the warnock leffler race in a, in a little bit of a different scenario, but you start to think, what, 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 where, where can you find just a few hundred votes to make a difference in the other race? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to get Henry on the steady cam here a little dizzy, but just as you were speaking, Rick, the race changed again. Now we have Senator Purdue up by 3,000 votes. His, link was sh his, his lead was shrinking. Now he's... He's back up by, by more than 3,000 votes with 98% of the vote in. Raphael Warnock still on top with 32% as well. Uh, I'm sorry, with 32,000 votes ahead of time. We want to go to the uh, Republican election official, Gabriel Sterling, who was speaking just moments ago. Let's listen in. If they had waited to get the, all those ballots in tonight, there would have been about a three-hour gap of time. So out of an abundance of looking out for their, their employees and not having, wasting time, they're going to allow the registration group to finish their work tonight and hand it over tonight or first thing tomorrow morning. And then Chatham County will come back and complete their work on those absentee ballots. But it's really just the absentee ballots that came in today from the mail and the drop boxes there. So now I'm going to give you the list of the counties we do not have everything in from. Appling, Bibb, Camden, Cobb, Coffee, DeKalb, Douglas, uh, Floyd, Forsyth, Fulton, Gwinnett, Henry, Houston, Lumpkin, hmm, let's see, Newton, Pickens, and that's it. Those are the last counties that we do not have the full reports in from. Uh, so, as you can see, it's still a very set of tight races out there. Bubba McDonald has the largest lead amongst the Republicans. Uh, Purdue has a small lead right now, and Senator Leffler is behind uh, Reverend Warnock right now. So the other thing we remember, Fulton and DeKalb, these larger candidates, are going to have big swaths of votes that come in that came in today. So keep that in mind as you're looking at what you're expecting to come out. So with that, I'll take any questions you might have. So you're expecting more dumps? from DeKalb, Fulton? Um, only on the absentees to come in from Fulton. Fulton's got all of their advanced in already. Um, we're looking, they're going to be processing at the Georgia World Congress Center through a large portion of the night until they reach a potentially good stopping point. And then again, that's only in the absentees that came in today. They've uploaded everything else already. Yang, is it fair to say that the counties that you went to, and I can't speak to each of them specifically, but they appear to be predominantly Democratic counties, at least in, in terms of past voting patterns? In terms of the amount of votes that are potentially out there coming from largely Democrat counties, there are some Republican counties, Floyd, Forsyth, Appling, but they are smaller in comparison to the DeKalb's, Gwinnett's, Cobb's, and Fulton's. So what does that tell you when you look at the vote? That tells you what you have outstanding will likely be leaning Democrat at best. What else? What are you going to be doing the rest of the night? Um, 
looking at spreadsheets, trying to figure out what's going to be happening and trying to prepare for what's going to be happening tomorrow because we do have these close elections. And there's a potential where some of these elections could be within a half a point, so the second place finisher will have the opportunity to potentially ask for a recount again. Is it possible you'll know the answer tonight? With, with it's possible, but it's not likely, especially with the number of absentees we anticipate being counted tomorrow in the larger counties. And how many do you expect tomorrow? We have no way of knowing right now. Okay. But we've told all the counties to get their information in uh, to the ENET system, the registration system, by 1 p.m. tomorrow. Any surprises in this election? I'm not talking about everything that led up to it. In, uh, in, in the election itself, today. in the election itself, it was a very smooth election. You know, we had a couple of things here and there uh, with Columbia County with their issues the first thing in the morning, but in general, it was a very smooth election. We didn't have any issues. The election not reporting has gone relatively smoothly, so we feel like the counties are kind of getting in the groove despite the fact we know they're all exhausted. Any idea yet on numbers today, voters today? Um, yeah, uh, give me a second, I can look them up real quick. I hate to do it on the fly. We ended up having probably close to a million altogether right now. In fact, I'm looking at uh, so far, and this may have all of them, we're looking at 1.244 million votes, which was more than we anticipated, actually. We were looking at, a mil that's today, that's election day votes, 1,244,374. Um, and the absentee by mail so far is at 995,410. Um, and the advanced voting that's been reported so far is 2,054,776. Are results coming in faster than expected? Uh, one of the things about having only three contests on a race and having smaller actual physical ballots this time, every ballot was 11 inches for the um, uh, absentee ballots, it, we knew it would be faster. So obviously it'd be faster than November elections because there's just fewer steps in the process and it's easier to handle smaller pieces of paper at the end of the day. Knowing what you know now, what are the uh, possibilities that there might be some contentious uh, comments made uh, as, as this vote is so close, just as there was after November 3rd? Frankly, John, I'd be shocked if there weren't contentious remarks made about the outcomes the, with, with them being so close. We have a, a state that is very closely divided amongst a partisan divide right now, but I want to emphasize a point again that Bubba McDonald and the you know, the race that most people didn't think about today has more votes than both the senators, which shows there's potential that there were Republican voters who chose not to vote for the two Republican senators, maybe because of all the contention, but that's speculation on our part. Anything else? So that's it for tonight? I think that's going to be it for tonight. I don't see anything else big happening. You know, the biggest thing we had hanging out there were those really, that really giant tranche of DeKalb County advanced votes. They may load the additional 20,000 tonight. It may be tomorrow, depending on how they have to work through the, the two memory cards they're dealing with. And all that was was they sent two scanners out to two advanced voting locations. And instead of making individual cards for each one, they only made two so they could upload one or the other. So they're likely going to have to rescan some of the stuff out of those two ballot boxes. And just for our morning folks, do you anticipate a, uh, any brief? Okay, we've just been listening to Georgia election official Gabriel Sterling right there, who was talking about the outstanding vote and where it stands right now. I want to show you where some of these counties are, and then we're going to get reaction to some of this. So there are Republican outstanding votes as well. We want to show you where, where some of the bigger counties for the Republicans are. Forces, this is where a lot of the Republican votes come so far. You can see Senator Purdue has a very comfortable lead here, but I wanted to focus on this number as we can con compare them to the blue county. So you have, this is about almost 3% of the pass size of the entire total election for Georgia, okay? So that, that's one county, and then we can come over here. Let me see, Mike, sure I can, I can find Floyd. Floyd County is another Republican county here. You can see Purdue, again, with a comfortable lead, but again, I want you to focus on this, nu this number. It's less than a percentage point of the entire Georgia uh, election population. So those are the Republican counties, and there's a few other ones where the vote is still outstanding. But then he's talking about the big counties here. We still have 7% out of DeKalb. Look how much big num bigger this number is. 7%, nearly 8% of the total vote there. That's a big Democratic-leaning county. Also, Forsyth as well. We still have 5 I'm sorry, Fulton. We still have 5% of the vote out there. This is at, uh, Georgia's biggest county. This is where Atlanta is. You can see it's nearly 11% of the total population there. And then Cobb, still 5% there. You can see Ossoff on top. It's a little tighter than those other blue counties, but the Democrats are expected to win in Cobb County. And then Gwinnett as well, 8%, 5% of the vote out from there. So what's the point that we're trying to make here? The point that, that we're trying to make is that in these Democratic-leaning counties, there's still a lot of the vote outstanding. From my rough math, there's still more than 80,000 votes left. And when we look at the big wall, Henry, if you can show them up here, Senator Perdue's lead at this point right now is plus 1,000, nearly 2,000 votes. Uh, Raphael Warnock on top of Senator Leff, 
Leffler by plus 35,000 votes at this hour. But if there's still 80,000 votes still left out there, a lot of them from blue counties, that's why Democrats think they could still have a chance in this race, at least winning both Senate seats, because it looks right now that Raphael Warnock's is in a very good position. Uh, Rick, as we come to, to sort of the end of the night here, we're waiting on this last 2% of the vote in, what are you seeing, especially when we hear about some of the provisional ballots and the early voting they're still going to count that came in today that's going to be counted tomorrow? Yeah, the, the, the Republicans are going to run out of places to find additional votes, <clears throat> and that's why that lead by Raphael Warnock right now looms as large as it does and why that Purdue lead is as, is as tiny as, as it is at this hour. To look at all of those places that the votes can continue to come in, you just recognize that there's just th those are blue places, and if they at all match up with expectations. Another big headline from what we just heard from the Secretary of State's office, uh, Election Day voting exceeded 1.2 million. Now, they came into the day saying, we're not really sure. It could, you know, there were so many early votes. They thought at the high end, maybe 1 million, 1.1 million. And the conventional wisdom was that a very big number, great for Republicans, because they were going to save all those votes for Election Day itself. It turned out that it was a more nuanced story. A lot of these Election Day voters turned out to be Democrats. And we saw Democrats outperform their numbers, even in rural areas of the state, including in red areas of the state, uh, just to hold down some margins and really run up the score in other places. And many of them did vote today. They may have voted uh, at, in a traditional way. They may have just vote, uh, dropped off that, uh, that early ballot in person. So a lot of votes that we thought might have been banked, the Republicans like to say the Democrats cannibalized their vote while well, they had a lot of feasting still to go on on Election Day itself. And Mary Alice, Gabriel Sterling, the election official, was also making another point that why he thought, some, some evidence, if you will, if you want to call it that, why he thought some Republicans may have gone to vote, but they didn't vote in the Senate races. Right. There was actually one other race on the ballot for public service commissioner, uh, and Sterling was referring to that. Uh, it's a Republican on the ballot who actually is outperforming these two Republican candidates. And so Sterling was making the argument that it's possible you just have too many disillusioned Republicans who were turned off by the actions of the president, perhaps turned off by these uh, Senate candidates. They're going and voting for other Republicans, or in this case, one very specific public service commissioner seat uh, and but they're not voting for their current sitting senators it will be really interesting to watch at the end of the night if that's true and, and you know you had Gwinnett up there and I just I think it's worth noting you, you referred to it as a blue uh, you know a blue county and obviously it is but it is so recently blue we're talking about less than a decade you know this is the kind of county that Romney won by seven percentage points that Hillary Clinton barely won and then in the last five years we've just seen this explosion of new people in that area this is a new Atlanta and we are seeing that in full force tonight yeah no no the state has definitely changed it's a great point Hillary Clinton outperformed Barack Obama but Donald Trump underperformed from Mitt Romney, and then the trends just changed in 2020. I want to bring in Terry Moran now. Terry, th this is still such a close race. We're not making any calls yet. We still have 2% of the vote out. Uh, but we are seeing some trend lines. You know, we're, we are seeing the Reverend Raphael Warnock here, a political newcomer. Yes, he, he was the senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church, but he's the man who's on the board right now with the most votes out of two sitting senators, right? And then you have John Ossoff, a political newcomer as well, who is in a very tight race, losing right now, but in a very tight race against the incumbent Senator David Perdue. So my question to you is, Terry, how much did the president's actions matter in, in, in the weeks and months after the election up until this point? We kind of got into a heated debate with Governor Christie about this, but how much do you think the president's actions uh, had to do with what we're seeing tonight? I, I think it had to do a lot with shaping the debate. Look, if you're a politician running uh, for the Senate from a state, you want to talk about the issues for the people of your state. Yeah, yeah. You want to talk about whether it's high taxes, uh, whatever it might be, energy policy, agriculture policy. You want to talk to the people of your state about their concerns. Donald Trump demanded of the Republican candidates that they go with him, storm the democracy, demand on no evidence that any court has found reliable, no evidence that any Republican elected official responsible for certifying the election in Georgia found reliable, that somehow the election was stolen, just like he said the Iowa caucuses were stolen when Ted Cruz won them, et cetera, et cetera. And that 
took them off their game. It, it's like a sporting event when the other team forces you to play a different game than the one you wanted. And, and that, in the end, I think in such a close election that they weren't able to talk about their agenda. They had to talk about Trump's agenda. And when Joe Biden came to Georgia and he said, you have two senators who, who aren't loyal to you, they're loyal to Trump, uh, that was important. And the whole story, it seems to me, however these races turn out, begins to turn the page on the presidency of Donald Trump. We heard it tonight from uh, Lieutenant Governor Duncan in his interview with Lindsey earlier, where he said this is a pivot point, and our party, he said, the Republican Party has to be bigger than one man. And I think one of the issues that Donald Trump is going to have tomorrow when he tries to get Republicans to overturn the election and going forward is if you say you win all the time and you start losing, the spell breaks. The enchantment breaks. This was a bad night for Donald Trump uh, and a good night for those who want a Republican Party beyond him. Terry Moran, we thank you for that analysis. I want to bring in Nate Silver right now, the editor and founder of 538. Nate, this is really when we start to rely on your expertise in crunching some of the numbers. You have a feeling that this, both these races are going to lean a certain way. I want you to, just, as simply as you can, walk our viewers through it. Yeah, I mean, Democrats will probably win both these races. Um, Warnock's already ahead by what's now a somewhat, not comfortable margin, but like a meaningful margin. And the outstanding votes are all in very blue areas. So DeKalb County alone, about 20,000 more early votes in very black precincts, that will probably net John Ossoff maybe 15,000 votes on their own. That would be enough for him to pull ahead and Warnock to pull further ahead. Um, there can be tabulation errors and irregularities, things we don't know about, but there's not like a kind of conventional path back for, for Leffler, certainly. She is, I think, pretty much toast. Um, and you need something irregular to go on for, for Purdue to hold on, I think. So, Nate, but on that point, and, I, and, and for our viewers, I keep looking to my right because that's where we have our, our, our big wall, and I can see the, the numbers up close. We have Senator David Perdue up 2,000 votes, but we still think there's about 80,000 votes outstanding, right. that, that 2%. Plus, we have the votes that are being counted today and maybe those provisional val ballots going ahead. We don't know how those will break either. But you've seen enough in the data and, and the numbers and the history, if you will, to, to feel that, that the Democrats are, are in the position right now to be a little, a little more comfortable than Republicans at this hour. Yeah, because it's a, it's a finite math problem at this point, right? We know where the votes are. Sometimes there are surprises, but they're in very blue areas, and they're the bluest type of votes, which are early votes in a lot of places. And so it's just like, they're going to be close elections, right? Left might lose by one or two points. You know, I wouldn't totally go to I'd still have some nightmares if I were Ross about who knows, some irregularity somewhere. Um, but the math is pretty doable at this point. Georgia has very good reporting on where the votes are outstanding. They keep people very much um, up to tabs on that. And so we're not, there's not as much guesswork involved as there was, say, in Pennsylvania or Arizona in November. We have really good info from Georgia on where the outstanding votes are, and we have a good idea about who those are likely to turn out for. Yeah, and I want to go to Rick before we, we, we kick it back over to Lindsey. Rick, but everyone's going to be careful about how they call these races because it's still very close. The networks, uh, the wire services, news organizations are going to be very careful because it's still very close. And even though people may think it's going to lean one way, there's been so much made about Georgia that no one wants to get this wrong. That's exactly right. And I'll tell you, you know, our standards are that uh, our policy is not to make a projection in the race that's going to land within one percentage point uh, and certainly not within that half percentage point that we've been talking about tonight as grounds for a potential recount. So we're looking at the numbers. Our team is very much dialed into the vote that's outstanding. Uh, we're seeing the same things that everyone else is, and I think the analysis that Nate, Nate pointed out is correct, that it looks very good for both Democratic candidates. That's not a, a secret here, but the process has to play itself out. Uh, we know that it took a couple of days to get a final picture uh, out of the presidential race. It appears that uh, the election officials in Georgia at the, at the state and local level have been working overtime to try to rectify some of the delays before because this is a lot more vote than we expected coming into the night. The fact that it's midnight and we have 98% plus is something of an achievement. But these are very close races. Uh, we're still talking about uh, very narrow margins that could land in the mandatory uh, or the possible recount territory. And there's still outstanding vote that needs to be tabulated. All right, Lindsay, as we wait for that final 2%, I'll kick it back over to you. All right, thanks, Tom. I'd like to bring in Yvette Simpson back into the mix. And Yvette, you know, throughout this whole election, we've really seen the Republicans attack 
attacking the Democrats, calling them radical liberals. In fact, so much so there were some college students that started playing a drinking game every time uh, that Loeffler said uh, the word radical liberals. I according to the exit polls, it, it sounds like that was uh, an effective strategy, but maybe according to the votes, uh, perhaps not. Of course, there are a number of factors that have gotten us to this 50-50 race in, uh, result in both of the races at this point. But do you think that it's possible that one of the issues is that Georgia is, in fact, becoming more progressive? I think it is. I mean, when you think about the fact that I wanted to comment on this earlier, Raphael Warnock got early support from progressives. He was supported right away from our organization, Democracy for America, almost immediately. He had a huge coalition of support. He also had, you know, black voters, rural black voters, brown voters, all over the place, right? So we had this huge coalition. When Ossoff came into play, progressives joined alongside him because we needed both seats. And so if you think about the fact that Raphael Warnock has been an unapologetic progressive from day one, and he is in a significant lead right now. And so some folks would say he probably carried Ossoff in some of the places where he wasn't as strong and, and, and is part of the reason why Ossoff is doing as well as he's doing now. So I think that that's a fallacy. I also think when you think about in those final weeks, we came down to real solutions for people in this pandemic, and you started to hear Ossoff and Warnock talking about $2,000 payments for people in a pandemic. A progressive proposal started with progressives back in March. I don't believe that Georgia or any state, frankly, um, is a state where progressive values can't win. And I think if you talk about real issues, if you talk about real pe where people are, real people, I think it can be unifying. And I think the fact that you've got two Republicans who were bolstered by Trump, who stood with Trump, uh, are now finding themselves not in uh, the strongest position that they want to be, I think the fact that, that the fact remains that progressive values can win everywhere and prog progressive candidates can win. And so I'm excited um, that we're seeing that result tonight so far. Yvette, thanks so much. Sarah Fagan, I'd like to bring you back in here. When you think about the, the, the position of this moment uh, that we're in with uh, ahead of tomorrow's certification and the, the seeds of distrust that, uh, that President Trump has sown as far as uh, democracy, especially in Georgia, do you feel in some ways that, that President Trump has sabotaged his own party? I think that the results are going to ultimately show that. Uh, you know, there's there'll be many factors as to why Republicans lose if, in fact, that's what happens here. But the biggest fact, I think, will be the distraction. Rather than talking about Bernie Sanders being the budget chairman, card check coming to the Senate, um, you know, potential uh, tax increases, minimum wage, which many people agree with, but others understand is is flawed economic policy. That's the debate Republicans needed to have and to make very clear that uh, if they don't have control of the Senate, these are the policies coming to America. That was talked about to some degree, but what was talked about much more was a fight within the Republican Party. Donald Trump attacking the governor, attacking the secretary of state. Uh, uh, the senators, Kelly Loeffler was uh, somewhat vocal uh, in criticizing her own fellow Republicans in the state of Georgia. That creates division, and you know, if there are two or three or six thousand Republicans on the fence, that could matter. And you know, I think what's so concerning to me as I look at these numbers is that local race, that statewide uh, local race, where the individual is outperforming Senate candidates. That almost never happens. Uh, that means something. Uh, that's telling us something. That's a factor. And so I think. You know, when you look back, uh, there's going to be a lot of debate about whether Donald Trump is causing the problems or whether he's creating high turnout. I think there's a little bit of both, but probably he's going to get a lot of blame tomorrow. All right. Thanks so much, Sarah. Heidi Heidkamp, like to bring you back in here. Uh, we heard from Gabe Sterling just a little while ago, of course, a Republican top election official there in Georgia. And he was saying that the results are, are leaning uh, Democrat at best. Uh, earlier tonight, you talked about the, the Stacey Abrams effect. What else do you think has, has changed here in Georgia? Well, the demographics clearly have changed. Um, more and more people are moving to Atlanta. More and more people are moving to Georgia. It's becoming a tech center, becoming a media center. Um, and so it's a completely different place than it was 30 years ago. But let me tell you, here's the theory of the Democrats' case. 
you're suffering. Our own exit polls, ABC exit polls, said that over two-thirds of Georgians say they are suffering economically because of the pandemic. And then you take two millionaires, in fact, one billionaire, who then uses their position to basically uh, uh, make uh, stock trades and benefit themselves, but won't give you $2,000. And so the races are about comparisons. They're about choices between two candidates. If you want to look at why I think the statewide candidate running for the Public Service Commission does so much better, it's because people didn't trust the two senators, not just because of Trump. And, and the other important thing is, why didn't Purdue debate? I mean, he had a chance to take the stage to make his argument, and he couldn't do it because um, uh, Osloff held him accountable for these stock trades every time he stood there. And so I think that this played a huge role in the decisions that Georgians made tonight. And I think um, along with just an incredible turnout, Stacey did a great job, but she also did a great job, and so did the Democrats, on staying on message. This is about Georgians. This is about how you're hurting, and these people are exploiting their position for their own personal gain. Heidi, thanks so much. Steve Osen, Sami, like to bring you back in. You've been talking all day about how easy it was to vote in Georgia, even in the blue counties. And uh, perhaps it sounds like Republicans are already um, in the throes of creating some new rules, uh, particularly as it pertains to absentee ballots if you don't have a good excuse. Absolutely. We all know that the mail-in vote was hugely significant in not only the November election, but also this one. We're seeing that already. It's made it easier for people on the blue team to vote. We saw record numbers of people in the middle of this pandemic using the mail-in vote, and we saw what happened. Joe Biden was able to win this state. Uh, there were a lot of factors, of course, that contributed to that, but the mail-in vote was hugely significant. Well, Republicans in this state have already taken an eye to that. Uh, in the name of security, we are going to be expecting from the Republican legislature here new rules on mail-in voting. For example, right now you don't need an excuse to uh, get an absentee vote. You're probably going to need one next go-round. There are going to be tougher rules in terms of identification. Uh, a, a number of different rules that will be coming to perhaps make it more difficult in the eyes of some people for people to use the mail-in vote. And there's there's one thing that I, I, I want to point point out, um, in having watched these elections for many years and, and watched the number of runoffs in this state that I have, and that is that no matter how these results shake out tonight, and, and, and right now these races are tight, no matter how they shake out tonight, something clear has happened. The fact that we are even talking about Democrats possibly winning a runoff election in the state of Georgia, which means you had to get Democratic voters to vote twice, the fact that we're even talking about Democrats even in the running of possibly winning is a major shift in this state where if you had asked me two years ago, I would have told you that right off the bat before even knowing the candidates that neither Democrat had a chance. That's usually the story in Georgia, and that is not what we're seeing tonight. Lindsay? A different story altogether. Steve Osen, Sami, thank you so much for your reporting. Tom. All right, well, our coverage is going to wrap up right now of this broadcast, but we're going to have continuing coverage on ABC News Live with our partners at WSB, our powerhouse station there in Atlanta. We are expecting the Reverend Raphael Warnock to speak very shortly. We're going to have updates, of course, on Nightline, GMA tomorrow morning, and here on ABC News Live, we will bring you that joint session of Congress. We will have it all right here on ABC News Live. I'm Tom Yamas for Lindsey Davis and all of us here at ABC News. We thank you for watching. are we? And I don't think we will. We're encouraged by the early returns, and I think we're on track to have a good evening. Hopefully we can get it done earlier so we can truly celebrate here together as a, as a good family of people who love one another. On behalf of David and Kelly, I too want to thank each of you. When you give your hearts 
and your reputation to candidates, that's something special. Your time, your money, and your efforts, that will never be forgotten. I can recall the faces of people who worked for me when I was running for office, and I, every decision I made, I would see those faces that worked so hard, put their life on the line, and allowed me to borrow their reputation when Georgia really didn't know who I was. Kelly and David Something feel special. the same way. Many your of time, you know your money, them, and, they and your know efforts, you, and many out that there will never be forgotten. I can recall so the faces of people who they are grateful worked for, for me when I was running for and office, your efforts and I, every decision. Really, you didn't have to do it. And uh, we cherish our need to borrow their reputation when Georgia really didn't know who I was. Kelly and David feel the same way. Many of you know them and they know you and many out there that they don't know who have worked so hard for them. They are grateful for your participation and your efforts on their behalf. Really, you didn't have to do it. And uh, we cherish our state. I'm, uh, I'm rather sad as you are that we're in this position where the eyes of uh, the world and literally the eyes of America are on Georgia in this important runoff. But folks, this is the this is for all the marbles. We love the freedom that we've had. We've loved the, the state that we live in as Ginger Parade, and we thank the opportunity for being here in Georgia. And we want to make sure that we send David Perdue and Kelly Leffler back so that we can continue to enjoy the freedoms that we've had in this country. Governor Kemp also spoke in support of his fellow, fellow Republicans. Here's part of what he had to say this evening. I also want to mention how much I have enjoyed fighting with David Perdue. You know, David was on the bus tour with us back in 2018, trying to, you know, save the soul of our state, as we said, at every stop. We went to 90 in the last three weeks of the campaign, and David, family, and others were on those bus, it, it, many of those bus stops. And since I became governor, I've had the opportunity to work with him a lot, especially on the Hurricane Michael relief that Senator Perdue really led the charge on in Washington with the Secretary at SDA and the Ag Department, our Ag Commissioner Gary Black, but it was David that was on the ground every day up there in D.C. And I know a lot of people here wondered sometimes why they didn't see him that much, but it's because he was taking our priorities to the halls of Congress and to the White House to get help for our farmers. And I'll be forever grateful, and our state will as well, for the great work that he did. And as you guys know, David is a, he's an outsider. He's a business guy. He has taken that mentality to Washington, D.C., which is why he built such a powerful relationship with the president, because he's exactly the same way, an outsider, a business guy. And they all went up there and were fighting the swamp. And I want to thank David for that as well, and the president as well. But I was also honored to appoint someone to the United States Senate when another great Georgian and a great American, Johnny Isaacson, decided to retire. And there's not a finer man that served the Republican Party in Georgia in politics than Johnny Isaacson, I will tell you that. Now having a look at the latest numbers coming in, and here it is, 2.819 million votes for uh, Senator David Perdue, and it is challenged Democrat John Ossett. 2.187. So here we are less than 2,000 votes apart separating these men. It is going to be close. Uh, we're likely not going to know for some time the results on that one. Now, as we look at the other race tonight, notice here you have the Democrat, Raphael Warnock, in the lead, but it's also quite thin. Not as close as the other race, but it's 2.205 million uh, with the Warnock lead over 2.170171 million. Lee Leffler to these Fine numbers come in. Let me add here, Justin uh, George, uh, with Raphael Warnock in the lead right now. 99% of the precincts reporting, of course, absentee ballots still have to be 
Utah State, constantly a retro air, become the first black U.S. senator from the state of Georgia? No question. In a place of short, shortly, that would be the headline, Javita. And again, so many votes yet to be counted. And that's why we are all here for you with live results and in-depth coverage from our team of reporters and our experts. And we also are expecting to hear from Warnock in a few minutes. So we'll take that, uh, take you to that when it happens. Leffler is having an in-person viewing party tonight. Uh, the Republicans did in Buckhead. Channel 2's Richard Elliott continues our live team two coverage now from that watch party at the Grand Hyatt. And Richard, it appears someone getting ready to speak at this hour. That, that's exactly what is happening right now. Let's swing over and see uh, the stage and the podium there. Uh, the one man who's been coming out and wiping down the microphone in between the two speakers, he came out and did that. The crowd has moved forward to the stage as if to anticipate uh, some kind of remarks from Kelly Leffler. We were told uh, earlier tonight he was going to come out at about the same time that Brian Kemp. Here we go. So we're going to hear first from uh, former Georgia governor and current agriculture secretary, Sonny Perdue, going to come out and make some remarks now. Obviously, uh, you can here just a second, but I want to, on behalf of David, so again, thank each and every one of you. You know how close it is. It looks like we're not going to know the final result tonight. We've got ballots out, 17,000 overseas military ballots to come in on Friday. And uh, we're still in this. And very hopeful and praying for a great outcome. But once again, God bless you folks. Thank you so much. You laid it everything. We left everything on the field. Proud of you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless it. Go. So that was uh, former Georgia Governor and Burn Ag Secretary Purdue coming out saying it's a theme that they've uh, been saying most of the night tonight. They didn't leave anything out on the field, on the campaign field, trying to turn these to vote. So he said that we're going to have uh, Kelly left. We don't know exactly when that is to be. As I said earlier, we expected to hear from her uh, earlier tonight uh, when uh, Senator Ed Redkamp first made their remarks along with the Georgia GOP chair, David Schaefer. Then they were told me... Uh, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome to the stage. Here we go. Kelly and, and here is Kelly Leffler going to address this crowd. Well, good morning, Georgia. <laughs> yes, it's going to be another late night. There are a lot of votes out there, as y'all know. We have a and we're staying on it. I, that's right. I love you guys. Thank you so much. And I want to thank each and every one of you. Every phone call, every door knock, every conversation, every yard sign. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. You know, it took every single person in this room to get where we are right now. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. We got lots of thanks to go out, but we got some work to do here. This is a game of inches. We're going to win this election. We're going to save this country. That's right. That's right. We're going to win Georgia and save America. But you know what? It was very clear. Our election was a choice. It was a choice between the path towards socialism. You know, it was very obvious. My opponent campaigned on a, a platform of high taxes, socialism, government control of our health care, uh, stopping our school choice for our children. My campaign's about saving our country, fighting for the American dream. You know, that's right. It's about this generation and future generations. So, you know, it's worth it for this campaign to last in tomorrow. We're going to get every vote is coming. Every, that's right. <laughs> every, every vote will be counted. And I'm not going to stop working. Uh, in the morning, in fact, I'm going to be heading to Washington, D.C. to keep fighting. That's right. We're going to fight for this president. 
So I'm asking for every single Georgian, every single American, stay in the fight with us. We are going to keep fighting for you. This is about protecting the American dream. I'm never going to stop fighting for this country, for the American dream, for each one of you, so that every Georgian has a voice in Washington. I work for you. I don't owe anyone up there anything. We're going to get this done. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless Georgia. We're going to get this done. Thank you. Those were remarks from Senator Kelly Leffler, not definitely not a concession speech. She said that they do believe they do have a path for victory. Uh, I think at the last count I saw they were still some 30, 35,000 votes short of Raphael Warnock. She did again say there is some kind of path for victory. So uh, what will happen over the next uh, 24 hours, 48 hours, and further on during the week. That's what's happening here in Buckhead. Uh, we're live, Richard Elliott, WSB Tonight. All right, Richard, thank you. And of course, uh, she said it's going to be a long night. No one ready to call it quiz just yet. The Democrat Raphael Warnock, as you know, trying to unseat Leffler. As Richard mentioned, George, uh, he is in the lead by about some 35,000 votes. He also led Leffler uh, back in November, which got us to this runoff. We are expecting to hear from uh, Reverend Warnock any minute now. Yes, that is correct. As a matter of fact, Jovita, you were talking about the, the tight race. I'm looking at the big board right there to my right. 4,400,000 votes have been cast in that race. Incredible. Incredible. They're separated by 35,000 votes. Let's go to Channel 2. Sophia Troy continues a live Team 2 coverage now at 1224 in the morning. She's covering the Democratic candidate from Northeast Atlanta. I'm here at Ebenezer Baptist Church where Warnock has served as the senior pastor since 2005. In a one-on-one -on -one interview today, I asked him, what his role will be here at this church if he wins the Senate runoff tonight. Reverend Raphael Warnock took a bus tour today attending rallies like this one in Cobb. Are you ready to win this election? Due to COVID, Warnock is not holding a traditional campaign party tonight. We spoke to him by telephone. What we've got to do is keep people safe. That's the main thing. And so I'll gather tonight with a few family members. Warnock refused interviews today. He's too busy. Reach voters like Alvin. This is the most hard race in my time of 66 years old. Here in Marietta, Warnock spoke to labor union members of a local IBEW, some of his staunch supporters. The preacher knows when he's preaching to the choir. His message to them, he understands their pain. Struggling families. Working families. Need somebody in Washington, D.C. who will be thinking about them. Some of the security officers around here told me they were expecting possible demonstrations, maybe even protests, but we've seen none of that. In Northeast Atlanta, Sophia Choi, WSB Tonight. All right, Sophia, following this race, if you're just joining us, this is WSB Tonight here as we move into Wednesday morning. And look at this race. It is Senator David Perdue right now uh, leading by, what is that, about 1,500 votes is all that separates these two, David Perdue and John Ossoff, the challenger. And so, look, here's the thing. If they finish within a half point of one another, then the, uh, the, person who's, the person who's not in the lead has the right to ask for that, and then it would not cost their campaign. If they're within two percentage points, then the challenger, so to speak, could ask for that recount, and then the campaign would be responsible for paying for the cost associated with the recount. Here is far, far from Channel Tuesday. Dave Hutt continues live team now with the latest from the Purdue campaign. And uh, what's the mood there? Because it's been a bit of a roller coaster in the day. Oh, my goodness, to say the very least, Justin, I have been texting uh, Senator Purdue staff right now just trying to find out, okay, Senator uh, Leffler has spoke. When is Senator Purdue going to speak? And the response to me was, Secretary Purdue, Sonny Purdue's comments are probably best for your broadcast. Next thing again, I'll see what he has to say. I say, so that's a no, and he goes, no. So I do not believe at this point that uh, Senator Purdue will speak to the crowd tonight uh, because, again, this has been going back and forth all evening. He is not here 
he would be speaking to us here virtually because he and his wife are in quarantine because they were exposed to COVID last week. So I do not believe at this point, I would wait to try to get a little bit more clarification, a definitive, uh, but uh, it looks like Senator Perdue will not be speaking to the crowd tonight. Senator or uh, Secretary Perdue, his cousin, Sonny Perdue, the uh, first Republican governor in a long time here in the state of Georgia and the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture spoke twice tonight saying that, uh, that we are still in this. And he thanked the crowd earlier for all of their support. He said, we knew this was going to be a tough race. We knew it was not going to be We thank you all for uh, coming out and supporting us and helping Purdue family, helping the Leffler family take this ball, uh, take this ball across the finish line, even if I may not arrive until sometime tomorrow. So we will stay here. I will try to get some clarification from the uh, Purdue campaign to find out exactly if he is not or if I want Secretary Purdue's comments to probably be best for our broadcast, as, uh, as he said in this text here, reporting live from Buckhead, Dave Huddleston, WSB Tonight. All right, Dave, thank you. Now to uh, John Ossoff's campaign. Channel 2's Lori Wilson continues our live Team 2 coverage. She's been in touch with his campaign throughout the day and this evening. Lori? Yeah, Joe Vita, but uh, right now at this hour, 1228 uh, in the morning, we are still hearing from the campaign that John Ossoff does not plan to make any comments tonight. Uh, you know, Ossoff, I did speak with him earlier today, and he talked about how critical voter turnout was going to be. And as we're watching these election results come in tonight, uh, we know that that is uh, very true. Uh, we are waiting. Uh, some, In some cases, they're so, so close, uh, especially these uh, this particular runoff race showing just how divided um, Georgians are right now. But when I spoke with Ossoff, he talked about one of his main priorities being reuniting not just Georgians, but Americans. We can reunite this country behind the cause of defeating COVID-19. We are not one another's enemies. We're all in this together. We're just not being reminded of that sufficiently by our present political leadership. And Ossoff saying that one of his first priorities, if he were to become part of a Democrat uh, majority said it would be to get those $2,000 stimulus checks in the hands of Americans. Lori Wilson, live in Cobb County for WSB Tonight. All right, Lori, thank you so much. Back here at the big board, it is about 1230 in the morning. I want to show you how close these races are. Then we're going to bring in Bill. First up, here it is, 50 percent, 50 percent. What separates them is just over a thousand votes. I'm going to click on this next 50%, 9.6%. What separates them? That's a little bit closer. It's about 30 something thousand votes. Let's go ahead and show you this one thing. Let's bring in Bill Crane while I do this. Excuse my back for everyone at home, but this is important, Bill. Watch what I'm going to do, Bill. Look at these numbers down here and everyone. I'm going to go around the metro. I'm going to hit Bartow County. These are counties that are 100% and they're typically red. Look at this number for Purdue, 100% for Cherokee, 100% for 100% for Hull, 100% for Walton. Take a look at these numbers. Butts, 100%. Take a look at Spalding, 100%. Huge numbers. But now when you go on the inside, now look at this number for Ossoff, 100%. Cobb, sure. But take a look at Fulton, almost at 100%. And then we have Douglas, but look at what happens with DeKalb, 87%. Then take a look here, Gwinnett, 100% as well. So the Metro is now reporting, but the difference, Bill, and explains this to people at home, the difference with the Metro having 10% left or 13%, that's a number in an out red county, correct? Cab County had half the votes cast. Still out, it's going to be somewhere between 60,000s. That's a bigger splash that's left in Roman County and some of the Republican counties. So as we as the numbers have closed up and the counties have come in, the Republicans did do what they needed to do in those Republican counties in terms of the percentages. The question is, did they get those raw votes? Because there's a larger number of raw voters, particularly in DeKalb, Cobb, Gwinnett, and Fulton. And we Ex still have absentee ballots to count in all four of those counties. Explain well. the raw vote and that ratio that you were talking about, because we're seeing what we saw in November. Explain that. It's very similar to where we were a little earlier on election night in November, where towards the end of the evening when most of the counties were shutting down tabulation, the 
president's margin of victory had shrunk down to about 40,000 votes. And as we went into the overnight hours and those Metro votes continued to come in, by the next day, Joe Biden around 3 o'clock in the afternoon surpassed the president. What we're seeing now is what's left is a smaller universe, but it's three of the large metro urban counties and about six other counties, two or three of which are Republican, two or three of which are Democratic. When you have a county like DeKalb with half a million votes, that's equivalent to about 10 of the major next tier size of counties. So Bibb County is about 100,000 in Macon and Bibb County. That's the next largest after the metro county. That's another Democratic stronghold. So what remains to be tabulated thus far this evening has come in decidedly Democratic, which should say that except for Bubba McDonald's race, which he's the Republican incumbent on the Public Service Commission, who's been leading by a larger margin most of the evening, we'll probably see a swing overnight until they resume tabulation in the morning towards John Ossoff and towards Reverend Raphael Warnock based on the size of the counties that still have vote out. Now take a look at this map here. What I've done is I've done map to map. This is this live data, this race. You have Warnock and Leffler. Look at this percentage here. People at home, 83.2%, the Democrat here, 82.5%, the Democrat here. I continue, 16.8%, the Republican in DeKalb, and 17.5%, the Republican in DeKalb, Purdue and Leffler. What does this tell you? So are we back to, if you voted blue, you voted blue. If you voted red, you voted red all the way down. Well, it seems like there was at least, we know, in the straight ticket voting category, there were people who chose not to be Republican nominees who dropped down to that third position and did vote for Bubba McDonald, whether that's in protest of the actions of Donald Trump or perhaps in reaction to them taking the support of the, the Congress to oppose or to challenge the results of the Electoral College of Georgia. We don't know. We don't have that kind of exit polling data. But it's very unusual for someone down ballot to get more votes than the top of the ticket candidate, and that certainly happened tonight. All right, Bill Crane, our political expert. We're not going anywhere, so hopefully you can stick around. We'll check back with you. Thank you so much. Let's go to Justin. Thank you, gentlemen. State authorities telling us they investigated a possible attempted cyber attack on the elections. Channel 2 investigative reporter Mark Winnie with us for the latest on this. So, Mark, you got the exclusive access to the security operation. And for folks who may be joining us tonight for the first time, hearing some of your reporting, uh, how serious uh, was this in, in terms of how far it got? Well, actually, I've got an expert with us, uh, Gabriel Sterling, who we've heard from a lot tonight. But for weeks and weeks, uh, we've been talking to uh, uh, Gabriel Sterling and others at the second. Kind of deeply uh, in Georgia uh, soil. Access to, uh, a child who grew up uh, in the Caton uh, Homes housing uh, projects uh, of Savannah, Georgia. Number 11 out of 12 children a proud graduate of Morehouse College and the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, the spiritual home of Martin Luther King Jr. and Congressman John Lewis. A son of my late father, who was a pastor, a veteran, and a small businessman. And my mother, who as a teenager growing up in Waycross, Georgia, used to pick somebody else's cotton. But the other day, because this is America. The 82-year-old hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton went to the polls and picked her youngest son to be a United States Senator. So I come before you tonight as a man who knows that the improbable journey that led me to this place in this historic moment in America could only happen here. We were told that we couldn't win this election. But tonight, we prove that with hope, hard work, and the people by our side, anything is possible. May my story be an inspiration to some young person who is trying to grasp and grab hold of the American dream. And so, Georgia, I am honored by the faith that you have shown in me. And I promise you this tonight. I am going to the Senate to work for all of Georgia. No matter who you cast your vote for in this election, in this moment in American history, 
Washington has a choice to make. In fact, all of us have a choice to make. Will we continue to divide, distract, and dishonor one another? Or will we love our neighbors as we love ourselves? Will we play political games while real people suffer? Or will we win righteous fights together, standing shoulder to shoulder, for the good of Georgia, for the good of our country? Will we seek to destroy one another as enemies or heed the call towards the common good, building together what Dr. King called the beloved community? Here's what I know. I know that we can beat this pandemic with science and good old-fashioned common sense. I know we can rebuild a fairer economy by respecting the dignity of work and the workers who do it. An economy that honors those whom we now call essential workers by paying them an essential wage and providing for them essential benefits. And so to everyone out there struggling today, whether you voted for me or not, know this, I hear you, I see you. And every day I'm in the United States Senate, I will fight for you. I will fight for your family. To our supporters, our incredible campaign team, and to my family, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And to every Georgian who marched with us, organized with us, prayed for us, fought for us, believed in us, or shared their story and their pain with us, thank you for all of your love and support. In the words of Dr. King, who grew up just a few blocks from where I'm sitting right now, we are tied in a single garment of destiny. We are caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I remember my dad in this moment. He used to wake me up every morning at dawn. It was morning, but it was still dark. It's dark right now. But morning comes, and scripture tells us that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Let us rise up, greet the morning, and meet the challenges of this moment. Together we can do the necessary work and win the future for all of our children. Thank you. God bless you, Georgia, and God bless these United States of America. From where I'm sitting right now, we are tied in a single garment of destiny. We are caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I remember my dad in this moment. He used to wake me up every morning at dawn. It was morning, but it was still dark. It's dark right now. And scripture tells us that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Let us rise up greet the morning and meet the challenges of this moment. Together we can do the necessary work and win the future for all of our children. Thank you. God bless you, Georgia. And God bless these United States of America. And you've been listening to, you've been listening to Raphael Warnock uh, delivering uh, Comments after he appears to have taken a, a substantial lead, wouldn't you say? 
Uh, substantial enough, yes. In, in, in view of everything that's going on, we're with Gabriel Sterling, a key elections official with the Georgia Secretary of State's office. A very important question. Based on what is outstanding now, based on what has yet to come in, is that, are those things that are going to predominantly benefit the Democratic candidates? From what we're seeing right now, the majority of the outstanding vote, the absentees and the like, will be coming from the majority. Based on population, the large city centers will be the largest amount of votes, and those tend to be Democratic, yes. So you're saying that the, the chances of the Republican senatorial candidates pulling this out, including David Perdue, because the Purdue Ossoff race is is significantly closer. It's looking more and more difficult, but again, votes have to be counted for a reason. You keep score for a reason, so there's always a possibility, but from the numbers we're looking at right now, it doesn't look good for the two incumbent Republican senators. All right, so you are a Republican, yes. correct? Yes. Uh, you're, as I think you've said, your, your role here, the Secretary of State's role, is to be the objective on your call the ball. Politics, right, yes. but you're a Republican, uh, Raphael Warnock, uh, a Democrat. He just talked about uh, loving your neighbor. He's a preacher, mm -hmm. and we soon may be calling him senator. He talked about loving your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you are going to be facing a barrage of voter fraud allegations and controversies again, aren't you? I'm, I can be that. Casablanca, I'm shocked, shocked if we will not see us be bombarded by lots of voter fraud accusations, yes. So is there something you want to say? Uh, the, the, your elections are not random people out in the world. They're run by your kids. You go to church with them. Kids go to school with them. There's thousands of good Georgians in these elections. And we've been working with we have been working very hard to put the guard up in place. We sent letters out to people who we think might not be eligible, saying you may not be eligible. You got to be careful about this. We set up the absentee ballot portal to put more guardrails around it. We've worked to make sure to allow to make sure there's challenges that are available for people who may not be eligible to vote. We've done all that we can in terms of the rules we have set. There are other things that can be done. The legislature can look at. But let me let me tell you this: this was the most secure election Georgia has ever seen. And I know that a lot of people don't want to believe that, but we have the statistical evidence to show it. In the last election, we did a hand retally showing the machines counted exactly as the ballots were cast. We did a signature audit in Cobb County showing that out of 15,118, there were only two that were questionable, and those two people actually were the intended people to vote, so there was no voter fraud there. Lots of claims, lots of continued disinformation, and we keep on knocking it down and keep on debunking it. We expect it to continue to come from the president. We expect it to come from others. But at some point, the elections are the elections, the outcomes are the outcomes. We've got to realize that in two years, you get to fight for these things again. And you know, well, I, I will agree with Reverend Warnock, and I said this in my earlier press conference, we have to learn to disagree with each other and be civil while doing it, because these are our neighbors. These are our people who we live in our communities with. You know your boss, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, uh, very well, don't you? Of course. And President Trump went after him very hard, didn't he? Yes. And Senators Perdue and Leffler is almost the first act of the runoff campaign called for his resignation, right? Yes, and I, th I think the actions of President Trump and the senators in this case may have been the impetus to cost him the potential outcome of this election today. You think that was a difference? That, that could have potentially been the difference because what happened was, normally what happens is an incumbent president loses, the people who won are happy, their, their votes depressed. The people who lose are angry and they show up and historically in 1992 and in 2004, that's what happened in Georgia. The Republicans won those Senate seats. This is the first time we've lost one. All right. Thank you, Gabriel Sterling. Reporting live, Mark Winnie, WSB, tonight. All right, Mark, you, Mark, thank you for that. Talking with Gabriel Sterling there at this hour. We thought he was done about an hour ago, but he's still there, so we appreciate that access. Uh, very quickly, let's say that if you were watching us a few minutes ago, you saw Reverend Raphael Warnock there pretty much giving his victory speech tonight, saying that he was going to Washington to fight for the people of Georgia, whether they voted for him or not. He thanked his supporters, his campaign, his family for standing by him. And then that follow when he's interviewed there with Gabriel Sterling saying that the majority of outstanding ballots tonight were coming from those heavily leaning Democratic counties. And so Sterling saying that it looked as if Warnock would be the winner uh, of that Senate race and on his way to Washington. Election workers still at the Georgia World Congress Center tonight with a huge job ahead. Yes, despite everything we've heard from candidates and from officials, they're counting absentee ballots right now. So much work to do. A record number of you voted absentee during this election cycle. A challenge 
Washington. Live Team 2 coverage. It is happening at night or early counting. Uh, Audrey, officials are saying at least 70,000 people voted in Fulton County. And that's outstanding. What do we mean by that? Uh, about 70,000 uh, voted today in Fulton County. That's according to officials. But I got to tell you guys, in about five minutes ago, in the past five minutes, I just got a new update from election workers here. They told me everything that you're seeing happening behind me, I'm going to step out just so I can show you. Uh, this is some of the activity still happening here at this hour. But election workers told me 4,000 absentee ballots are still being processed. So that's what you're seeing here. Uh, that means 4,000 absentee ballots that have not been scanned yet, haven't been uploaded. And that still has to be checked and, and gone through and everything like that. So when you think of the narrow margin between the candidates, that amount alone can make a significant difference, especially between the Ossoff and uh, Purdue race. So how long will this all go on for? I asked that specifically. They told us the cutoff time for, uh, for Fulton County is 2 a.m. They said that they hope to get all of these remaining ballots, these absentee ballots, this is not day of, ballots, meaning these are not the votes that were cast today. These are the votes that uh, were mailed in. They believe that they can get all of these ballots counted by 2 a.m., but if they do not get them counted by 2 a.m., they will stop everything happening at 2 a.m. on the dot and then resume um, at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So again, at least 4,000 absentee mail-in ballots still to be counted right here behind me in Fulton County. We appreciate that. Now our live Team 2 coverage continues. We have our teams just, you know, no one's going to bed. We're spread out all across the metro area following the candidates. And late tonight, that counting, as Audrey just reported, they're going to continue. Uh, Audrey reported another hour and 11 minutes. Now, two more candidates, which the Democrats who um, gained the U.S. Senate. Right, Justin, we're all awake and watching because it's so close we feel like it can be over any minute now. Let's begin with the race uh, between these two gentlemen you see on the screen there for U.S. Senate. David Perdue still maintaining that lead of 50.01 percent over John Ossoff. Right behind them, 49.9 percent. Uh, just a good vote separating these two 99 percent of the precincts reporting and as we've been telling you all night the those absentee ballots are being counted in many counties tonight some counting will continue tomorrow uh, and then if we look at the other race between warnock and kelly leffler uh, warnock just a few minutes ago on a web stream pretty much giving his victory for this evening 50, 41% of the vote. Kelly Leffler also behind him, 49.59% of the vote. Uh, that one also close, but Warnock leading by about some 30,000 votes. Uh, Gabriel Sterling with the Secretary of State's office saying that um, the remainder of votes to be counted were pretty much coming from Democratic-leaning counties, and so they were expecting that Warnock would be the winner. And again, he just took to a web stream to give his victory speech and thank his supporters and, and tell us all that he'd be going to Washington to fight for every Georgian. Now, Leffler tonight was having an in-person viewing party. Channel 2's Richard Elliott continues our live Team 2 coverage from that party in Buckhead. We heard her talk just a few minutes ago. Richard? Yeah, what you heard was not a concession speech. It was kind of a wait until tomorrow speech. She got up there on that stage and told the uh, audience here that she believes that she has a path to victory. She did not want that that happy. She is right around 35 votes down. To go on, we uh, would expect they would request a recount. Other things may have on the line as well. Here is supporters about an hour ago. It's worth it for this election to last. Make sure every vote, every, that's right. Back live now here at the Grand Hyatt. A lot of the people are beginning to file out now. Uh, Kelly Leffler again saying that she believed that there was some path to victory, but did not uh, give specifics as to what that path might be. Uh, we do know uh, Georgia GOP Chair David Schaefer got up here earlier tonight 
He said, uh, uh, reiterated what the, we already knew, that they had thousands of volunteers, many of them from out of state, to actually serve as poll watchers in all 159 Georgia counties, 2,700 polling places, and he said they had those observers also in the places where the votes were being counted, and they were going to watch the votes uh, being counted. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in case there are more accusations about voter fraud. Well, uh, David Schaefer said they had 8,000 poll watchers scattered all across the state of Georgia watching some of this counting. Again, Kelly Leffler saying to Vic, not laying out specifics. Uh, 35,000 uh, votes separate her and Raphael Warnock. You heard what sounded like a victory speech from him. But obviously this is uh, it's 2021, but it feels a, a lot like a continuation of 2020. So we're going to have to wait and see what happens tomorrow. We are live in Buckhead, Richard Elliott, WSB Tonight. Richard, thank you. Now, the other race, of course, we are closely watching. He's between incumbent Senator David Perdue and Democrat John Ossoff. And here's what you need to know. At this point, they're separated by 919 votes. Less than 1,000 votes separate these two. So clearly, uh, they're going to be counting every single vote, waiting on every single thing to be mailed in, and we could be heading for a recount. Time will tell. Channel 2's Dave Huddleston continues our live Team 2 coverage with the latest from the Purdue campaign, uh, also in Buckhead tonight. Dave? Yeah, Justin, they also believe they have a path to even this entire they say having those military votes that are still ballots that are still out there, uh, 17,000 military ballots, they hope that will fall into Senator Perdue's and help them. But they realize the path to victory is a tough one with lots of twists and turns. And something that I've been hearing throughout the night and that Gabe Sterling from the Secretary of State's office kind of, I guess, confirmed for us uh, during that interview with investigative reporter Mark Winnie is that if both Senators Kelly Leffler and David Perdue lose these seats, that President Donald Trump owns some of that responsibility. Uh, I've been hearing here that the talk of President Trump's uh, questions about our voting, whether it was fair, uh, has caused the party to split and some sense to go to the polls, to vote. And that may be one of the reasons that they uh, may not win the seats that they were looking for. As you can see now, turned on the house lights. Uh, uh, here at the Grand Hyatt, kind of wrapping up this watch party for Senator Perdue and Senator Kelly Leffler. Uh, but we are still here. Some of the uh, supporters are still here. Just a handful, not many of them. Uh, more media, obviously, than uh, supporters for the senators at this point. Uh, the senator is not speaking tonight. I asked his staff, will he speak tomorrow? They did not respond to my text. Reporting live from Buckhead, Dave Huddleston, WSB Tonight. And now to John Ossoff's campaign, uh, campaign. Channel 2's Lori Wilson continues our live Team 2 coverage. She's been in touch with his campaign throughout the night. Lori? And you know, ever since this election runoff, both of them were announced. John Ossoff and Reverend Raphael Warnock have made almost every move together. Tonight, we're seeing a departure. Ossoff's campaign has said he will not be speaking tonight. Obviously, this race uh, entirely too close for them to feel comfortable calling. Uh, I did speak with him one-on-one -on -one earlier today, or Tuesday, rather. It was very calm. But both he and Reverend Warnock would win. But again, we are still just in the mode to wait and see. Lori Wilson for WSB Tonight. All right, Lori, thank you. Of course, tomorrow we'll be watching uh, and probably hearing much more from all of these candidates. Justin? Yeah, we're going to take a quick break right here. Our live Team 2 coverage continues at WSB Tonight slash this morning. <laughs> hey, yeah, I'm talking... Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matata. Ismail. David. David. Over ground zero. Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David. It's me, too. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? To figure out what's really out there. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? To figure out what's really out there. COVID-19. What can you do to help protect yourself? Where can you get your questions answered? The new daily podcast from ABC News with Dr. Jeff. Officially one o'clock in the morning, the day after the Senate runoff here in Georgia, and we are still going because there are decisions to be made. Thank you for sticking around. I'm George Estevez. Decisions to be made, George, but you know, most of the national pundits have called it for the night, but we are still here bringing you what's happening here in Georgia as we continue to watch numbers come in. I'm Jovita Moore. Great to see everyone. Uh, I'm Justin Farmer. Our whole team has been working throughout this day. It's really been astounding. And check this out, you guys. When we look at these races, here's how close things are. You have a 919 vote. It's in 919 vote lead right now for Senator David Perdue, the Republican over Democrat challenger John Ossoff. So that's a long way from being finished. Now, the other one, Javita, is not quite as tight. Mm -hmm. That's right. So let's take a look now. Raphael Warnock just within the hour declaring victory here tonight. 50.4% of the vote over uh, Kelly Leffler's 49.5%. Uh, lots of votes cast there, but there was a difference of about 30, 35,000. 99% uh, uh, of the precincts reporting by midnight. We do know that absentee ballots still outstanding in many counties across uh, the state, but those counties considered to be heavily Democratic, and most of those uh, absentee ballots are pretty much decided that they would be going to Warnock. So he has declared victory. He says he's going to Washington to fight for all of the people of Georgia. 
Yes, a closer race for Ossoff when talking about Ossoff v. Purdue. But again, so many votes still out there. And as that number, Jovita and Justin, next to 99% of the precincts reporting, some absentees are still outstanding in both of these races, Jovita. And we're still here watching the numbers come in because at one point everyone was thinking that they were going to be wrapped up by about 2 a.m. So we figured that's not too late. We'll <laughs> stay on the air and see what happens. Channel 2's Matt Johnson continues our live Team 2 coverage now. He's at the center of it all, or the place that's the center of it all, is the Secretary of State's Command Center. Matt, what can you tell us tonight? Well, Jovita, a handful of the Secretary of State's uh, office staffers have gone home for the night, but there are still votes being counted across the state. They are hoping to have a better understanding of how many remain by tomorrow afternoon. But still, uh, as some of the larger counties still have some votes to, to count, uh, there are still a skeleton, screw, skeleton crew of uh, Secretary of State staffers uh, who will be here working through the night. Now, you heard uh, Reverend Warnock give what appeared to be a victory speech, but the other race between John Ossoff and David Perdue is much tighter. That's why officials, election officials uh, in Georgia here are preparing for the chance of maybe another recount. Uh, but listen to what Gabe Sterling had to say about just how close that race might be. And there's a potential where some of these elections could be within a half a point. So the second place finisher will have the opportunity to potentially ask for a recount again. So the Secretary of State's office, of course, has been through a lot since November. There have been uh, two recounts, uh, three total counts of the presidential vote. So they're prepared for anything. They're also prepared for possibly a new wave of misinformation coming as we wait to uh, certify these results. So election officials here have been through a lot. Elections workers across the state have been through a lot as well. Everybody just waiting until this is over, but we still may not get all the answers we're looking for until tomorrow or later today at the earliest and possibly later in the week. So a lot of work still to be done after today and possibly well into the week. Uh, live in Atlanta, Matt Johnson, WSB Tonight. Matt, thank you. Now, Channel 2's Nicole Carr continues our live Team 2 coverage from Fulton County's election warehouse in northwest Atlanta. Does the counting continue there, Nicole? Honestly. Yeah, and you know, we're talking about these absentee ballots just around midnight is when I confirmed with a Fulton County spokesperson that they had some election a worker and county staff member uh, harassment at absentee ballot boxes. You'll remember earlier in the evening we were talking about the numbers and what's been processed and how that did not include uh, what was at the drop boxes. Well, at 7 o'clock, county staff member goes to a drop box. This is all according to the spokesperson goes to the drop box to lock up as being told we're, we're taking video of you that county staff person was followed a separate two-person crew that comes out of this warehouse uh, had gone to do the ballot pickup and uh, that crew was also followed to the georgia world congress center we know that's where we saw audrey washington earlier in the day we know that's where the absentee ballots are processed uh, when they were followed into a parking deck that's where police met the crew and so that was broken up there uh, so, so two confirmed instances of election worker harassment that they've dealt with uh, that may have held up getting some of those ballots into the hands of the workers who are still working at the Georgia World Congress Center and whatever leaves there you know comes here for the final count uh, we have expected to be here until about two o'clock in the morning don't know how much of an impact this would have I'm sure the elections director Rick Barron will be talking more about this um, in, in the next 24 hours, but that was something that we just learned after midnight and we'll continue to follow and get more details on that. But yeah, they are still uh, full steam ahead here, uh, observers around here, media still here, county workers and lots more security. We've been talking about that as well. We're, we've seen a lot more security and check-in and measures in place here at the warehouse, lots more than the general election uh, when we were also camped out here. So. Again, just a few details we're getting about uh, the chain of custody and what happened with, with folks at these election workers uh, this evening as they went to those ballot drop boxes to pick up what was dropped off today. I'll send it back to you guys live in Atlanta. Nicole Carr, WSB Tonight. Well, we are definitely live, Nicole. It is 1 o'clock in the morning. We're live covering all the action here. Back at the big board because I just, we're going to bring in Bill Crane in a second. I want to talk about these numbers. Take a look right here. We have 50% and 50%. How often do you see this on election night? 
Probably not often. For what separates these guys, about 1,200 votes. I'm going to click on the Warnock and Leffler race. Take a look at this, 50.4, 49.6. What separates these guys? About 35, 36,000. Let's go ahead and bring in political analyst Bill Crane. Bill, uh, we're glad you stuck around because what Nicole was talking about is those drop boxes. What we were talking about earlier, Bill Crane, is the fact that there's some absentee voting out there. What we're talking about earlier is the fact there's military votes out there. So Bill, what is out there? Where is it leaning? You heard Gabe Sterling pretty much say, not looking too good for the Republicans. What do you think? larger number of drop boxes in counties like Fulton and DeKalb, where, as she, Nicole just mentioned, they're still picking those ballots up. They had to be in those boxes by 7 p.m. tonight to take them to the warehouse to be processed, which means opened, flattened, and scanned. And then they go to the counting center where they are actually tabulated. But those 4,000 ballots that dropped in earlier from Fulton County, there's more that are coming in today. There's a, probably a like number in DeKalb. Those two counties are voting in favor of the Democratic candidates in the 70 to DeKalb, 82% range. Those numbers will continue to run up the, the margin for Raphael Warnock over Kelly Leffler and could put John Ossoff back in the winner's column, but still within the margin of error of half a percent. So there will be a, a request for a recount. And we don't know on those 17,000 military ballots how those will be split. Those will not be available until Friday, which is also the deadline for absentee ballots that have any trouble to be cured. If an absentee ballot is scanned tonight or tomorrow until 1 p.m. and there's an issue with it, it's not signed. It's dated incorrectly. The address doesn't match exactly. A middle initial or a first name are different. The, that voter is notified by the election superintendent's office and they have three days to correct that for that ballot to be tabulated. On the Democratic side, Fair Fight Georgia and Georgia Votes are working literally picking up those lists on a daily basis. And if some cases going to the voters' households, there is no comparative organization on the GOP side. All right, so right now, uh, my back's to the camera because I'm actually going ahead and taking a look at DeKalb County for both these races. 2021 live results, 88% DeKalb County results precincts reporting. And we have this number right here. 82.5 to 17.5. When I go to the other race over here with 88% reporting in DeKalb County, we have 83 to 16. The numbers are supposed to do what they're doing. Tell us, what does 12% more votes in DeKalb mean for these well, races? It does depend on where the precincts are that are outstanding. A precinct in Dunwoody doesn't necessarily vote at the same as a precinct in Lithonia or Stonecrest. But the county, overwhelmingly, with the exception of the northern suburbs up around Dunwoody and Brookhaven is going in the Democratic column. So we don't know where those 12% precincts remaining are or the absentee ballots that haven't been pulled in yet. But the county is trending overwhelmingly it, by the largest margin in the state, more than 80% towards the Democratic candidates. So the bulk of those ballots as they come in will go in those columns. All right, so is that why, Bill, we saw what we can only describe as some sort of acceptance speech from Raphael Warnock and nothing from John Ossoff. Explain what we saw there. Well, I, it looked like it was probably taped earlier and maybe he had two speeches, one for a victory speech, one for a concession. I don't know, but it did look like that had been put together earlier and wasn't live. When I'm sure they had a threshold they were looking for, 30,000 votes is more than a half a percentage point with 4 million votes cast. As long as they're on the upside of that, closer to one or two percentage points, and they're not that far ahead, with more ballots still out that'll come in their favor, there's that comfort level. I would have suggested if I was the campaign consultant, they would might have waited a little bit more, thanked all of the voters and supporters where they are right now, and says it looks really good that this time next week, I'll be talking to you from Washington, and then back talking with my parishioners on Sunday. I, I think you also want to give your opponent the opportunity to concede and there are still ballots being counted. Again, and they will be counted tonight, tomorrow, and for days to come. It looks like Bill Crane put you on standby. Thank you so much for that conversation and for that analysis. Take Justin. care. Now let's take a chance to get back live to Channel 2's Mark Winnie, who is with the Secretary of State's office tonight, and Gabriel Sterling, who maybe had visions of going to bed a couple of hours ago, but it's just not going to happen. <laughs> we have close races. Mark Winnie. Yeah, actually, Gabriel Sterling was, uh, I think he was in his car. Uh, <laughs> but uh, listen, uh, so uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock gave what probably sounded to uh, many people like uh, a victory speech. Um, 
Senator Kelly Leffler just minutes before that uh, seemed pretty clear in sending a signal she wasn't conceding. But one of the things that Reverend Warnock said, he quoted the scripture, joy comes in the morning. When do you think definitive results will come? I think we'll have enough results in probably by lunch tomorrow. So it will be in the morning that we'll see the final amounts. That's not to say there will be ballots outstanding, but I think looking at what's out, the potential margins will mean we'll probably have a really clear idea by lunch tomorrow who won and who lost these races. Uh, in other words, a definitive view of uh, the winners and the losers for most people. Uh, definitely. But controversy, without a doubt, will continue. Anytime there's a race this close, um, people are going to uh, I have honest questions to ask when it's that close. All right, so what kinds of ballots are, are still outstanding? The biggest chunk we've seen, we know there's a big chunk in the cab, about 18,000 advance votes. Then we have an unknown amount of absentee ballots that came in today. We know that there's an outward bound each one of those. I think Fulton had 4,000 come in today that I might have been more than that. I know they're still working. They, they just knocked off a couple of minutes ago. They're going to come back in at 8 in the morning. We know there's a certain amount that came in and chat them, but they have two split boards. We really only work with one of them and directly in terms of the vote counting. So we'll have an answer on that in Savannah. So mainly it's going to be the absentees that came in today that we're going to see coming in. Now, don't forget, we also have the absentees that can be cured if there's a signature issue mm -hmm. or the, the provisionals that can be verified. And all that can be done by Friday. And of course, the one everybody asks about is the military and overseas ballots that if they are post mark today they are accepted through friday close of business and there will also be some provisional ballots and a handful right? of provisional ballots any of those expected to change the the character of and, and it's not over till it's over right but any of those in your experience expected to change the character of where we see the results right now well in general what you're going to see is the absentee ballots are going to follow along population lines so with the population centers Atlanta, Augusta, uh, Macon, Columbus, Savannah tend to be Democrat strongholds. So the absentee ballots that we expect to see will likely lean more Democratic. Now, there's lots of other counties that are around, but they had so few of them, they were able to count to finish them tonight. So we won't see the corresponding more rural counties that have the Republican votes to balance those out as they come in through, through the morning tomorrow. And refresh our viewers on how a recount can happen. If a candidate is within a half a percent of the final results, they have the right to ask for a recount that is done through rescanning the actual physical ballots, all of them. Particularly Purdue Ossoff, do you think that it's foreseeable that may be within a half a percent? Of the three races, that is the most likely to be within a half a percent, yes. And, and we anticipate whoever comes in second right now, it looks like it might be Senator Purdue. We can't tell for certain. Either way, Ossoff or Purdue, whoever's in second, if they're within a half a percent, they will have that right under Georgia law to ask for that recount. What can you say, and, and we've asked you these kind of questions a lot in recent weeks, what can you say to assure Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents that this election runoff was handled fairly and securely. Why should people believe in this system with all the shots that it's taken lately? Well, for the first time in 20 years, we have a paper ballot, which gives us the ability to have, can to have voters look at that ballot, hold it in their hands, say, yes, I have a record of my vote. Before, the most things we were told it was was a beep, and then you said, hey, there's your vote. There was no record. Now we have a trail, and you can't hack paper. That's one of the biggest things. And when we did the review and the audit, um, but we hand tallied all five million plus ballots. It showed that without a single doubt, the machinery scanned those ballots properly and correctly. The secondary thing that's opened up on that is a signature matching, which we reminded the counties, the public process. So we had counties literally pulling their stuff out of the lobbies to allow people to watch them. Tonight, we had some counties that weren't being as transparent as we might like. So the, the, we worked with them. They also went to, had to go to a court, or the Republicans had to do that in Fulton County, and it set up some extra parameters. But they, we've tried to assure there's enough transparency and enough of a public process, and I know the Republicans and Democrats both really loaded up on observers for this time. So I anticipate, I mean, they, people should have faith in this because we've been transparent, we have a paper trail, we did audits that show that the that, that machines tally exactly as the votes were cast. And have you had any reports that any of the counties were given the observers a hard time this time around 
Um, there's a couple of reports of that. I mean, Ful Fulton, there was an argument about the distance at which they could stand to watch some of those things and some opaque barriers. They went to court this afternoon, the Republicans. They got a consent order to basically allow for closer inspection, take down the opaque barriers, which they shouldn't have had those opaque barriers at to begin with. But there's a few things here and there. But in 159 counties, you're always going to have some people who are going to be siding hev more heavily on the security side than on the transparency side. We want to uh, err on transparency when it comes to public watching this process move forward. Now, your boss, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, is planning to go to the Georgia legislature in the coming session and asking for a photo ID component to be added to the absentee ballot process. Is that correct? Correct. And we de facto have done that through the request process and the portal, which he already established. But what we want to move to is something essentially you can put your driver's license or social security number, like some states already have, to use that as your unique identifier because the issue with the signature match is it is subjective. When you have a, a unique pin ID, that is not subjective. It is objective. It is binary. Either the number matches or the number doesn't match. So we know you are who you say you are. Does that suggest that there's a gap there or is, is this redundancy? Which is it? This is more of a redundancy thing, A, and B is a confidence thing because people, the signature match has been attacked so much. And we've always thought it was subjective. We've been talking about this for over two years. But, you know, you can't get everything at once you want in a bill. We are, our big thing we had to get in HB 316 from 2019 was changing over to this particular type of ballot system, which we haven't had in 20 years in the state. Now, there, there is a, an online means uh, of... Uh, Supplanting the signature match mm -hmm. is a, 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 tell us about that that portal. Uh, the, the secretary had us build out a, a an absentee portal for online requests, and using that you can use your driver's license, first name, last name, county, and year of birth, and those are five identifying points that shows you are who you say you are. The way we would then take that same kind of data, you could do that on a paper form. You could put that in in a, in a way to co to protect the p personal private identity. And then you have to do it also for the ballot return. Right now, the ballot return is only being done with signature match. If we can find a way to keep that inside a security fold, so we can look at that and then say, yes, this is the right person, separate the ballot from that, and you have a unique identifying pin the same way you do for the request. Realistically, uh, when do you expect for this runoff election to be officially done with? Well, the law calls for the counties to be able to do their certifications by the second Tuesday after the, or second Friday after this election, which is 10 days. And the state has seven days after that. Our hope is that all the counties will get their stuff done faster than that so that we can certify the election faster than that. We would hope to have it by, done by the beginning of the week after the counties are done certifying everything. You have dozens and dozens, you meaning the Secretary of State's Office Investigations Division has dozens and dozens of investigations underway, some of them in concert with uh, the GBI uh, into allegations involving election fraud or, or other allegations, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. And you may come up with more out of this. Do you anticipate that there will be, based on what you know of where some of those investigations are going, do you anticipate that there will be recommendations made to the Georgia Attorney General's office uh, for any charges out of those? I can't know for certain, but this, at the end of the day, that is a state election board decision. Our investigators work in conjunction will bring these cases to the state election board, and they will do make the decision as to what they should do. Oftentimes, it's a, it's a letter of instruction, but if it looks like actual criminality, they can refer it to a local DA, the attorney general's office, and in some unique cases, to the U.S. attorney if there's potentially a federal issue that has been broken. If somebody had told you in October... You know, that your Republican boss, who is, uh, was a Trump contributor, right, mm -hmm. uh, would have this relationship with President Trump, uh, that you'd be standing here tonight uh, dealing with this kind of outcome, what would you have said? I said something really bizarre must have happened. But... In fact, something really bizarre didn't happen. We had a, an election in this state in a very you know, competitive state. Let's remember, two years ago, Stacey Abrams came with 50,000 votes of beating Brian Kemp for governor. This isn't a shock. Cobb County and Gwinnett County flipped. And one of the things we saw with the outcomes tonight, and this was noted by uh, 
somebody on Twitter earlier, over the last two months, we've seen the President of the United States attack Governor Kemp and Secretary Raffensperger more than he ever did Reverend Warnock or John Ossoff. Hmm. You have formerly been in the campaign business, is that right? In the past, in the past. What was going on inside you when you're watching what's unfolding, what's been unfolding? <sighs> well, it's, it's been, as, as you've seen from us, my press conferences, it's frustrating because if the president hadn't taken the action steps that he had, starting with calling on having the senators have to ask my boss, Secretary Raffensperger, to step down, that started this whole cascade of events that led us to tonight. And I'm watching it going, this is just a circular firing squad, and y'all have blocked the president. This made no tactical sense for me from that part of my brain. And I didn't understand it then. I heard some justifications of they wanted to keep some of the Trump base really ginned up. And I was like, well, you don't do that by attacking your own team. And it never made sense. I mean, I've seen some or heard some speculation about whether, you know, some rural counties, for instance, uh, didn't turn out as much as uh, some might have expected or hoped for. But have you seen any hard data uh, that backs up whether there was or was not uh, a lower turnout in some Republican stronghold. I haven't been able to look at the data directly because I've been so focused on getting all the data in and making sure it's right and proper for me to really sit back and do an analysis of it. Now, I've seen other people whose judgment I trust to say that we saw some of the Republican areas sort of turned, their turnout was not as high as it should have been going into this compared to the Democrat turnout. The Democrats kept their in, their energy level up. The Republicans kind of kicked it back up in the last week, but they lost a lot of ability in the front end. And the Democrats did a very good job of banking their votes early. As a political insider, as a political professional, is Georgia now blue or purple or? I think Georgia's in a changing state as it has been forever. As we, as we pointed out, one of the interesting things about this, if we're going to get into the history of wonkiness, is DeKalb County, where we saw this tranche of giant Democrat votes. For those of us who have been around for a long time, that was the hotbed of the Republican insurgency in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s. So things change. It's always in a state of flux, and you always have to be keenly aware of that and making sure you're identifying new people, selling your values and your ideas, and not just playing to the base all the time. There's always going to be a changing demographic of people on the ground, and you always have to be fighting to get new people in. Well, I guess one thing hasn't changed. If the system functions right, one vote is supposed to count. And every vote has counted in every one of these elections. So I think we've proven that through the series of elections this year. And the, the elections workers who had to fight through a new election system, paper ballots, new rules, COVID, recounts, retallies, audits, they should be commended and thanked by every Georgian as, as they see them out there doing that work. These are their friends and neighbors who have run really great elections under really dire, stressful circumstances. All right, so I have a suspicion that uh, we have not done our last interview this week about election security. Uh, but I appreciate uh, you being so patient and transparent uh, with Channel 2's viewers uh, and with us and uh, sticking around at this hour uh, to continue to give us information. Well, thanks, uh, thank Bob. you very it's much. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's uh, Gabriel Sterling from the Georgia Secretary of State's office. Uh, this is Mark Winnie uh, reporting live. And frankly, I don't know whether to say WSB tonight or this morning at this point. <laughs> it's all right, Mark. We get it. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for your access to Gabriel tonight. Uh, we're actually going to take a quick break. Our live Team 2 coverage continues next. Ashley Home Store. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? But figure out what's really out there.
Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. He's so attractive. The women are going to love him. He had long black hair. Confident. And he's just about to make his primetime debut. Narcissistic, predatory. It has got to be one of the creepiest moments on TV. It's unfair. Somebody so cruel and evil. Oh my God. A serial killer. Serial killers and psychopathic people. They could be your next door neighbor. And you wouldn't know. Friday night on ABC, a deadly bachelor. The dating game killer at 9 8 Central on ABC. Jeffrey Epstein's ex girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell, finally arrested and charged. Was she involved in recruiting victims for him? A bonus episode of the number one podcast series now available Truth and Lies, Jeffrey Epstein. Listen free wherever you get your podcasts. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle, now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Get to him, show you what's happening at this hour. David Perdue with the lead, but it is a very tight lead, 0.4% uh, separating these two men, just a couple of hundred votes. Uh, no one declaring a winner in this one tonight. 99% of the precincts reporting absentee ballots, of course, still being counted. Justin? Now, when you look at this race, in essence, we heard from Democrat Raphael Warnock tonight, um, sort of a victory speech of sorts, as he said that he'll be working for everyone when he goes to Washington. His lead uh, quite formidable over Kelly Leffler is now it's some 35,000 uh, votes. He's, he's got 50.4% to 49.59%. Ooh, this day started a while ago, and uh, we're going to be talking about numbers. Um, I'm betting for several more days. Hey, we're grateful that y'all rode with us uh, yesterday and this morning. History being made, and we're not done yet. No. We came on at 8 o'clock this evening to keep you all on top of what was happening. We're going to be here uh, all week. And uh, still, tonight, we're going to take a break right back. And we'll come in with any urgent, or we'll break in again with any urgent information to keep you updated. Yes, and on behalf of the entire team here at WSB-TV, thank you so much for trusting us. And don't forget, we'll have all the overnight developments when you wake up on Channel 2 Action News this morning. So we say good night, guys, or we say good morning. I'm unclear. Later. <laughs> Like that. Later. See ya. <laughs> 
Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people who just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. This is the first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening. 